Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? The clerk. Mr President, I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the order of business. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. Mr President, committees have lodged proposals as shown at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, Senator Waters. Uh, yes, President, I seek leave to move a motion relating to the attendance of a minister, which leave. has been circulated in the chamber. Yep. Leave is not granted. Uh, pursuant to contingent notice, I move that so much of the standing orders be suspended as would prevent me from moving a motion to provide for the consideration of a matter, namely a motion to provide that a motion to require the attendance of a minister may be moved immediately and determined without amendment. Now, on Thursday last week, the Prime Minister told the Parliament, in response to a question from Greens leader Adam Bant, that Australia would be participating in the Climate Ambition Summit. He said, and I quote, that it will be a great opportunity to correct the mistruths that are often presented. And yet last night, a story in The Guardian from Catherine Murphy and Adam Morton saw diplomatic sources say, and I quote, there had been a debate among the co-hosts, including Britain, over whether Morrison should be approved to speak at the summit, given the widespread view that Australia is a laggard on climate commitments. We then had a government source confirming that the final speaker list is a matter for the event hosts. Now, it would make sense that the Australian government might not be given a speaking spot because the criteria required three things, an increase on 2030 targets, an actual strategy to reduce net zero emissions and new financial commitments to developing nations to manage climate risks. Now, all the Prime Minister has done is to promise not to cheat with a dodgy accounting trick using carryover credits, and that doesn't fit the criteria. Our 2030 targets Senator remain Senator Waters, I've got Senator Gallagher on a point of Senator Gallagher on a point of order. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Just um, ref uh, referring back to some comments you made last week, but uh, my point of order is on relevance. I understand the question that's before the chair is. Um, whether or not uh, there should be a suspension of standing orders. Um, it appears to me that Senator Waters is debating the motion that she's seeking to move. Thank you for saying that, Senator Gallagher. I, do rem I did remind senators last week. Um, you've been going for over a minute, Senator Waters. The matter before the chamber is the matter to suspend standing orders, not the motion that has been circulated. Senator Waters. Yes, thank you, President. I was just providing some context before I come to that justification. Um, so, as I was saying, no finance commitments, no increase on the 2030 target, and no pathway uh, to reach any targets. So, we're pretty confident that Australia won't be invited to speak. But what we need to hear from the government, and this is why we're moving to suspend standing orders today, is whether the Prime Minister has misled the Parliament in his response to Greens leader Adam Bant's question about whether we were invited or not. Now, we have been informed that the Prime Minister has received a letter specifically saying that Australia is not invited Fair to the Climate order. Ambition Senator, Summit. Senator Waters, I've got Senator Rustin on a point of order. On a point of order, Mr President, um, you made a quite clear ruling a minute ago about the substance of the motion, the question that is before the chair. Senator Waters seems to be quite happy to completely ignore your direction, and I would ask her to be relevant to the motion. Senator Waters, to her credit, did um, come to the issue. I am going to, from this point forward, Senator Waters, I've traditionally allowed many people to raise points of order, but from this point forward, I'm going to police it from the chair. So I expect the substance of your address to be about the suspension, not about the, not about the motion that has been circulated. Senator Waters. Thank you, President. Um, so this is why we need to suspend standing orders. Did the Prime Minister mislead the parliament? Surely that is a most serious offence by the highest officeholder in this land and an urgent matter that requires debate. 
Has there been a genuine misunderstanding or was it an intentional misleading of the parliament? So this is exactly why we're seeking to suspend standing orders. And I might add that uh, one of the elements of the suspension that we're seeking today is for the Prime Minister to attend, uh, in fact, for the minister representing the Prime Minister to attend the Senate at two o'clock today and make a statement to advise the Senate on whether Australia is or is not speaking at the Climate Ambition Summit and to table any correspondence. Which, as I said, we have information that correspondence has been sent, specifically disavowing what the Prime Minister said and saying that Australia is not invited because we're climate laggards. This is a matter that is appropriate for this chamber to be debating. We cannot have a Prime Minister misleading uh, either House of Parliament, and it's imperative that this Senate be told what the case is. And that's, uh, of course, the reason why we're suspending today, and we look forward to the Minister coming along at 2, two o'clock and um, explaining the Prime Minister's uh, potential misleading of the House. Now, this is a matter of grave importance. Um, this government has got pathetic targets uh, that are paling in comparison to other nations. We know the Bureau of Meteorology has warned us we are on track for 4.4 degrees of warming in Australia. That's the death of the reef. That's the death of agriculture. Um, it's an awful lot of human misery and probably the tanking of our economy irre irrevocably. Uh, we know that the UK has just lifted their ambition. Uh, we know that the EU is finalising its commission Waters, to lift I'm, its ambition. I'm granting you some latitude. I think you need to again come back to the substance of the matter before the chamber, which is the suspension of standing orders. Thank you, President. I'll do that, uh, merely providing the context that the rest of the world is moving and they can see that Australia is not moving. And the fact that we have uh, been informed that there is correspondence that Australia is not invited to a climate ambition summit is absolute dynamite in and of itself. The reason for the suspension today is that the Prime Minister said the opposite in the House last week in response to a direct question. He maintained that we had been invited and that we were going to speak. Well, it appears that the Prime Minister has been caught out in a lie, and that's why we want to give the Prime Minister, through his representing minister, a chance to explain that uh, potential misunderstanding or was it an intentional misleading of the chamber. Uh, the rest of the world knows that Australia is a climate laggard. Australians want action on the climate crisis, and they know there can be a huge jobs bonanza in clean energy. They want their parliament to deal with these matters. Does it really have to take the Greens every day to be raising the need for climate action for anything to get done? We would love for this matter to be properly, properly addressed today. We would like to hear an explanation from the Prime Minister. It is not okay that the Prime Minister has potentially misled the chamber and held out that Australia has got an invite when we, in fact, specifically have not been invited. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, um, you know, this is just another example of the blatant and fragrant disregard that the Greens have for this place, for the chair, and for the appropriate and established order of business under which we all respect and operate. Uh, a total disregard for other members of this chamber and for the, the absolutely established process by which this chamber operates. We will not accept, we will not accept this absolute um, blatant attempt to disrupt the order of business in this place, and I therefore move that the motion be put. The question is that the motion be put. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Stop the bells. The question is that the motion be put. Those of, those of that opinion pass to the right of the chair, to the nose to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Brockman tell off the ayes, Senator Seawitt tell off the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 45, noes 9. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senators, the question now is that the motion to suspend standing orders moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The to the contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. <coughs> Stop the bells. The question is the motion moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Seawitt, tell if the ayes, Senator McCarthy, tell if the noes. The result of the division is ayes 9, noes 44. The matter is therefore resolved in the negative. I thank senators and I'll call on the clerk. Government business, order of the day number one. Australia's Foreign Relations, State and Territory Arrangements Consequential Amendments Bill 2020, consideration and committee of the whole of message number 301 from the House of Representatives. The committee is considering message number 301 from the House of Representatives relating to Australia's Foreign Relations, State and Territory Arrangements Consequential Amendments Bill 2020. Minister. Thank you, um, Madam Deputy President. I move that the committee does not insist on its amendments to which the House of Representatives has disagreed. So the question is, uh, Senator Rice, are you seeking the call? 
Look, I'm very disappointed that this proposal for us to not insist on our amendments it does make you wonder you know, what's the point of the Senate, what's the point of the debate that we had last week, what's the point of the amendments that were agreed in this place last week. They, we, had, we spent an extended period of time, as people recall, last week in this place debating these amendments and, the, and debating the main bill that they accompanied. Um, and I think that it was very appropriate, given the significance of this bill, for us to have spent that time debating the bill and the amendments. Because, you know, as I said in my speeches then, that we agree that wherever foreign interference or actions are occurring that aren't in our foreign and our interest, these are serious problems that need to be addressed. But where we disagree is with the approach the Liberal Party has taken. And in fact, we ended up, after a lot of debate, we had two amendments that got through, and two amendments amongst many. It was an absolutely minimal amount of amendments to this very significant bill. And it is very appropriate for the Senate as a House of Review to decide that these two that there were some changes, that there were just a tiny bit of extra checks and balances that should be put in place on this far reaching bill. Because this bill is incredibly far reaching. It has been rushed through. It didn't have an exposure draft. It was basically being used as political cover when the Prime Minister was feeling very vulnerable on a very different issue, the terrible Commonwealth response to COVID in aged care settings. It had no exposure draft. It had no regulation impact statement. The key stakeholders, including universities, um, local governments raised significant concerns about the lack of consultation. We heard last week at length how consultation did not occur until after the bill was introduced in the House. Um, so we made some very minor amendments to this bill. I mean, we thought as Greens that there were a lot more changes that needed to be put in place to improve the checks and balances on the power that this bill gives to the foreign minister. I mean, the bill leaves key terms undefined, and it gives the foreign minister enormous discretion in overriding a very wide range of amendments, even retrospectively. There are no guidelines set out in the legislation as to what the minister needs to consider when deciding on whether to intervene in an arrangement. There's no commitment to procedural fairness, which involved not being biased and giving the person or entity affected a hearing before an action is taken and providing reasons for undertaking that action. And as we noted in the debate last week, that procedural fairness does not necessarily involve providing reasons if there are national security concerns. So the whole argument, as we were told last week, that we couldn't have procedural fair fairness because it might impact on our national security, is a furphy. So, I mean, essentially, it's clear that the approach that's been taken by this government is one designed to cut off all avenues of legal appeal, and in doing so, it gives massively too much power to the minister. It throws away the essential checks and balances that should be there in such far-reaching legislation. And all the government can say is basically just trust us that we won't be doing it in that overarching, sort of too powerful way. Don't worry, you know, there's going to be guidelines, there are going to be um, notes, there will be frameworks, there's a task force, but it's not in the legislation. So it's not guaranteed. It is not locked in. It is giving too much power to the minister. And fundamentally, we believe that addressing foreign interference necessarily should involve working collaboratively with stakeholders around the country, including the state and territory governments, including the universities, including the local councillors and other bodies. So, and we believe that this bill should have been developed with a very different process, and it should, provide, it should have provided much, much stronger oversight and transparency. So here we have, you know, with that debate, we only had two amendments that were successful that got through the Senate, and yet now we're being asked to not insist upon, upon one of them, which the House rejected. I mean, it is only that amendment requiring judicial review is only a marginal improvement on a bad piece of legislation, but it is an important improvement, and the Senate absolutely should be insisting on that amendment. And I want to conclude, of course, by noting that this, of course, that this whole piece of legislation does nothing to address an underlying and fundamental cause of potential foreign interference and influence and corruption and actions occurring that aren't in our national interest, and that's money. 
It does nothing towards getting money out of po politics, which is what we need to do if we're going to get serious about decisions being made on their merits, not on who is holding the purse strings. And we need to bring in a federal ICAC if we want to find out who is corruptly and improperly influencing who. And we need to fund universities properly if we want them to question the wisdom of entering into memorandums of understanding with foreign governments and universities. Frankly, there is so much more that this government could be doing to address these very important issues. This legislation does not do this, and, this one, and not insisting on this one amendment makes a bad piece of legislation even worse. Thank you, Senator Rice. Senator Wong. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Um, and can I thank Senator Birmingham for agreeing to deal with the message today after uh, my absence yesterday. Uh, can I first go to the objectives of the bill? Uh, I would make the point that I have, on behalf of the Labor Party, consistently indicated from the day it was announced, without notice to us, without any indication to us, uh, that we would back the objectives of the bill. And the substantive bill has actually already passed the parliament with the opposition support. Uh, there seems to be a bit of confusion amongst the minister's colleagues about this um, status of the substantive bill. I think this is the first time I've seen a government actually claim one of its bills hasn't passed the parliament when it has. Uh, and you do question, I do question the Morrison's government's motivation in, in that you know, misleading of some in the, uh, in the public arena, um, suggesting that the bill hasn't passed. The scheme has passed and the minister has the power. The question here is, uh, whether or not there should be some oversight of the minister's decisions. Now, <clears throat> um, we think that view was reflected in the sensible substantive amendments that Labor moved uh, and in our support of the amendment moved by Senator Patrick. Um, the application of the ADJR Act to a decision under this bill would really do no more than provide a, a clearer pathway for organisations that wanted to review the legality of a decision by the government. It makes things clearer and simpler. That's really it. But I do want to go to the point about how the government's chosen to deal with this bill and how this minister has. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I, we, we have repeatedly offered to engage with the government in relation to this bill. Uh, and uh, to my mind, and what I would say to this chamber, uh, this is one of the problems with the way in which this government seeks to e handle certain issues of foreign policy, is it doesn't know how to be bipartisan in the national interest. So we, we get the announcement, we make clear our position. The um, minister doesn't talk to the opposition. On this legislation, we invited conversations. The uh, minister still hasn't spoken to me, not once. We provided the government with our amendments ahead of them being circulated. We provided the government again with a letter after the amendments were voted on here in the chamber saying, look, if you've got an issue, come back to us. We'd like to discuss a way through. Uh, I got a text from the minister uh, and some staff consultation which suggested it was simply a matter of principle. Can, can I just say, I, I think a minister in this portfolio ought to have the political maturity to engage the other party of government when it comes to these sorts of pieces of legislation. And I, I register my disappointment that the minister consistently refused to do so. Now, I understand, um, I find it mystifying, frankly. Uh, I understand Senator Lambie is changing her position. I, I, uh, Senator Lambie is always very upfront with me, so I knew we had her last time, and now I know we don't have her, so th thank you to her. She, she's not one in this place where you die wandering, so I appreciate her clarity around that with me. Uh, so I think it's pretty clear that the Senate won't be insisting on this. Um, Labor will continue to insist on the amendment, uh, given uh, what we previously indicated and in the failure by the government, really to offer any substantial reason as to why uh, this is such a dreadful uh, proposition to have uh, the application of the Act. Um, so that will remain. Uh, we will continue to, to support the amendment that Senator Patrick moved, which was identical to an opposition amendment, uh, uh, to ensure the bill was not excluded. Senator Patrick. Thank you, um, Madam Deputy President. I just want to make a very, very short uh, contribution, um, just to, to make sure the Senate understands that uh, the, uh, the amendment that uh, was passed last time does not seek to enable judicial review on the merits of the minister's decision, so as to whether or not um, he or she um, has made uh, uh, 
an erroneous decision on the basis of national security, the balance of national security. Uh, just to uh, uh, inform the chamber, it's about the <coughs> housekeeping uh, associated with any decision. So the sorts of things you can that the uh, that you can uh, seek to review under the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act include things like uh, that the that procedures that were required by law to be observed in connection with the making of the decision were not observed, or that the person who purported to make the decision did not have the jurisdiction to make the decision. Uh, other other uh, lines might be that the making of the decision was an improper exercise of power conferred by the enactment in pursuant of which it was purported to be made. These are the sorts of things that uh, this amendment seeks to ensure not question the minister's judgment on the balance of national uh, security. It seeks simply to say when the decision was made, were all the right things done? Was it the right person? Did they have at least some evidence before them um, uh, as opposed to uh, making a decision without evidence? That's all that this amendment seeks to do. It, it, uh, it's very reasonable. And I will also uh, join with the Labor Party in, the, in insisting on the amendment. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Minister. Uh, thank you very much, um, Madam Deputy President. And uh, just briefly, uh, for the record, uh, let me note, because I don't think it was clear for the vast majority of uh, Senator Rice's speech, that uh, of course two amendments were passed uh, through the Senate, and uh, when the bill was considered in the House of Representatives, one of those was uh, accepted and uh, continues as part of the bill. The other was not. The amendment which was accepted was an amendment uh, to make for the minister to make an annual report <coughs> to the Senate on the uh, implementation of the bill, uh, and for that matter to be referred to the Senate Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Legislation Committee by Senate resolution of continuing effect. So the procedures of that committee to examine uh, the, uh, the implementation of the uh, Australian Foreign Relations Bill and the uh, decisions made by the minister uh, will continue. That amendment was clearly accepted. We have not accepted the amendment um, uh, in relation to the application of the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act uh, for the many reasons I cited last week, and I want to thank Senator Patrick particularly uh, for his uh, engagement uh, on this matter. In relation to consultations, um, I would advise the chamber once again the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade uh, conducted over 60 consultations across state and territory and local governments uh, and universities uh, as well. The bill does include a number of uh, important transparency, uh, scrutiny and accountability provisions. For the first time, there will be a register of all such arrangements. Uh, the decisions that are made by the foreign minister will be included on that register. There is an ability to claim judicial review of the decisions of the foreign minister. As I've said, there's now an annual report to parliament, uh, an opposition amendment uh, which was agreed by the government in the House of Representatives. The rules that the foreign minister makes are disallowable by the parliament. We incorporated by our own amendment in the House of Representatives a review of the scheme after three years. Uh, I would note, as I said to the chamber in uh, committee uh, last week, that the factors in section 51 that are to be taken into account form a clear and open part of the minister's consideration. The scheme contemplates, and it could be argued in fact mandates, uh, increased consultation with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade uh, on its expertise on foreign policy and foreign relations. There is also the availability of compensation for acquisition otherwise than on just terms. And, Madam Deputy President, underneath uh, all of that, uh, under the, as the foundations of the bill, please would remind the Chamber that the scope of the bill and the level of the obligations for the entities covered by the bill are carefully calibrated to the risk that may attach to foreign arrangements that they may make. I would also remember the uh, point we have made repeatedly that, of course, these arrangements are often beneficial and welcome. Uh, and in the vast majority of cases will continue uh, unaffected. It is important, I believe, to remember that this bill proposes a framework that carefully balances accountability, uh, timeliness of decisions, administrative burdens and statutory frameworks. And, uh, Madam uh, Deputy President, as I said earlier, um, uh, the government believes that the committee should not insist on its amendments to which the House of Representatives has disagreed. Thank you, Minister. So uh, the question is that 
uh, as moved by the minister that the committee does not insist on its amendments to which the House of Representatives has disagreed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Bells. So the question is that the committee does not insist on its amendments to which the House of Representatives has disagreed. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Davey as teller for the ayes and Senator McCarthy as teller for the noes.
Order. There being 32 ayes and 30 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. Minister. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I move that the resolution be reported. So the question is that the motion as moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Minister. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. So the committee has considered messages. Beg your pardon. The committee has considered message number 301 from the House of Representatives relating to Australians. For Australia's Foreign Relations State and Territory Arrangements Consequential Amendments Bill of 2020 and has resolved not to insist on the amendments made by the Senate to which the House has disagreed. And I'm sorry, Minister, I called you early, so I'll call you again. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. So the question is that the uh, motion is moved by the Minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. <laughs> Call the clerk. I think we're now doing the other motion, aren't we? Yeah. Government business, notice of motion number one, standing in the name of the Minister for Families and Social Services, exemption of bills from the cutoff. Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I move the motion. Question is, Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Look, um, I just rise to speak briefly on this motion. Uh, I note that the government is seeking to exempt 20 bills uh, from the cutoff, uh, and the opposition uh, is seeking to um, assist the government with what appears to be a, a mismanagement of their program. Largely, that we've got this last-minute rush of bills coming uh, before the chamber, and I think you'll find. Our preparedness to cooperate is, is quite reasonable. There is one bill on that list of 20 bills, the Social Security Administration Amendment Continuation of Cashless Welfare Bill 2020, that the opposition does not support. Yeah. Uh, we do not support the bill, and I'll go to the reasons um, uh, why, because they are linked uh, to this motion that the government has put. We do not believe um, this is a, in any way a, a good bill. We have opposed it in every forum uh, possible, and, we, um, and by having it as part of this list, and we are not able to support it because by doing so, we would be complicit in bringing this bill on into this chamber where we know the government is desperate to get it passed and is placing pressure on the crossbench uh, to support it. There is absolutely no reason why this bill needs to be rushed through. The government has another bill that has been in this place for 12 months should they wish to extend the trial sites um, in, in the areas where the cashless debit card is currently operating. So we don't accept the government's view that it must be dealt with uh, this week. Um, there is another alternative for the government uh, and one that is quite reasonable and wouldn't require this uh, procedural uh, motion to get it through. I'll just make a couple of points about why we are so opposed to this. Um, one, after 13 years since the Howard government's intervention in the Northern Territory, there is no evidence that compulsory broad-based income management works. Uh, secondly, the minister decided to make the cashlet debit card trial permanent before reading the independent review that you commissioned, Minister, by Adelaide University and at great cost to the taxpayer, two and a half million dollars. But you've taken the decision before that. You've not published that Adelaide University study, uh, which you've commissioned, which makes us uh, suspicious around what that actual um, report has actually found and why the government is insisting on this being dealt with this week without the benefit of that information. Uh, the proposal is racially discriminatory, uh, as has been widely understood through the various uh, forums where this is being investigated. Approximately 68 per cent of the people impacted by this bill are First Nations Australians. And the government has failed to adequately consult affected communities, especially First Nations uh, communities. We are very concerned uh, at this. It's a very heavy-handed way. A budget, what, what's been passed off as a budget decision, but that has such significant consequence uh, for so many people. Um, the bill that we, the government is seeking to exempt is substantially the same um, as one already on the notice paper, which would allow the continuation of the trial. Um, 
This uh, second reading on this was adjourned on the 2nd of December 2019. So, given that that bill has effectively sat on the notice paper for 12 months without being debated by the government, we see absolutely no reason why this bill needs to be rushed through the Senate this week and accepted from the usual procedural processes that would allow senators to properly review and scrutinise the legislation before it's uh, potentially passed into law. Um, we don't believe the motives of the government um, are fair. Uh, we think this is all about putting pressure on the crossbench. Um, we do believe the Adelaide University report should be released before the Senate is required uh, to make such a massive decision as to make the cashless debit card which significantly affects First Nations community, mandated across those trial sites and into the Northern Territory. I'll leave my comments there because I know many of my other colleagues, should we not be successful with this motion, will speak, uh, should, the, should we be in the position uh, where um, this bill actually gets through. But I would urge those on the crossbench to consider supporting, um, well, asking, uh, supporting us when we ask that the question be separated. Um, and that we vote differently on that bill to the other 19 that we are prepared to exempt from the cutoff, um, because there's many, many uh, thousands of people around this country that rely on the Senate to do the right thing on this. And the right thing is not to allow this to be swept through in the last-minute rush before Christmas, uh, because this government's taken a budget decision. Um, rather than allowing the proper processes and the full evaluation of the trial sites to be provided to this chamber to consider before we are asked to cast our vote on it. Senator Seward. The Greens were uh, also asking that the Social Security Administration amendment continuation of the Cashless Welfare Bill 2020 be uh, voted on separately because we certainly will not be supporting this being rushed through this place. This is a continuation of a punitive, a punitive discriminatory approach which on income management, which was first foisted onto the Northern Territory. And to make matters worse, continuation of the uh, uh, intervention in 2007 through converting the basics card to the cashless debit card, moving people onto the cashless debit card, but it also entrenches the four so-called trial sites, which those of us that have opposed this from the beginning pointed out when the government moved to establish these trials in the first place that they were never intended as trials. I'm glad that senators on in the opposition uh, benches, on the opposition benches, have finally realised that these were never meant to be trials, that these were always meant to be permanent and are now opposing them. We had less than half a day to consider this legislation that impacts on so many people in this country. Less than half a day because we simply did not have time in the short time that was made available for the inquiry to hold a broader hearing. This has implications for thousands and thousands of Australians on the, ba on the um, basics card in the Northern Territory and in Cape York, and for those that are on the cashless welfare stroke debit card in the trial, so-called trial sites around this country. This is about continuing this government's punitive, discriminatory approach to those that are on income support. There's no evidence that it works. There wasn't, I might add, the f first five years after the intervention when it was extended. There wasn't the evidence then. There's not the evidence now. There was evidence that came out very clearly, in fact, in 2014 that showed it met none of its objectives in the Northern Territory. That's the government's evidence. None of the other so-called evaluations have proved their point because they are flawed. And the government obviously thinks the evaluation that the, the next one that they've paid for isn't going to demonstrate that it works. In fact, the cat was let out of the bag yesterday in The Guardian, where it showed that there's little support for extending the cashless debit card in the goldfields, because it was just that slip snippet that we saw yesterday in The Guardian was about the Goldfields trial, so that there isn't the support 
to continue the card as it operates now. So it's very clear why the government isn't releasing the, the evaluation, because this isn't based on evidence on what works. It's based on ideology, pure and simple Ideolo ideology, which seeks to control people's the way they spend their money, which, team, which seeks to, because they think they have the right, to control people's income support. Well, controlling the way that people use their money does not achieve the objectives, because there's workarounds, there's all sorts of things. It has not reduced and it has not dealt with the underlying causes of drug and alcohol addiction, which the government claims that they are addressing. This is a flawed approach. The government doesn't have the evidence that it works. It wants to rush it through and make this and make the card permanent. And there's other people on those benches across from us that actually want to make this rolled out across the country. This is just a stepping stone to try and roll out the cashless debit card across the country. We know what the agenda is, and we will vote against this card every single time, including the government trying to exempt and rush through this place this punitive, discriminatory card. Racist. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. The notice of motion that's put up by uh, Senator Rustin is basically saying that um, the following allowing them to be considered during this period of sittings. Now we're coming to the end of the year and some of these bills are very important that they get passed. With regards to the Social Security Administration Amendment, continuation of the cashless welfare bill needs to be passed. If not, it will come to an end on the 1st of January. And that exactly the tensions of both the Greens who have opposed this constantly over a period of time. Order, Senator to, to state, even the Labor Party stating that this is about balancing their budget has got nothing to do about it. These, um, I actually went to the hearing in Kalgoorlie. There was only a handful of senators that were there. I don't know how many senators have actually been to Senator hear Ford. the debate that has gone on with regards to the cashless debit card. Now, the government didn't go out there and say we are actually going to put this cashless Senator, debit sorry, card. Sorry, Senator Hanson, please resume your seat. Thank with you. all due respect, Senator Seawitt was heard in silence. I would ask her colleagues to show the same courtesy to other speakers in what is a procedural debate to determine whether there will be a debate on these bills over the remaining course of this week. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much, Mr President. It might be very hard for them because that's their character, that's their nature. But anyway, the fact is that the government didn't just didn't go out there and say, we're going to put this cashless debit card in the Kimberleys or in Kalgoorlie or, or in Harvey Bay or Bundaberg or Seduna for that matter. These communities came to the government asking for this to be put into those communities. Senator now, having a meeting with these, with these um, communities, we're talking about. We spoke to. Senator Chisholm, count to ten. It's quietly. Order. <coughs> Senator, resume your seat, Senator Hanson. Senator Chisholm, the place will be a very messy last few days if people completely ignore the chair, no matter who's in it. There is an opportunity to debate this later on. This is a procedural debate to determine whether there will be an opportunity to debate it later on. Can it please be conducted with courtesy? Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. The whole fact is that we're going to having allegations thrown around this chamber, and those people who have not had the opportunity to go to hear what the communities were saying is imp important what I offer to this debate. Now, we actually heard from the reports from the police association that domestic violence was on the decline, that even alcohol abuse is on the decline, that it has assisted communities. Knowing that, I haven't got the numbers, I have asked for the figures, but people have asked to opt into this cashless debit card, um, so they actually see the benefits of it. You also have to understand that in these communities, the Aboriginal culture is you've got family members and others in the community that are actually going and forcing them to take monies out of their account so they don't have the order. monies to Senator actually— Senator Hanson, I'm, I did call um, Senator Waters to order earlier. I'm referring to it, not pointing at you, Senator Waters. This is a procedural motion about whether bills will be dealt with this week. We should not be debating the substance of the bills as much as whether or not they should be exempt from the Senate's cut-off order. If, 
it's adopted, there will be an opportunity to debate the bills. So I just ask all senators to keep in mind this is not the time for substantive debate on, this, on these bills. Senator Hanson. Um, if, if I'm doing that, it was in response to Senator Seward and her comments with regards to this. It is so important to these communities that we continue with the cashless debit card. The, the response saying that we know what it's all about, what they intend to do is roll it out to the rest of the country, that is not the case at all. It will not, be going to in, it will not go into any other communities. It will be taken to the next election if they intend to do that. So that's not, that's not the truth. No, you have no evidence of it whatsoever from the Greens, no evidence of whatsoever. And I'm sick of these allegations being thrown around this chamber. There is also the fact that it said it's going to tie in pensioners and those who are on invalid pensions. That's not the case at all. It is of working age group people that are tied up in this, especially those in Harvey Bay and Bundaberg who are 35 years and under. So it is so important. A lot of people have actually got off the alcohol, spending waste money on that. There is reports that children are now getting fed. The mothers can buy the food. They still have 20 per cent of their money in cash to spend how they wish to spend it. People, sometimes there's such a thing as tough love that you need people to take responsibility. So if you are quite happy with people going to spend their money on alcohol, <coughs> be, become um, inebriated to the fact that order. they have Senator domestic violence. Hansen, I've got Senator Hanson Young on a point of order. Senator Hanson Young. I'm asking for you to reflect on the imputation made by Senator Hanson just then, uh, in relation to suggesting that uh, others in this in this chamber want people to go and spend all their money on alcohol I'll and reflect. being inebriated. Okay, I'll I didn't catch that, Senator Hanson Young. I'll reflect on the Hansard or video and come back to the chamber or address it to senators as appropriate. Senator Hanson. Touchy. <coughs> so anyway, order. the fact Senator, is, Senator Hanson Young. Thank you. Uh, oh, point of order, Senator Hanson Young. Point, point of order. Um, we have every right in this chamber to make points of order, and uh, I would ask uh, Senator Hanson, through you, Chair, to, if she wants to stand by what she said, she can say it again, and you can hear it, and you can make a decision. But just having throwing around that people's points of orders make them touchy, uh, there'll Senator, be a lot more of it. Senator, Senator Hanson Young. I've said before I don't think anyone in the chamber can claim they're entirely innocent, with all their, whether it be disorderly behaviour, whether it be interjections or not. I remind senators that one of the ways of maintaining decorum for a debate like this is to stick to the motion, which is whether or not bills should be exempt from the cutoff order rather than address substantive issues. I gave some latitude to Senator Seawood to do that. Senator Hanson, I have given you the same amount of latitude, and I urge you to come, as I did to Senator Waters earlier this morning, to address the suspension, sorry, not the suspension, to address the procedural motion before the chair. These other matters can be left to debate if the Senate so determines it. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. You know, some of us in this chamber have got thick skin and others don't. But anyway, that comes with age and wisdom and knowledge. The fact is that what I'm saying here is it's very important that we deal with this notice of motion and that we deal with the cashless um, debit card in the chamber. It is going to impact on a lot of people. So I'm calling on the senators here. You may have your disagreements with this and you say it's against the human rights, which the Greens have said all along, and you're denying people their right. The people are on this welfare payments purely because of the grace of the taxpayers of this nation that has given them the ability to actually access money. We as, as people, we must also understand a lot of people um, are tied up on drug addiction, alcohol and gambling. That is a big problem here as well. If it is helping these people, if it is saving just a few lives in these communities, surely that's got to be taken into consideration. That's where, you know, I know the Labor Party is not going to support this because that's their voter base. How dare you deny the people of actually being, you know, controlled and how their money is spent? If we talk about the sexual abuse of children in this chamber, that comes from people who are inebriated, who may be alcohol, may be drugs. We actually see the incline in domestic violence. Why aren't you prepared to actually say, OK, if it leads to this of spending the money where they do spend it wrongly, that is impacting on their daily lives? 
Why can't you make the decisions based on what is right for these communities? The people have been crying out for it. When you have Order. meetings with these people, they are crying out for it. These communities came to the government and put their own hand up for it. They wanted this card. And if you don't pass this with a cashless debit card, it's going to go back to the basics card up in the, cap, up in the Cape. So this is very important, order. at least Senator, given them further Senator trial. Hanson, Senator Faruqi on a point of order. Uh, Mr President, the point of order is about relevance to the debate. Senator Hanson Young is completely straying into— Oh, sorry. Sorry, Sarah. My, my deepest apologies to Senator Hanson Young. Senator Hanson is definitely straying into the substance of the bill and not debating the motion in front of us. So I would request that you call her to order. Um, and as I said, Senator Hanson, um, I did give Senator Seawood quite a bit of latitude on addressing this. Senator Hanson, I have asked you now, because I've given you a similar amount of latitude, to come to the procedural matter. Mr. Senator President, Hanson. and that's exactly where I was headed and encouraging the members to actually vote for this and allow this to be dealt with this, this week in the chamber and I've explained my reasons why it needs to be dealt with. So I call on the senators, even those on the crossbench who may be leaning against not voting for this, um, and I know that Senator Patrick went up to Seduna over the weekend to see for himself and use the card himself. So I'm calling on those crossbench senators that actually need to, to real common sense that we actually pass this legislation before Parliament is finished. Senator McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I, I rise to support my colleague, uh, Senator Gallagher, in that uh, this Senate should not proceed with the Social Security Amendment continuation of cashless welfare bill as part of the uh, procedural motion that is before the chair. And the reason for that, uh, Mr. President, is because, and I know in my conversations with the crossbenchers and in particular with Senator Patrick, uh, that he has said not only to me personally but also publicly uh, that he is very torn by this piece of legislation, that he has provided over 50 questions for the government to answer, which my understanding is that they have not been answered. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of families across the Northern Territory who are going to be greatly impacted by this piece of legislation. It is incumbent, Mr President, that the senators in this Senate who are going to rule on the lives of the people of the Northern Territory in particular, that they understand what it is they're talking about. So if Senator Patrick has not received that information, and I do appeal to the crossbenchers and I do thank them, uh, Senator Patrick, Senator Lambie, for coming to the Northern Territory and listening to the people of the Northern Territory and recognising that when we had the basics card come in in 2007, people didn't ask for the basics card, just like they're not asking for the cashless debit card. And the Senate must be acutely aware of these facts. So, Mr. President, I urge our crossbenchers in particular to not allow this procedural motion to go ahead in including this particular bill. There is a great deal of work that still needs to be done. There is no need to rush something through that the government has had on the notice paper for 12 months in relation to those four trial sites. It is not the fault of this Senate that the government has been unable to get its act together. It is not the fault of this Senate that the government has failed to evaluate those four trial sites. It is not the fault of the Senate that the government has refused to allow us to see the University of Adelaide report, which it spent $2.5 million on to evaluate those four trial sites in order for this Senate to review, to examine, to investigate, as we should do in the Australian parliament when we are making decisions about people's lives. The government has failed to do that. It has done a sloppy job, an inefficient job. It has degraded the people whose lives have lived on this card for the last four years, and now you want to add thousands more from the Northern Territory onto it. Well, Mr President, I urge this Senate, I urge the crossbenchers, do not support this motion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Senator Rustin. 
that the question now be put. Okay. So I'll put the procedural question before I divide the substantive question. The question is that the motion be put. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. No. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. Well, it's, it's, it could be. Stop the bells. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Payne be put. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I point Senator Davey tell of the ayes, Senator McCarthy tell of the nose.
The result of the division is ayes 32, noes 29. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. So, Senators, as I understand it, the only bill I'm asked to be treated differently in this motion is the Social Security Administration Amendment Continuation of Cashless Welfare Bill 2020. That's the only one. What I will do is I'll put the motion without that, so just with all the other legislation listed, and then I'll put that contentious bill separately. So the question is that the minister, that the motion moved with all the bills other than the Social Security Administration Amendment Continuation of Cashless Welfare Bill 2020 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The question now is that the Social Security Administration Amendment Continuation of Cashless Welfare Bill 2020 be included in that list with the other bills just adopted. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. The question is, as I just read it out, with the Social Security Bill to be included in the other bills exempt from the cutoff order. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Davey Teller for the ayes, Senator McCarthy Teller for the noes. Senator Van, I need you to remain seated. Yeah, I understand that, but it's not. I point to ask Senator Van to remain here, even though he came in. It, and the whips have discussed the matter. I'll let the count continue. The result of the division is ayes 32, noes 29. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Thank you, Senators. I'll call on the clerk to call on business. <coughs> oh,
Government Business Orders of Day Number 2, Recycling and Waste Reduction Bill 2020 and four related bills in committee. In committee. So who's... So I understand we are considering the recycling bill. Uh, the committee is considering the recycling and waste reduction bill 2020 and the amendment moved by Senator Wish Wilson. Senator, you're seeking the call? Um, I think I'm in continuation. Thank you, um, Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Just, just to uh, just to reiterate, I did move um, amendment on sheet 1071, um, and I was just speaking to it very briefly. Um, I'll just uh, be very, very, very brief and concise here, and just say um, this uh, priority products list uh, is in the legislation. It, it already exists. Uh, it gives the minister the ability to um, put a, any waste stream under a product stewardship scheme on notice by putting them on the product uh, priority list. Uh, that gives uh, the industry or that waste stream uh, association members 12 months to get their act together. Uh, and it gives, at the end of that 12 months, the minister discretion to come into parliament and name and shame businesses that are deliberately free riding, uh, not pulling their weight. Um, so this amendment isn't doing anything new, except it is taking plastic packaging, which we know is going to be a voluntary uh, product stewardship scheme if APCO and the government are true to their word, and it simply puts it immediately onto the product priority list. Now, Australians are very dis bitterly disappointed uh, that last night the Senate didn't support a mandated product stewardship scheme that gave the uh, packaging industry essentially five years uh, to get their act together and meet their targets, their voluntary targets. Uh, this is a halfway house. It's not as strong as the Greens and Labor and other people in this chamber would have liked to have seen, but nevertheless at least it gives the Australian people and the recycling industry some certainty that plastic packaging is going to fall under the scope uh, of this legislation. Because at the moment, plastic packaging falls under the NEPM. Uh, it's not even covered in this bill. So we can't even talk about tackling marine plastic or building a better recycling industry in Australia and creating jobs, giving the recycling industry certainty unless we give them something. So um, I uh, implore senators to support this. Uh, One Nation uh, totally disgraced themselves yesterday. Uh, they have some kind of uh, chance here to uh, redress that and at least give the recycling industry in Australia and the Australian people something. So I commend uh, this amendment to the Senate. The question is that the amendment on sheet 1071 moved by Senator Wish Wilson be agreed to. Uh, those of that opinion say aye. Uh, Clarify. Senator which, McAllister. Uh, thank you. Um, Madam Acting Deputy President, um, can I just clarify which amendment we are dealing with? I had. Uh, is it 1 0? Because I thought Senator Wish Wilson then was speaking about the matters contemplated on sheet 1043. My understanding of 1071 is that it does it goes to consultation, but I may perhaps be. So I'm, I'm just clarifying, Senator Wish Wilson, where we're up to. So I'm advised by the clerk that we are actually considering sheet 1071. I'll call you, Senator Wish Wilson, if you if you need to say anything to make this clear to the Senate. Uh, no, that that is, that is correct. It is it is 1071, and it, and it does go to consultation. So the, currently, the minister may consult may consult with um, persons or organisations in relation to aspects uh, of the bill, industry groups, consumer groups. Um, we move this amendment to the section that states the minister. May, must consult uh, with one or more persons rather than may. So, yeah, sorry, I thought I'd clarified that uh, last night, but yeah, we are we're about to uh, vote on 1071. Mm. 
Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson, for the clarification. Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I just indicate Labor's voting position on this. We do support this amendment. Uh, this waste management is a very complex issue. It affects consumers, industry, the environment, and government policy making correspondently should be engaging with all of those sectors of our society and economy. Um, we were very pleased to be able to secure amendments in the other place that uh, require that the minister must consult with states and territories and with the government's new product stewardship centre of excellence as key stakeholders. Uh, we're happy to support the extension of this requirement to the other groups that are listed in this amendment. Thank you, Senator McAllister. The minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, the government doesn't support the amendment to. We did move, move and cooperate with the opposition, as referenced by Senator McAllister in the House, in terms of extending and strengthening consultation requirements in relation to the minister's priority list. Um, uh, obviously, that is not an exhaustive outcome in terms of uh, uh, in terms of who could be consulted and no doubt would be consulted. We believe beyond those specified, it's appropriate to keep flexibility there. Uh, that, for example, uh, in the case of local governments, it may be that a wide number need consulting in some measures, uh, a smaller in others, and, uh, and that minister, ministers of the day ought to have that flexibility uh, to uh, get the best possible policy outcomes through consultation. So there don't appear to be any further senators seeking the call. So the question is that the amendment on sheet 1071, moved by Senator Wish Wilson, be agreed to. Uh, those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. no. I think the noes have it. Is a division required? No. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. So the question is that the amendment as moved by Senator Wish Wilson, Amendment 1 on Sheet 1071, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Ciccone as teller for the ayes and Senator Davey as teller for the noes. Uh, I don't know. Order, there being 29 ayes and 32 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I just remind senators that once the bells have stopped and tellers have been appointed, senators need to be in their seats and not to move. Thank you, Senators. The question now is that the bills be agreed to without amendments or request for amendments. Uh, those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question, well, Senator Wish Wilson. I'd just like to say a few words uh, to, to sum up, uh, Acting Deputy President, on the third reader. Uh, I don't believe we're, we're quite there yet, oh, Senator okay. Wish Wilson. If, if you would just go through a couple more steps. So the question now is that the bill be reported. Uh, those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Uh, the committee has considered the Recycling and Waste Reduction Bill 2020 and related bills and agreed to them without amendment or requests. The minister. Report of the committee be adopted. Uh, the question is that the committee's report be adopted. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Minister. I move the bill be now read a third time. The question is that the bill be oh, Senator Wish Wilson. Right on time. <laughs> Thank you, uh, <laughs> Acting Deputy President. I'd just like to say a few words and acknowledge a few people before we go to the uh, to the to the final vote. And obviously the Greens will be, will be voting for the bill, as it is, um, but we're bitterly disappointed, as I know many Australians are, that this has been a missed opportunity to get significant amendments in legislation that act on plastic pollution, one of the biggest uh, environmental challenges we face on the planet, and also to give the recycling industry the certainty they need to actually get us out of this waste crisis we find ourselves in, uh, invest in infrastructure, uh, upgrading uh, their processes and, and creating uh, Australian jobs. Um, to all those people that have campaigned really hard uh, over many years, uh, especially in recent months, to convince senators to support uh, these strong amendments that we've debated in the Senate in the last 24 hours, um, I'd like to say thank you. Uh, I'd like to say to you also that we have come a long way on this debate. 
from just a few years ago. It wasn't even being discussed in Parliament. We haven't had any legislation uh, in this place, in the Senate, for nearly 10 years. We've had a number of big Senate inquiries. We've seen the issue build and build in the Australian public's consciousness, and it is now an issue of significant public importance. Um, and we won't be giving up. We've come a long way, and yesterday, last night, on a key amendment to mandate product stewardship schemes for the packaging industry, some of the biggest producers of plastic packaging on the planet here in Australia, telling them that by 2025 their voluntary targets need to be met or there will be consequences. We were one vote, Acting Deputy President, we were one vote away from holding the big packaging industry to account. And no one has done that for 25 years. And while we were one vote away, we've just gone one step closer to actually getting some meaningful change and some meaningful action. I'd also like to say to those people, and many of them who are listening today, that a lot of things have happened because of the work this Senate has done. This Senate has led the world in looking at the issue of marine plastic pollution. We were the first parliamentary inquiry to do this. We also had a very big, extensive and exhaustive inquiry into the waste crisis, and the Environment Committee made a number of very substantial recommendations. And if we hadn't been going through these processes, and raising these issues, putting this issue, politically speaking, on the table, then the government would never have acted. Our Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, would never have gone to the United Nations saying Australia was going to lead on plastic pollution. Well, unfortunately, today, I don't think we can say with any confidence that our Prime Minister has led on plastic pollution, because this bill has passed that a bill that completely excludes plastic packaging, the exact waste stream that is causing the problem. But have no fear, Australia, we will continue to push and we will get results. Two other things, uh, Acting Deputy President. The one question that I get asked consistently, including uh, last night and this morning, is why? Well, I want this government put in place a simple, two simple bits of legislation that ban the most problematic plastics we find in our ocean when the states are already doing it and everyone's calling for harmonisation and national leadership, why won't they do that? And why won't they take the voluntary targets and just put them into law? Something simple, especially when the industry themselves say they're going to meet those targets. Uh, it's not going to cost them any extra. Why won't they do that? Well, that is a question that we're going to continue to discuss in this place. My personal view is, yes, there is some small government ideology on the other side, perhaps a lot of small government ideology, and there are people here who are fundamentally opposed to regulation. We have a very distinct difference of opinion there. I believe government has a strong role to play in our lives, particularly around an environmental issue that needs government intervention. But I also think a big part of the problem is the packaging industry are big donors to the Liberal Party. Visi has donated $1.8 million to the Liberal Party since they've been in government. And they are arguably the biggest packaging industry on the planet. Our Prime Minister stopped to visit Visi on his way to the United Nations, ironically, to talk about the action he was going to take on plastic pollution, which we haven't done today. But that just shows you how powerful these big donors can be on our democratic processes in here. Even the recycling industry that employs 60,000 people who supported these amendments, the recycling industry supported these amendments. And I would like to uh, make a shout out to, to Gail Sloan from what the Waste Management Association of Australia for her evidence she's given it at Senate inquiries. She's been quite happy to talk to the media and to stakeholders to let them know about her, the views of her association. And of course, uh, Rose Reid from the National Waste and Recycling uh, Industry Council. They've both been very vocal about their members, 60,000 people they employ, that they wanted to see these amendments, but so powerful are the packaging industry and the Food and Grocery Council and the others that have opposed mandatory schemes that ultimately we failed by one vote to get this uh, reform through. But um, as I think even Senator Birmingham has acknowledged, this is definitely not the end of the road. Uh, the government has a number of plans they're going to be bringing in. We are going to continue to scrutinise those. Uh, we're definitely not going to uh, step back. Uh, we're going to be keeping 
a very close eye on this and making sure that we do get single-use plastics banned around the country and that we do get we absolutely do everything we can as a parliament to make sure that these voluntary targets to move to 100 per cent recyclable and compostable. Every time you walk into the supermarket, senators, look around you every time when you go this afternoon to buy some milk, have a look at all that packaging. By 2025, that's got to be 100 per cent recyclable or compostable, according to the voluntary targets that have been set by the industry, which I'll remind you one last time they say they are going to meet. 30 per cent of all that packaging needs to be made from recycled material, preferably from Australia. And that's Australian jobs. That gives the recycling industry the confidence they need. So just to finish, uh, I, I would really like to thank some key people that have helped campaign to get uh, some, some reform into this area and no doubt um, will continue to campaign. Many of them have been uh, very close to this for a number of years. Um, I would like to thank uh, the Boomerang Alliance, uh, in particular Robbie Kelman in Tasmania, um, Toby Hutchin and Jeff Angel. Uh, from Sydney. Boomerang Alliance is an alliance of 46 different environment groups around the country. Um, they played a pivotal role in getting container deposit schemes up in New South Wales and other places. They're really, really good people um, and they know this better than anyone. And I know how disappointed they're going to be when this third read is voted on in a minute without key amendments. I'd like to also have a particular shout out to WWF Australia, in particular to Katinka Day, who's been hitting the phones very hard. Um, they have nearly two million people on the remail list. They've been calling for these amendments to be supported. I know many senators have received those emails and probably some very nice, hopefully personable phone calls to their office to encourage them to do the right thing. Um, in Greenpeace, uh, Jamie Hanson, thank you. And speaking of Hansons, Jeff Hanson from Sea Shepherd, and of course his lovely wife. Marina Hanson, who's appeared at two Senate inquiries now to give evidence of why Sea Shepherd have a marine debris program and what they're doing around uh, marine plastics. Um, I would also like to, uh, to cover Sea Shepherd Tasmania, particularly uh, Michael Broom, um, Erin Harris and Sarah Briggs, who do a fantastic job and I know have been, uh, have been very active in trying to get support for these amendments. Uh, the Humane Society International, uh, thank you for your, for your support. Uh, Australian Marine Conservation Society. Uh, they've been uh, trying to get their members active to try and call, call on senators to support these amendments as well. They also have hundreds of thousands of Australians on their contact lists that they've been talking to. Um, but in particular, Shane Cooker, who's uh, been, who's been uh, leading that for them. Um, I'd like to kind of get to uh, talking about Surfrider Foundation. Uh, interestingly, uh, they were here yesterday uh, trying to get the government to oppose PEP 11 uh, drilling off Newcastle and Sydney. I used to be on the board of Surfrider Foundation many moons ago before I came into politics. Um, they, have, they have been campaigning on marine plastics since 2005 and that's where I started. Their Rise Above Plastics campaign in 2006, they were the first environment group around the world to campaign on marine plastics. Because surfers see it, they see it in the water, they can see what was happening in their beach cleanups. They knew uh, over 20 years ago that this was a massive environmental problem and I know they're going to be bitterly disappointed today to see that we have the first chance in a decade to do something about it in this place. Uh, we have squibbed that responsibility. Uh, in particular, Susie Crick, who I think has appeared at least five different Senate inquiries to talk about why that organisation wants real action, uh, and uh, Brendan Donoghue. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Patagonia uh, and uh, Plastic Free July and Plastic Free Launceston, um, particularly Trish Horsler, and um, uh, a real shout out to the Peloton Against uh, Plastic Guys who have been very active on social media. Um, they cycled across Vietnam um, along the Mekong River talking to Vietnamese businesses. The world's great rivers produce most of our marine plastics. Most of what we find in Australian beaches is from Australian sources, however most of the world's great rivers produce the bulk of plastics and they spent six months cycling their bikes, talking to Vietnamese uh, business people, uh, citizens about what they can do to replace plastics and they're continuing that work like a lot of good people, they're not giving up. Um, and a particular shout out to, uh, to Paul Hellier and Jamie Lepre, uh, absolute legends, thank you for everything you've done. Um, 
Uh, Kate Nelson, uh, Plastic Free Mermaid, she's made an absolute legend as well. Um, she's uh, well known all around the world for her advocacy on living without any plastic for decades. Um, and she's been, an she's been an absolute gem with getting people motivated uh, to uh, call their local senators and take some action here. Um, I'd also just uh, like to finish, uh, and it's unusual to talk about staff in this place, but um, Fraser Brindley, who used to work for me, uh, he used to uh, work in the waste space in the EPA uh, in Victoria, and I know his heart's in this, and he, he did a significant amount of the work uh, on the private members bill that these amendments were based on working with stakeholders and I'd like to thank Fraser for everything he's done over many years and it also might surprise some people I'd like to acknowledge uh, surprise because she's not here but uh, Lee, Senator Lee Rhiannon uh, who came to me in 2014 and said I think we really need a big Senate inquiry into marine plastic why, why, why isn't the Senate looking at this issue and what we can do even then we knew that um, the government had put under EPBC law had listed marine debris as a threatening process. We all knew back then it was killing marine life. In fact, it was a, it was a weapon of mass destruction to marine life. Uh, yet no one was looking at what the government was actually doing to act on the problem. So I'd like to thank Lee for, for that quiet moment when she sat down with me and suggested the Senate inquiry, because that's really where things kicked off. So um, I just finish by saying uh, this is not the end of the road. Um, the government has come a long way. Uh, they've got a lot further to go. Uh, I understand why people are cynical that uh, the packaging industry have never met any of the targets, never kept any of the promises they've made over 30 years in this country. I sincerely hope that is going to change in the years to come. Uh, the Greens will continue to work constructively with all political parties, with anyone, to help solve this problem, Acting Deputy President. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, the question is that this bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Call the clerk. Recycling and Waste Reduction Bill 2020. Recycling Waste Reduction Consequential and Transitional Provisions Bill 2020. Recycling and Waste Reduction Charges General Bill 2020. Recycling and Waste Reduction Charges Customs Bill 2020, Recycling and Waste Reduction Charges Excise Bill 2020. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Social Security Administration Amendment Continuation of Cashless Welfare Bill 2020 for concurrence. Minister. I proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that the bill proceed without formalities and be read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Social Security Administration Act and for related purposes. Minister. I table an addendum to the explanatory memorandum relating to the bill and move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Uh, leave being granted. Please incorporate the report. I think debate. Thank you. I call uh, Senator Dodson. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Acting Deputy Speaker. I rise to speak on the Social Security's Administration Amendment uh, Continuation of Cashless Welfare. Bill 2020, and I move the amendment uh, on sheet 1166, circulated in my name. Labor opposes this bill, and its opposition is not based on ideology, the sort of warped ideology which, this, which drives this government. No, our opposition is based on evidence, and the overwhelming evidence is that the cashless welfare card and income management generally does not work. Yet in the face of that evidence, the government remains determined to pursue the cashless debit card because it's determined to punish the poor and the marginalised in society. This is a get back. Get back to where you belong. This is a get back to them. This is not snap back or come back. It's get back to where you belong because you have no value and no worth in our society. That's the message it sends. The government is even refusing to release the University of Adelaide report. Which, was, which has examined the card's viability in the goldfields regions in my home state of Western Australia. That report cost $2.5 million. 
and we're having to consider this bill without being able to be informed about what it says. That can, uh, there can only be one reason for that, and that is the government uh, uh, withholding this evaluation report because it doesn't like what it has to say, because it's sure uh, to be further evidence that this cashless debit card is not achieving the policy objectives and outcomes that the government has been touting. This is, a typic this is typical of a government that refuses to have its policies directed by sound evidence. A government that prepares to uphold its credited ideology so that it can punish or adopt punitive policies. Not that everyone on the government on the government side is backing this legislation. Last week the Liberal member for Bath, for example, said, and I quote this, this is just not enough, there is just not enough evidence that supports this program. Uh, this program is, is a game changer for those communities and, and individuals placed on it to justify the associated harm that it causes. And that member dissent the, uh, dissented from the vote the other day. That's, uh, for, that, that, that's uh, from other government, uh, the government's own MPs, and she's not alone. The Liberal member for Monash said uh, he too has got problems with this bill. So how many others in the government's ranks feel that's, uh, that same sentiment, but haven't got the gumptions to stand up about this? Let me remind you how this business of income management began. It was back in 2007, in the dying days of the Howard government, when he was Prime Minister, and he had uh, Minister Bruff imposing the intervention in the Northern Territory. It was the most egregious example of bad policy in recent history, and with it came the basic card, which quarantined 50 per cent of the welfare income of Aboriginal people in the Northern Territory. The basic card was born out of a state-sponsored racism, so that the basic card could target only Aboriginal people in the Northern Territory. The Racial Discrimination Act had to be suspended. The basic card was basically discriminatory, and so is the cashless debit card, because it disproportionately impacts First Nations peoples. Let me remind you how the cashless debit card came into being. Back in 2013, Prime Minister Tony Abbott commissioned Andrew Forrest to advise on Indigenous employment and training services. The terms of reference for Forrest's inquiry were quite specific, and there was definitely no reference to income management of welfare recipients. Yet Forrest, in his report called Creating Parity, took it upon himself to devote a whole chapter on promoting what he called a healthy welfare card. How a billionaire mining magnate can assume expertise in welfare policy and be allowed to write his own agenda is beyond me. And that a government can contract out fundamental social policy takes privatisation to a whole new dimension and a dangerous level. It's a perverse way for a government to do business, deputising a privileged rich lister to design a program that limits the rights of the poor people, poor and First Nations people in particular to manage their own affairs. Back in February, when the Prime Minister announced his new closing the gaps target, he said, and I quote, to rob a person of their right to take responsibility for themselves, to strip them of responsibility and capability to direct their own futures, to make them dependent, that is to deny them their liberty, and slowly that person will wither before your eyes. The Prime Minister went on to say, <clears throat> we must restore the right to take responsibility, the right to make decisions, the right to step up. Well, the Prime Minister and his government are doing exactly the opposite. The government has now pressed the get back button with this legislation. Where's the principle that's meant to be underwriting the closing the gap, the gap agreement between the government and the coalition of First Nation peak organisations? An agreement announced with such fanfare only a few months ago. This bill flies in the face of the flowery rhetoric that followed when the National Agreement on Closing the Gap was signed back in July. The National Agreement was meant to signal a turning point in the relationship between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and the government. It was meant to be based on shared decision making on policies and programs that impacted the lives of First Nations peoples. 
In the past, Labor has been prepared to support income management under certain circumstances, but now we're, opposed, uh, we're opposing the permanent imposition of the cashless debit card because, an evidence, because of the evidence it isn't working and there's no choice for people. Let me remind you of the National Independent Study into the expansion of uh, income management, which was published in February. The study ran over three years and was funded by the Australian Research Council. And the researchers came from three universities, Queensland, Monash and Griffiths. The findings are damning. The majority of the survey participants, 77 per cent of them, reported that they had no trouble at all in managing their money before being placed on income management. 87 per cent of the participants reported that they did not have a problem with alcohol. Most card highlights felt that the income management was forced on them with minimal assistance and support to help them to use it to their advantage. And here's the real telling outcome of the study. People told the researchers that income management had not only failed to achieve and alleviate the uh, challenges, challenges that were largely non-existent anyway, but it also caused financial and other problems that did not previously exist. Some of the main problems reported in that survey response were not having enough cash for essential items that were the most infrequent complaint, difficulty providing for children and other family members because respondents did not have access to sufficient cash, difficulties participating in the cash economy because of a lack of access to cash it means uh, many are unable to purchase second-hand goods, uh, for example. The difficulty is paying rent and other bills because of glitches with the processing payments, particularly with the cashless debit card. You'd think that with that evidence uh, in hand, the government would consider this intrusive and discriminatory legislation. But no, 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 let's crash on, they say. Let's not worry about the impact of the legislation on the most vulnerable of our population. We've got a restless uh, support base to appease a support base which doggedly wants to punish the poor. That's where this government stands, a punisher of the poor and the disadvantaged. There's no choice for these people. The evidence against income management is even more distressing when it measures the socio-emotional impacts. The ARC study identifies a strong theme from the survey data that many of those forced into income management had experienced significant decline in their mental health and well-being as a result of the challenges they faced navigating their lives on the card. Whether the survey interview were, were, were conducted at Playford or Shepparton or Sejuna or Bundaberg or Harvey Bay, the sense of shame and stigma was a constant point of discussion. Generally, findings from the survey indicated that most respondents felt income management had been harmful rather than helpful. That to me is bad public policy and we're on the side against it. And what, this government's done to what has this government done to prepare the people of the Northern Territory for the serious changes they'll have to navigate? Late last year, I received a delegation of First Nations people from Central Australia. They were upset at the lack of consultation about the introduction of the cashless debit card. These people were well aware that the use of the card depended on access to telecommunications and postal services. But in many remote communities in the Northern Territory, those fundamental services uh, that we all take for granted here are simply not available. No matter how often the government might assert that there has been widespread consultation about the imposition of the cashless debit card, the people uh, who, who sat down in my office that day and whom I see on the streets of Broome every second day of the week, if not every day of the week, as a consequence of these policies, uh, left my office with a very different story. Those 25,000 or so people in the Northern Territory who are on the basic cards, more than 80 per cent of them are Aboriginal people. are to be moved arbitrarily onto the cashless debit card. There's no choice for these people. And, and don't anyone be distracted by the government's argument that the cashless debit card is technologically superior and cheaper to manage. Well, who's benefiting from the card? Certainly not the people who are on it. Because no matter how sophisticated, user-friendly, the technology might be, it still derives a policy that is punitive and discriminatory. 
Try living the life of some person on this card. Well, might you laugh, Senators? Because no matter how sophisticated or user-friendly the technology might be, it still derives a policy that is punitive and discriminatory. Mr President, I say social policy that is driven by flawed ideology and runs counter to sound evidence is bad policy. First Nations peoples have been subjected too long to bad policy. They are fed up with government interference in their lives. They are fed up with being branded as irresponsible, lazy and unable to manage their own affairs. This bill disproportionately discriminates against First Nations people, and that means it's racist. My mind to support this bill is to support racism. This government goes on and on and about how it wants to do things differently with First Nations and not to them. Well, this is a hollow mantra, and this bill cannot be supported by Labor. Thank you, Senator Dodson. It being almost 2 p.m., I'll ask senators to take their seats. We'll move to question time. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. In question time yesterday, Mr. Morrison falsely claimed that former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd had travelled in and out of Australia while the borders were closed. What is this Prime Minister's problem with telling the truth? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Well, I believe the Prime Minister has, uh, has tabled a response in the House uh, addressing those matters. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Yesterday, Mr Morrison claimed he'd exceeded his promise to get 26,200 stranded Australians home by Christmas. Isn't it the case that at least 9,000 of those registered to come home when he made that promise are still stranded? I again ask, what is this Prime Minister's problem with telling the truth? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. Mr President, since September 18, more than 43,000 uh, Australians have returned home. More than 43,000 have returned home since September 18. Uh, over 17,000 of these passengers were registered with DFAT, uh, including more than 3,700 vulnerable Australians. Uh, of course, since the government provided advice to Australians overseas to reconsider the need to travel abroad and to return home, more than 432,000 people have returned home, uh, a significant number passing through the type of quarantine places established across Australia. Those quarantine places are capped and are limited. We are working, as we have been, as closely with the states as possible to make sure there are as many opportunities as can be for Australians to return home, but to do so in a way that poses no threat to the safety Order. of Australia Senator and our management of COVID. Has expired. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. On 12 November, Mr Morrison promised stranded Australians that, and I quote, there is a queue and Australians are at the front of the queue. But the government's own data shows that in October only 50 per cent of the seats on planes arriving in Australia were filled by Australian citizens. What is this Prime Minister's problem with telling the truth? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, our government, to make sure that we give priority to Australians, has been chartering flights, Order. facilitating flights. And I can tell you on those flights, Absolutely, priority is firmly, squarely given to Australians. Order there are, of course, commercial left. flights as well that the government does not facilitate tickets on, but the government has made sure that criteria, criteria for those who may not be Australians returning home are tight. Those criteria include, include circumstances where individuals may be the partner of an Australian citizen. With rights to reside here, these are often compassionate circumstances or circumstances that are essential to the function of government or otherwise. Our effort has been on getting Australians home, but also doing so Order. in a way that maintains Australia's safe management of Order COVID-19. Senator. Senator Small. I advise the Chamber that this is not my first speech, but I have a question for the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business and a fellow West Australian, Senator Cash. Yes. Minister, through 
Bushfires and COVID-19 this year have seen unprecedented pressure on the Australian labour market. Could the minister please update the Senate on how the Morrison government has supported Australians through this once-in-a-century pandemic to stay connected to the labour force, to find employment and, indeed, the skills that they need to re-enter the workforce? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank my fellow Western Australian Senator, Senator Small, and I do acknowledge that this is these are the first question that he has asked in this place. Uh, but can I also acknowledge that he very much comes to this place representing uh, the backbone of the Australian economy, uh, because one of the hats that he has worn uh, is as a small business owner, someone who knows what it's like uh, to have sleepless nights, uh, to employ people uh, and to build up a business. And uh, in that respect, uh, he's certainly a welcome skill set in the Senate. So congratulations, Senator Small. But Mr President, um, as Australians would be aware, we have performed better than other nations when it comes to uh, the health response to COVID-19 uh, and certainly on the economic front when we look at nearly every other country uh, in the world. What we are now seeing, though, is the beginning of the labour force recovery. And over the last few months, we've seen it's around 648,000 500 Australians returning to work as lockdowns ease. Um, and as is now evident. As you ease those restrictions, as you ease those lockdowns, more and more businesses are able to open their doors uh, and more and more Australians are able to return to work. Uh, our JobKeeper program has been, of course, instrumental in keeping employees connected to their employment. Uh, it is Australia's largest wage subsidy program and uh, it has kept around 3.8 million Australians connected to their employer, and it's directly saved that it's estimated at least 700,000 jobs are building the foundation for our economic recovery. However, Mr President, as the Prime Minister says, we know that uh, there remains a long road ahead. And certainly when you look at the employment services uh, caseload, it has increased substantially since COVID-19 hit. At the onset of COVID-19, though, the government had acted quickly to ensure that our employment services providers Order, was Senator resourced Cash, to deal with the, the influx. Order, Senator Cash, time for the answer Senator Small, a supplementary question. Indeed, Mr President. Uh, Minister, how will the government's $74 billion jobmaker plan build on the success of our existing employment services programs as we build, rebuild a stronger economy as part of our comeback, Senator Watt, from COVID-19. Senator Cash. Uh, well, Mr President, certainly the government has a number of employment programs, and these employment programs are designed to get people off welfare and into a job. Uh, and these include, Order. of course, Job Active, our Youth Jobs Path program, which looks at preparing our young people uh, who are at risk of long-term unemployment, uh, giving them the skills they need and the opportunity uh, to undertake work, and of course, Parents Next, uh, which is a pre-employment program designed uh, for parents uh, whose youngest child is entering school age. Age, and they need to get job ready. Uh, as a government, we have in place the programs uh, that are specifically designed to improve the employability of Australians so that they are able to take that next step and gain employment. And certainly, as we emerge from COVID-19, the government wants to build on the record that we already have and improve services for our most affected regions, but also for our most disadvantaged job seekers putting in place the policy framework to ensure that those most disadvantaged Order, are Cash. able to get Time into work. Time for the answers expired. A final supplementary question, Senator Small. Mr President, uh, can the minister outline how these programs will interact with the record investment the Morrison government has provided in skills and training to support job seekers to get the skills that they need to find new employment as the labour market recovers? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, as this government knows, all of our policies work together. They work together to strengthen the economy so that businesses can reopen their doors uh, and employ more Australians. The policies work together as part of our $74 billion job maker plan. And Mr. President, along with putting in place the economic framework required for growth, our employment programs themselves they support out-of-work Australians into training and vocational pathways to ensure that they have the skills that they need to get a job. And of course, this now works in conjunction with the $1 billion job trainer fund, which provides up to 320,000 free 
or low-cost training places in areas of actual skills demand. We've worked, as I've said previously, with the states and territories on the ground to understand their actual labour market demand so that when people are looking at putting their hand up and undertaking these free or low-cost courses, they are getting skilled up for actual areas of labour market Order. demand Senator in that Cash, particular state or territory. Order, Senator Cash, the answer has expired. Order. Order. On my... Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rastin. An Anglicare survey found that under the old rate of job seeker in March, 72 per cent of respondents skipped meals every week, with most skipping an average of three or four meals a week. How many job seeker recipients will be forced to skip meals because the Morrison government is refusing to grant a permanent increase? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, um, Mr. President, and I, and I thank the, the Senator for her uh, for her question. Um, well, uh, I acknowledge the, the report today, uh, the Angle Care report, which um, sets out its findings from a, a, a limited survey of 618 people around their attitudes towards income Order. support payments and mutual Order. obligations. I am unaware um, of whether this survey is a, is a representative survey, but I would point out that it is exactly that. It is, is a survey. Um, but one of the things that I, I would say, um, Senator uh, McAllister, is that we on this side know, through massive amounts of validated research um, across many different organisations uh, and, and speaking to many Australians, that we know that the best way to improve outcomes for people, the best way that we can improve um, their well-being and their livelihoods, is to make sure that we have a strong economy that creates jobs, so people have got jobs. Because we know from surveys such as the Hilda survey that people who live in a household that do not have uh, um, employment income are much more likely to have worse well-being outcomes than those people that live in houses where uh, income uh, is generated through employment. So, um, you know, whilst obviously we will continue order, to work— Senator Rustin. Senator McAllister on a point of order. Yes, my point of order goes to relevance. Uh, the minister has uh, indicated that she doesn't necessarily accept the Anglicare survey results, but my question really was about how many job seeker recipients she considers will be forced to skip meals. If she doesn't accept the Anglicare results, I'd appreciate understanding what her understanding Senator of the consequences Senator McAllister, with respect, are. You, you strayed from a point of order there towards the end. Um, the minister can be directly relevant while she is talking about the survey, while she is talking about job seeker or one of the other elements of your question. Um, and so, to that extent, the minister is being directly relevant. Um, I can't instruct her how to answer the question. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, and uh, I would, would go on to say that, that the most important thing that we can do to make sure that people have got um, have got the best possible opportunity um, to be able to uh, to have the, the well-being that, that we all would like every Australian to have is to make sure that there are jobs in the economy so people can go to jobs. Uh, I'd also point out that the government remains Order. committed to supporting Australians through this pandemic. In fact, um, you know, in in a minute coming into this place will be uh, some legislation that we seek to extend the coronavirus supplement yeah. to enable people to be able to have that additional level of support as we recover from this pandemic. Order, Senator Rustin. Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. Following the, additional, uh, the initial reduction to the coronavirus supplement, an ACOS survey found in September that 80 per cent of respondents would skip meals and reduce their intake of fresh fruit and vegetables. How many children will be forced to skip meals and miss out on fresh fruit and vegetables because the Morrison government is refusing to grant a permanent increase to job seeker support to their parents? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, as this place um, must acknowledge, um, since March, when we had came into this place and collectively, as everybody in this place, made a decision that we would put additional support in place for all Australians to help them through this, uh, the, this once in a century pandemic. Um, we Order. have had in place since then elevated levels of support through welfare payments, through the coronavirus supplement or through other payments that were made um, through stimulus payments. But at the same time, we also worked uh, through the employment um, situation to make sure we kept people engaged with their employers through the JobKeeper program. These measures are still order. in place. They order. remain Senator in place now and they will continue to be in place. On a point of order. 
Point of order, direct relevance. And this is a question that goes to an issue the Senate is keen to hear an answer on, and which is Australian children being forced to skip meals and miss out on fresh fruit and vegetables. And I would ask you to ask the minister to return to the question. Um, the minister can be directly relevant to this question by addressing the matters you raised, Senator Wong. The preface to that part of the question also includes a reference to the supplement payment. The minister is in order if she is addressing e any part of the question, um, and I believe she is directly relevant at the moment in doing that. Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Well, one of the, uh, the great hallmarks of Australia's welfare system is that it is comprehensive and it is targeted. And in addition to the payments, the elevated level of payments that are currently available to people on welfare, uh, we also have a number of other payments Order. to Senator support Senator Rustin, them. time has expired. Senator McAllister, a final supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. Why is the Morrison government prioritising spending $15 million of taxpayers' money on a marketing campaign, praising a comeback, while leaving Australians behind and forcing them to skip meals during the deepest recession in almost a century? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, during the last, uh, in 2019, um, this government um, spent in excess of $200 billion supporting Australians through our very comprehensive welfare system. And I can assure you, uh, Senator McAllister, in 2020, the amount of support that has been provided to the Australian public who find Senator themselves White. on tough times will be significantly higher than that $200 billion that was spent in the previous year. Because we as a government, with the support of those opposite and those, uh, everyone in this chamber and in the other place, um, voted to support Australians with ever elevated levels of payment during that time. Uh, so, uh, in, in response to your, your, your question, um, the this government has stood side by side with Australians who have done it tough through this pandemic. We remain side by side with those Order. people and we will continue Order. to support them Senator for as long Rustin, as is needed. Senator Rustin, time for the answer has expired. Senator O'Neill. Senator Waters. Thanks, President. My question is to the minister representing the Environment Minister, Senator Birmingham. A recent paper in top scientific journal Nature showed that after three severe mass coral bleachings in just five years, the coral cover of the Great Barrier Reef is now at 50 per cent. Half the corals are dead. Dead coral does not grow back. It's climate change that is the primary cause of that loss. How much of the Great Barrier Reef has to die before this government will adopt a climate policy that isn't written by the fossil fuel industry? Minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, Mr. President, and I completely reject the assertion made by Senator Waters. Completely reject the assertion at the end of her question. There, our government, our government consistently has worked to make sure that Australia has the policies in place to implement the commitments that Australia has made through the Kyoto Protocol, through Stage Two of the Kyoto Protocol commitment period, and we now continue to work hard to implement policies necessary to meet our commitments in relation to the Paris Agreement. We have done that, recognising that Australia alone doesn't solve the issues in relation to climate change. Australia alone plays a role, and I'll, I'll, take, I'll take Senator Wish Wilson's interjection quite, uh, quite happily, Mr President. The leadership we've shown as a country is the leadership of a nation who makes commitments, delivers on our commitments and exceeds on the delivery of our commitments. We will be quite happy, we will be quite happy to go anywhere and explain Australia's achievements, the achievements of Australian businesses, Order. of Australian people, of Australian farmers, of all of those Australians who have contributed towards reducing Australia's emissions, who have enabled Australia to reduce our emissions by 16.6 per cent since 2005. And we have done so knowing that these steps around global cooperation are necessary to tackle issues, including related to the protection of the Great Barrier Reef. We know that Australia alone won't achieve it, but we believe we set a high standard by delivering on our commitments, by exceeding those commitments, 
and by demonstrating to the world that you can do it as a nation, at home, as Australian businesses, households and farmers have successfully done and continue to do so. Senator Ward has a supplementary question. Thank you, President. Last week, in its three yearly World Heritage Outlook, the IUCN downgraded the outlook for the Great Barrier Reef to the most severe listing possible, critical, due to the threat posed by climate change and water quality. Next year, the World Heritage Committee will once again consider whether to list the Great Barrier Reef as World Heritage in danger. This is the last warning that Australia is going to get before a potential in danger listing that would decimate the tourism industry. Will you treat this as a wake-up call Senator or not? Order, Senator Waters. Time for the questions expired. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, in addition to the action that Australia has taken uh, on emissions reduction uh, and that we continue to take uh, in collaboration with the rest of the world, we have absolutely acted to invest uh, through our reef plans in co collaboration with the Queensland government to tackle other threats and challenges to the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, we know that sedimentary runoff uh, can and does have a real impact in relation to water quality in the reef, and that's why we've invested in a range of different practical initiatives to be able to support and improve that water quality in the reef, to tackle practical issues like the crown of thorn starfish uh, and ensure that works to minimise and eradicate the impact of crown, and thor crown of thorns continue as a result of the type of investments made by our government across a range of different mechanisms to support the reef health and to ensure it continues to be a crucial asset for Australia and our ecology. Senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Thank you, President. The reason for both the mass coral deaths and the IUCN outlook of critical is climate change. At one and a half degrees, we lose uh, 90 per cent of global coral reefs, and at two degrees, we lose all of them. Your government's policies have us on track for 4.4 degrees of warming. When will you adopt strong 2030 targets and an actual climate plan to give the reef any hope of survival? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. President, a few points. There. Firstly, is the oversimplification of the challenges the reef faces by the Australian Greens. I cited in my previous answer issues around water quality, issues around crown of thorn starfish. There are real issues in addition to the work to be done on climate change, and we continue to make sure that we tackle all of those issues as part of a comprehensive reef management plan that we have worked, despite political and other differences, with Queensland governments to fund and to implement and to deliver over a period of time. When it comes, Mr President, to the work around emissions reduction, I again point to the fact that Australia, since 2005, has achieved a 16.6 .6 reduction in our emissions. New Zealand has reduced theirs over a similar period of time by 1 per cent. Canada has largely flatlined. The OECD average is around 9 per cent. So, Mr. President, when it Order, comes to domestic Senator emissions Birmingham, reductions, Australia stands tall. Has expired. Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Trade, Senator Birmingham. Minister, as you know, wine exports are a billion-dollar industry in South Australia and employ many thousands of people. China's new wine tariffs will devastate many businesses and people across the state. Already there are reports of jobs being lost and businesses cutting back in the new year. And just today, the ABC has reported China is adding more restrictions even on Australian beef. What support is the government putting in place to protect South Australian businesses and South Australian jobs from the Chinese tariffs? Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, Mr President. I thank, uh, I thank Senator Griff for his question, and I know his strong interest, uh, as is mine, and indeed uh, I suspect this is an interest shared uh, by all South Australian senators and by senators from all wine-producing states across Australia about the concern we have around the imposition by China of provisional anti-dumping measures of between 107 per cent and 212 per cent on Australian wine imported into China. Uh, our government again reiterates that we are not aware of any evidence that Australian wine exporters have dumped their product in the Chinese market. Indeed, to the contrary, our exporters have worked hard to establish themselves as reliable suppliers of premium wine to the China market. Uh, they've done so selling at, on average, the second highest price point in the China market, uh, for which uh, China is, for Australian exports of wine, uh, the highest large price point market. 
demonstrating that far from dumping, uh, we absolutely send premium product at premium prices into that market. We are working closely in response to these issues with the Australian wine industry to respond to use the 10-day window provided by the Chinese Ministry of Commerce uh, for uh, a response to their findings and to support the Australian industry in their response to these investigations. Uh, we also continue to work closely with industry to seek to pursue every other opportunity for Australian exporters to be able to tap into the rest of the world. Under our network of trade agreements that our government has negotiated, Australian exporters have opportunities in countries like uh, Korea and Vietnam, in the United States under previous FTAs, in Japan as of next year, to be able to export wine duty-free, tariff-free into those markets. We want to support them to grow those markets as we aspire to do so in other markets around the world too. Senator Griff, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, job losses will be concentrated in a handful of South Australian regions such as the Barossa and McLaren Vale. Now, the Commonwealth has historically established regional adjustment funds to assist displaced workers in specific areas. These funds stimulated local investment, offered retraining and provided employment services. Will the minister commit to, to supporting workers with a wine industry adjustment fund? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, uh, we provide, uh, provide a range of, uh, of measures to support the wine industry in terms of their uh, marketing and access to, uh, to uh, other sales opportunities around the world. Uh, we do that through the wine equalisation tax rebate uh, that, uh, that sees in the case of most small wine producers than paying no net wine equalisation tax at all. Uh, we do that through funding and support provided uh, to Wine Australia that uh, helps and enables exporters to be able to grow and reach uh, into other markets around the world. Uh, our commitment is certainly to continue to work closely with the Australian wine industry, who has shown great resilience and adaptability uh, over a period of decades. Uh, it's an industry that has seen uh, surpluses and vine pools, as well as uh, shortages and planting schemes. And so uh, it knows that these challenges come from time to time. I am confident that by standing alongside them, we will be able to help them pivot to other markets and pursue those other opportunities. Senator Griff, a final supplementary question. Uh, so I'll take it, Minister, that you won't commit to supporting uh, with a wine industry adjustment fund based on your answer. We've now experienced a damaging series of trade disruptions across many sectors, sectors, with the government's approach primarily being reactive. Does the government accept the need for a proactive approach to building resilience? And you did mention resilience uh, previously, Minister. And if so, what actions are you planning to take? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. I thank, uh, I thank Senator Griff. Uh, the, the resilience in terms of opportunities for Australian exporters comes from uh, the range of opportunities and avenues that, uh, that are available to them. When our government was elected, uh, around 27 per cent or thereabouts of Australia's exports uh, were covered by preferential ta tariff access into export markets. As a result of the work we have done, not just through the China FTA, but by negotiating FTAs that give preferential access into markets like Japan, the Republic of Korea, Canada, Mexico, Vietnam, Indonesia, Hong Kong, Peru. These are a range of markets for which we have provided opportunities and avenues for Australian exporters to enjoy a comparative advantage. We stand alongside them through our export market development grants, through the work of our Austrade officers, through a range of other support to help them grow their exports, which they have done across a range of markets, Order. And which we will Senator continue Birmingham. to support them to do. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Yesterday, Senator Birmingham said that the robo-debt scheme, and I quote, obviously had issues. When did the Morrison government first become aware that the robo-debt scheme obviously had issues? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, uh, as I did yesterday, I refer the Senator to the answers that, uh, that Senator Rustin has given on those matters. Senator Kitching, a supplementary question. Was the government told in a department, department brief on or around 1 March 2017 that a third of robo-debts had been reassessed and reduced to zero dollars? Senator Birmingham. 
Well, Mr. Mr. President, in relation to a, a particular departmental brief of a particular date, uh, I will take that on notice, uh, Mr. President, and, uh, and seek to provide uh, a response to, uh, to the senator. Now, I would reiterate uh, in this matter that it is important for governments to be able to ensure that taxpayer dollars, where they are paid out, are paid where they are validly, validly meant to go. And in relation to, in relation to our government, we have acknowledged on this program that there was a need to refund certain payments and to correct in relation to those issues. We equally, Mr. President, we equally, Mr. President, stand Order. by the need to make sure that taxpayer dollars are respected and that the Commonwealth recoups those where they have been wrongly claimed. Order. Senator Kitchings, final supplementary question. Did the government have information in January 2017 suggesting that up to 86 per cent of robo-debts issued had to be reassessed? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, uh, our government has worked through these issues, which have been the subject of extensive questioning in relation to the dates that the senator refers, when particular information may have been provided. Uh, and if there is something, Order, Senator Walt, or, okay, Senator something further in relation to the information I took on notice before uh, that I suspect uh, has probably already been dealt with through Senate estimates, committee hearings and questions that have been of a highly repetitive nature to Senator Rustin around dates and times, Order. but if there is something further to be provided Order there, I will left. make sure that is included in the answer I took on notice Order. before. But Mr President, it does not negate Senators from on the my fact left. Senator that governments ought to make sure taxpayer dollars go to the purpose for which they are intended, and our government will continue to do so where we can and where appropriate. Order. Order. Senator McMahon. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Birmingham. Can the minister update the Senate on how the Morrison McCormack government's plan to ensure reliable, secure and affordable energy will support jobs, particularly in my Northern Territory, as part of our economic comeback from COVID? Order. Order. The Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr President. I thank Senator McMahon for her question, a passionate, a passionate Territorian who, uh, who knows full well uh, that the natural resources, the energy resources of the Territory uh, are crucial to its domestic economy and indeed to so many of its export opportunities as well. Uh, and indeed, our government is focused on delivering affordable, reliable energy to support uh, the economy, including the economy of the Territory and new jobs. Affordable and reliable power will help to lower cost of living pressures on families to ensure local businesses can grow and thrive, which, of course, in turn helps to ensure that comeback of jobs and the economy across the board that we are seeing right now. Australia's competitive advantage has always been based on its cheap energy, and the right mix around renewables, gas and energy sources are central to our ongoing economic recovery and competitiveness. We expect to see those natural resources working effectively for Australians, and a key part of this is to deliver to Australians, to industry and businesses who rely upon it, the gas resources that are necessary at the right price. Our focus is on unlocking supply, ensuring efficient transportation and empowering Australian consumers. We know that gas is a critical enabler of Australia's economy, supporting a manufacturing sector employing 850,000 Australians across the board. We know also that the Territory relies on gas generation to keep the lights on, with almost 60 per cent of electricity generation in the Territory coming from gas. And though that mix may change over time, it is an important part of any transitional growth in the renewable sector as well. The Territory is in a prime position to take advantage of the opportunities and benefits of gas. With a skilled workforce, this can grow to both onshore and offshore development opportunities. It can help with the transition in terms of a lower emissions future without imposing new costs on businesses but whilst growing Order, jobs Senator and Birmingham. opportunities across the territory. Senator McMahon, a supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister outline to the Senate how our government 
is investing in new energy technologies that will benefit Territorians. Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, Mr. President. We know that, uh, for example, a reform or um, initiatives like microgrids can help to reduce electricity bills in regional and remote communities, helping those communities to adapt and achieve innovative technologies or distributed energy sources like solar and batteries, and to reduce their reliance on costly diesel generation. Round two of our Regional and Remote Communities Reliability Fund opens on the 16th of December and will help fund feasibility studies that will look at establishing a microgrid or upgrading existing off-grid technologies which would better meet the electricity supply needs of regional and remote communities. Under round one of the program, $5.5 million was delivered for the Territory across five grants in 25 different locations. We have also invested more than $2 million through ARENA in the Alice Springs Future Grid project, which aims to overcome barriers to generating renewable energy and support affordable renewable energy for 30,000 residents in Order. Alice Springs Senator and communities Birmingham. up to 130 Time kilometres away. Expired. Senator McMahon, a final supplementary question. Can the minister please update the Senate on how our government is supporting gas developments, including in the Beetaloo Basin, that will drive down prices of energy for businesses and for consumers. Senator Birmingham. We thank Senator McMahon. As part of our government's policies there, we look to unlock, as I said before, new gas supply that can help to drive down prices for all Australians, particularly those job-creating Australian businesses and industries who rely upon it. Under our reforms, the Beetaloo Basin is one of the first of our government's five strategic basin plans. These plans highlight the ways that the gas development in the basin can be accelerated, and we welcome the opportunity to work with the Northern Territory Government on this. Unlocking the Beetaloo is an exciting economic opportunity for the Northern Territory. It is a world-class province with an estimated size bigger than any other known gas resource off the northwest shelf. Early drilling activities confirmed the positive opportunities there, which could not only improve our gas security but also potentially Australia's fuel security as well. The development of gas reserves in the Beetaloo has the potential to generate billions of dollars for the territory economy and create over 6,000 jobs. This is great opportunity for Order. the territory, Senator and we are committed Time to delivering the answer upon has it. Expired. Senator Lambie. Order. Order. Senator Lambie has the call. Senator McKenzie, I just said Senator Lambie has the call. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. On the 13th of July, the Prime Minister changed the Special Operation Unit Citation regulations. He made it so that unit citations can be collectively or individually cancelled or individually forfeited on conviction for a disgraceful or serious offence. What was the Prime Minister's trigger for making these changes in July this year? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks um, Mr President. And, uh, uh, and indeed, um, if, we, uh, if we go back over the history of uh, some of the steps around citations, in, uh, in February 2018, I understand the then Minister for Defence Personnel sought approval to make a number of amendments to defence honours and awards, including in relation to recommendations from inquiries uh, by the Defence Honours and Awards Appeal Tribunal in 14 and 15 relating to withholding and forfeiture of awards. Uh, in May 18, the then Assistant Minister to the Prime Minister agreed to a full review of the relevant instruments. Uh, following extensive drafting efforts in May 2020, the Minister for Defence recommended a range of changes uh, to Australian Operational Service Medal, the Australian Defence Medal and Unit Citations, um, and, uh, and those were then given effect uh, in accordance with the normal process in July 2020. So, Senator, uh, Senator Lambie, uh, the point I guess of going through that history is, uh, is that in fact it dates right back if we, uh, to 2015 when a full review of defence honours and awards, medals and instruments uh, were undertaken. Uh, the review was undertaken in order to strengthen and expand the eligibility for certain awards, uh, uh, to reflect previously agreed recommendations of the reviews of tribunals, as I referenced, and to ensure consistency in terminology and definitions. They were the reasons for those changes, uh, Senator. Uh, I, uh, I, as I did last week, I want to make sure in relation to all of these matters that, uh, that I restate uh, 
very much the fact that uh, our government, I know you, uh, and indeed I am sure all members of this place, um, acknowledge uh, the service and sacrifice uh, of those who have served us, uh, including in Afghanistan, uh, and that the overwhelming vast majority have done so with pride, distinction and honour. Order, Senator Birmingham. Senator Lambie, a supplementary qu question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. So we all know about um, we all know about the report, the Brereton report, back in 2015. So just when you decide to change all this, it seems the, these timings are starting to line up. Did the Prime Minister consult with the Chief of Defence Force or the Defence Minister before making any of those changes? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Well, in uh, as I said, in stepping through. Uh, the process there, the, the changes that, uh, that were made in July of 2020 uh, were a function of quite a long process dating back uh, some six years. Uh, so there were extensive consultation opportunities uh, through that time, uh, from the original recommendations of the reviews by the Defence Honours and Awards Appeals Tribunal in 2014 and 15, uh, and then subsequent opportunities for consultation. Uh, which were certainly undertaken uh, by the relevant agencies of government. Senator Lambie, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. The Prime Minister's changes were the first time the regulations for this citation have been amended in 30 years. Why, after 30 years, were these changes made a few months before the Brereton report was handed down, and is that just a coincidence? Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, indeed, the processes around these, starting in 2014 and 2015, actually began before the Brereton report was even commissioned. Um, so, uh, so it certainly is the case that the initial instigators, if you like, of these changes in relation uh, to uh, citation and award practices dated back prior to uh, the commissioning of the Brereton report. Uh, the changes were made well before that report was completed and before the Prime Minister was briefed on it. The Prime Minister was only briefed on the content of that report in November of 2020, uh, some months after the changes had been made in July of 2020. Uh, Mr President, uh, the government understands the extreme sensitivities in relation to these matters. Uh, it is why we expect them to be handled with sensitivity uh, and why we uh, are at pains to stress and reinforce the fact that we have nothing but the highest of regard for the exemplary service of the vast Order. majority Senator of Australian Birmingham. service Time men and the women. Answer has expired. Senator Polly. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. How many older Australians in their 80s and 90s are still waiting for their approved Level 4 packages because the Morrison government have left them behind? Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, I don't have the exact number for Level 4 with me, but Mr President, the number of Australians waiting on, on the national priority list for aged care home care packages is just under 100,000 as of uh, the beginning of no November. I don't have the breakdown for each level, Mr President. But, uh, Mr President, that number Order. of people who are waiting for home care packages has of course reduced significantly over the last uh, 12 months or so since March last year. Mr President, when in March last year the number of people waiting for a home care package was about 129,000 people, Mr President, it's now under 100,000 people at uh, about 98, 98 99,000. And that, Mr President, is because of the significant investment that we have put into the home care sector uh, over recent years, Mr. President, $4.6 billion Order. invested into home care packages, Mr. President, since the 18-19 budget. Uh, 23,000 packages at a cost of $1.6 billion over the forward estimates in this year's budget, Mr. President, announced just recently, and of course, 6,105 new home care packages announced in July as part of the economic mm. statement that we announced in July. So almost 30,000 new packages this financial year, Mr President. So from when we came to government in 2013, when there were only 60,000 home care packages in the system, there will be 185,000 packages in the system 
uh, by the time we get to the end of this financial year, Mr. President. So, Mr. President, I'm happy to come back to the chamber with the exact number of people on a level four package that are, that are on the uh, national priority list. But as I've said, the number on the total number on the national priority list is about 99,000. Senator Polly, a supplementary question. Mr. President, why is the minister still sending letters to older Australians? to advise them that they've been assigned a home care package, even though they've passed away 12 months ago. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, it is um, very unfortunate that some people uh, receive letters, and I've had communication with some of those families myself, Mr President, that have received a letter uh, offering a home care package or about a home care package in some circumstances is to inquire whether they intend to take up their allocated home care package after they've passed away. But, Mr President, unfortunately, the responsibility for notification of deaths goes through uh, state systems. And sometimes, Mr. President, Order. sometimes, Mr. President, it takes Order. Mr. President, uh, and, uh, and sometimes it takes some time for those notifications to pass through to the Commonwealth. Mr President, so this is not this is not as Order. the opposition this is not as the opposition might like Order. to try and portray some sort of blame shifting exercise. It's a, it's, it's a fact that Senator sometimes Wong. the systems take Senator time Rennick. to report through to the system, Mr President. Order. I Senator have Colbeck. asked Mr President time on a number for the of answer occasions. has expired even though I struggled to hear it. Senator Polly, a final supplementary question. How many letters has the minister sent to older Australians advising they've been assigned a home care package after they've sadly passed away? Can you now promise that no more grieving families will receive these distressing letters? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, Mr President, unfortunately I'm not able to guarantee that no further families will receive such a letter. Um, unfortunately, I have asked to be able to be able to do that on a number of occasions, but unfortunately, uh, the flow of data doesn't give me the capacity to be able to do order. that. Senator Polly, on a point of order. Yes, Mr. President. The uh, question that I asked initially was, how many letters have you sent out? Senator you haven't Polly, even attempted Senator to Polly, answer Senator that. Polly, please. That 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 was. That, that, quite frankly, was an abuse of a point of order. There was no way the minister could have been more directly relevant to the answer. I'm not, I am, if people don't make an attempt to make a point of order on direct relevance, I'm going to clamp down on a simple restating of the question. The minister was being absolutely and utterly directly relevant to the question asked. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Um, and, and look, uh, my condolences to any family member who has lost a loved one. Um, and, it is, and, and, and I have to say I am sorry that people do get such letters after their family members have passed away. Uh, they have my sincere condolences and apologies. That is not the way we would like to be able to run the system, but unfortunately sometimes notifications into uh, my aged care take some time and, these sorts of, uh, the, and those letters are sent out, Mr President. Mr. President um, I am happy to come back to the chamber and, and find a number that Senator Polly has asked for with respect to those letters, but Mr. President, I can't guarantee that those letters Order. won't Senator go out Senator Colbeck, the time for the answer has expired. Senator Molan. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, uh, Senator Reynolds. Uh, can the minister provide an update on Defence's international operations, deployments and engagements in 2020 to help make Australia more secure? Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Molan for that question and also for his service to our nation. This year has challenged all Australians, as in individuals, but also as a nation. So, in many ways, 2020 has also been a year like no other for defence. But defence adapted very quickly in February and continued to work COVID-19 safe. Vital exercises and engagements have continued. 4,800 ADF personnel will have deployed overseas this year. The Air Force completed more than 53,000 uh, hours of flying. We have had uh, 25 ships at sea throughout the year. The Army undertook more than 100 international engagements activities involving 900 personnel. We have supported our Pacific family, including during humanitarian emergencies. 
Our, large, our largest regional presence deployment involved five ships and engagements with 11 regional partners. In 2020, we have concluded mentoring and training missions in both Afghanistan and Iraq. We continue to contribute to coalitions dedicated to defeating terrorism, including in Iraq and in Syria. And we are supporting our UN partners by contributing to peacekeeping efforts. I most sincerely thank all defence and ADF members who have served domestically and internationally in what has been such a challenging year. But I especially thank all their families whose support allowed those in uniform and in the department to serve our nation with such great distinction this year. And I ask all Australians to spare a thought for our personnel deployed away from home, both domestically and internationally, this Christmas. And I thank them all for their service. Yeah, yeah. Senator Molan, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Minister. Uh, can the minister provide an update on the ADF's domestic activities, including defence assistance to the civil community in 2020? Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And this has been an extraordinary year for the ADF and defence in here in Australia. We've conducted the two largest ever domestic operations to support our nation in our nation's history. We have assisted thousands and thousands of Australians uh, throughout the year. First of all, Operation Bushfire Assist involved more than 8,200 ADF personnel. It was the largest ever mobilisation of the ADF in response to a domestic disaster. This included thousands of evacuations, transporting emergency services personnel, setting up shelters, delivering meals and so much more. While the embers were still burning, however, Defence started Operation COVID-19 Assist, which has now become our largest ever domestic uh, assistance operation. So far, as of today, over 11,000 defence and ADF personnel Time have deployed. Has expired. Senator Molan, a final supplementary. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, as part of defence's ex uh, uh, extensive assistance to the Commonwealth, state, and territory authorities uh, during this year, how has the Royal Australian Air Force's Number 34 Squadron helped to provide continuity of government uh, and our democratic processes in 2020? Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank the Senator for the question. And I'm sure I speak on behalf of each and every Senator in this place here today when I thank most sincerely Air Force's 34 Squadron for its work supporting the Parliament and Executive Government during the pandemic. More than 1,400 passengers, members of Parliament and staff predominantly, have been transported over 267 legs. In the early days of the pandemic, we simply could not have been able to start the parliament without their safe and efficient service, their sense of humour, their adaptability and their commitment to this nation. So, On behalf of us all, I thank 34 Squadron for your service this year. You have kept our federal parliament and the government running this year. Thank you. Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Colbeck. The Morrison government controlled Public Accounts and Audit Committee found the administration of the $100 million sports rort scandal, and I quote, did not satisfy public and community expectations. Does the minister agree with the findings of the government controlled committee, which includes Coalition Senators Chandler, O'Sullivan and Scar. Order. Order. Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. And I thank uh, Senator Green for her question. And Mr President, I thank the Senators and the House of Reps members on the Public Accounts and Audit Committee for their work on the, on the report, Mr President. Um, uh, the report was tabled in the House yesterday. Obviously, Mr. President, uh, uh, the government will consider the recommendations in the report uh, appropriately, and then we will, as uh, process dictates, respond to the Parliament, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, the report itself considered a number of uh, programs as a part of uh, its consideration, uh, and uh, as I've said, Mr. President, we will consider the report in the usual manner and uh, make a government response, Mr. President. But I would say, in respect of 
the particular recommendations that both the ANAO made uh, and that were made in the uh, Public Accounts and Audit uh, Committee, Joint Committee of Public Accounts and Audit yesterday, that the government has already taken a number of actions with respect to uh, the application of the government gra gra grant guidelines uh, and their alignment, Mr. President. The Sport Australia accepted all three recommendations that the ANAO made to them with respect to uh, the ANAO report, Mr. President, uh, and the, uh, the government accepted the recommendation that was directed to uh, the government uh, and has put in place measures to uh, effect all of the recommendations Order. of the ANAO report, Mr. President. And recommendations in the report handed down yesterday had a very, very similar context, Mr. President. So we will consider uh, those. Order. We will consider those matters, Mr. President, uh, and we will report back to the Parliament in the usual way. Order, Senator Green, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. The Government Controlled Committee found there was, and I quote, significant uncertainty regarding the legal basis for the minister's role in approving grants. Does the minister agree that Senator Mackenzie should appear before the Select Committee on Administration of Sports Grants to explain her understanding of decision-making, including the involvement of the Prime Minister? Order. Senator Colbeck. M Mr. President, Mr. President, it's not up to me to determine what another senator does. That is, that is not my role, Mr. President. And Mr. Order. President, my understanding, my Order understanding on of my the left. Order, Senator Wall, Senator Watt, Senator Colbert, continue. Thank you, Mr. President. And my understanding is that uh, uh, Minister, uh, Senator McKenzie has provided a substantial submission yeah, to the committee. Uh, she's provided uh, uh, support to the committee with respect to their work, Mr. President. But it is not the role of one individual senator in this place, any individual senator, to dictate what another senator might do, Mr. President. We are all elected here in our own rights. We are all elected here in order, our own rights. Order, Senator right. Wong. Sorry, Senator Birmingham. A, a point of order, Mr. President. You have called Senator Wong to order quite a number of a times. A couple of times, today. actually, Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. Thank President. Thank you, Senator Colbeck. Oh, Senator Wong? Yeah, well, on the point of order, I accept that, but it is not about one person. Senator it's about Wong, the Westminster system, Mr. Seat. President. Senator Wong, I had been calling you to order. Senator Colbeck, have you to continue? Thank you, Mr. President. Um, so, my understanding of the circumstances is that uh, the, the committee's uh, written to Minister Mackenzie seeking her further assistance. Minister, uh, Senator Mackenzie, Senator McKenzie will make, uh, clearly make a decision Order. with Senator respect Colbeck. to that. Senator Green, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator, Senator Green is on her feet. Senator Watt, Senator Pratt. Senator Green. If even the government controlled committee, which includes Senators Chandler, O'Sullivan and Scar, acknowledges evidence of the favouritism shown to government seats and MPs and Liberal Party candidates in the allocation of sport grants, why can't the Prime Minister tell the truth? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that I would characterise the report in the context that Senator Green tries to portray it here in the chamber today, Mr President. Uh, Mr President, uh, having had a look at the report, having considered its recommendations, it talks about the processes of the operation of a number of grant programs, including the Community Sport Infrastructure Grants Program. Mr. President. Uh, so uh, we will consider the report uh, as appropriate. Uh, and we will respond to the parliament uh, in the usual way, Mr. President. And I don't accept the characterisation of the mindset of my colleagues uh, on that committee that Senator Green tries to portray in her question. Senator McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs. Will the minister update the House on how the Morrison government is working to keep Australians safe from the threat of terrorism and violent extremist ideologies? Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, I thank Senator McLaughlin for the question. And uh, 
Mr. President, as you'd be aware, a fundamental priority of the Morrison government uh, is to keep Australia and Australians safe. Uh, despite the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, the reality is that the threat of terrorism has unfortunately not subsided. The Morrison government has, however, invested record amounts of funding in our law enforcement agencies. Uh, the investment we're making in, for example, ASIO, into Waztrek and other agencies within the Ho Department of Home Affairs, uh, it is directed at keeping Australians safe. We know that during COVID-19, many terrorist organisations have sought to exploit the increased time that Australians have spent at home and online. Targeting young and impressionable minds, they have shamelessly exploited this situation to propagate information, ideologies and dangerous and destructive views that seek to do real harm to Australians, not only in our country but across the Western world. What we have unfortunately seen in Paris, in the United States, across Asia uh, and the Middle East are the sort of atrocities that these people would seek to perpetrate in Australia and on Australian soil against innocent men, women and children. As a government, we need to ensure that we are able to deal with the threat of terrorism whenever it may eventuate. Since September 2014, we have had 117 people charged as a result of counter-terrorism operations, and there are 22 people currently before the courts for terrorism-related offences. These are people that would seek to do significant harm to Australia and Australians. But the Morrison government is working night and day to make sure they are not successful. Senator McLaughlin, a supplementary question. How is the Morrison government investing to keep Australians safe online and protect Australia from increasing cyber security threats? Senator Cash. Uh, Mr President, Australia's cyber security capabilities are strong, uh, but as we'd all be aware, the threats we face online are increasing. It is estimated that a significant cyber attack impacting Australia for four weeks could cost the economy as much as $30 billion and an estimated 163,000 jobs. As part of our 2020-2021 budget, uh, the government will provide an additional $202 million to deliver the 2020 cyber security strategy, creating a more secure online world for all Australians. This now takes the government's total funding for the strategy to $1.7 billion to provide a cyber security uplift that is fit for purpose in the involving online environment. Uh, this strategy will protect Australians, their businesses and, of course, the essential services that we all depend upon. Senator McLaughlin, a final supplementary question. As Australians begin to travel again over the Christmas period, what will the Morrison government be doing to ensure that they can enjoy their holidays and reunite with their families safely and securely? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, since the Morrison government was elected to office, we have now passed 20 tranches of national security legislation. This legislation has ensured that Australia has the most modern and up-to-date laws that deal with the reality of encryption and the ways in which terrorist groups conceal their influencing activities on the internet. Uh, this is supporting our law enforcement agencies to dis uh, detect and disrupt threats as soon as possible for the safety of all Australians. All Australians should be reassured that over the Christmas period and over the New Year period, uh, our officers will be working 24-7 on the front line. And there are, of course, many people in the Department of Home Affairs who will be supporting them in that work. Uh, on behalf of uh, the government senators, I would like to commend those officers for the work they do to keep Australia and Australians safe. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Keneally. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take oh, a note. Um, Senator Keneally, sorry, I think Senator Colbeck is uh, seeking the call. Thank you. Minister. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you, Deputy President. Just in response to the questions from Senator Polly, uh, the number of people on the national priority system uh, as at 1 December for a level four 
Home care package is 14,375. 14,375. Mr. President, uh, sorry, Madam uh, Deputy President, and unfortunately, I'm not able to give you a number for the people who have received letters for home uh, regarding home care packages uh, subsequent to their family member passing away, because that figure does rely on being that the uh, that being reported back to uh, the government. So we don't have. Uh, full information on that because that does rely on people reporting that back to us um, uh, at, the, at this point in time. Thank you, Minister. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answer given by Senator Birmingham to the question asked by Senator Wong. Senator Wong, raised with Senator Birmingham, the fact that yesterday in question time the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, in the other place, Stated a falsehood. Stated a falsehood. And this is often the way with this Prime Minister on his feet in question time, just throwing out accusations without basis, without foundation. What did he claim? He claimed that the former Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, had been going in and out of Australia, taking up quarantine spaces from stranded Australians. No such thing ever happened. The former Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, has been in Queensland since March. He has not left the country. He has not taken up a quarantine space from a stranded Australian. But I will tell you which former Prime Minister is taking up quarantine spaces that stranded Australians are not being able to use. Senator Ciccone asks which one? Former Prime Minister Tony Abbott. Former Prime Minister Tony Abbott travelling overseas, not on Australian government business, on UK government business, on UK government business, going overseas, coming back, taking up a quarantine space, going overseas again, coming back, taking up a quarantine space. That is two stranded Australians who will not spend Christmas with their families because of former Prime Minister Tony Abbott. Not former Prime Minister Rudd, as Scott Morrison falsely claimed, but former Prime Minister Tony Abbott. We haven't heard about that from Scott Morrison. Now, two spaces, you might think. Well, what's two spaces? Let me tell you something. The number of stranded Australians has grown and grown and grown. On the 18th of September, the Prime Minister promised 26,000 stranded Australians on DFAT's list would be home by Christmas. Only 17,000 have made it back. There are some 9,000 people who are on that DFAT list on the 18th of September who literally have two days to make it back to Australia, go through quarantine and get out to be able to celebrate Christmas with their families. And of course they have a hope of celebrating Christmas with their families. The Prime Minister promised it would happen. Now when the Prime Minister makes a promise, maybe the people of Australia should be able to rely on it. As a citizen of Australia, you should be able to rely on your Prime Minister's promises. And when he looks down the barrel of a camera and he says, I'm going to get all those stranded Australians home by Christmas, well, of course, stranded Australians think they can rely on that. But what do we know about this Prime Minister, Scott Morrison? He has trouble telling the truth. He's all about the headline, never about the delivery. Always there for the photo op, never there for the follow up. And it is cruel. In this circumstance, it is cruel. There are stranded Australians. As Senator Gallagher and Senator Watt and I on the COVID committee have heard, there are stranded Australians who are trying to come back to this country. They've been trying to come back since March. They have had flights cancelled. They have spent tens of thousands of dollars, fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars trying to get flights back to Australia. They have lost their homes. They have lost their jobs. They are being sent to homeless shelters. They are living off food banks and charities. They are running foul of visa conditions in other countries. They are facing a northern hemisphere winter in the middle of a global pandemic. It is un-Australian to leave your mates behind. But that is precisely what the Prime Minister Scott Morrison is doing. He is leaving Australians behind. He has made them a promise and he is breaking that promise and he is breaking their hearts. So when you see photos of the Prime Minister on his social media, putting up his Christmas tree, sitting around 
his Christmas lunch with his family. Well, good for him. I am happy, and I wish the Prime Minister and his family a Merry Christmas. But when we see those photos, let us not forget that there are now 40,000 stranded Australians stuck overseas, barred from coming back to their country by this Prime Minister. And you know what? He has a safe COVID way to bring them back. Jane Halton, his hand-picked expert, has handed him a report that's told him how to increase quarantine capacity, told him that the federal government should take responsibility, told him the federal government should open up a quarantine facility with a human health response zone, told him that they had a responsibility to bring these stranded Australians home in the middle of a global pandemic. This Prime Minister has such a problem with the truth, and this Prime Minister is letting people down and leaving Australians behind. Thank you, Senator Keneally. Senator Antic. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, I, I have to say I, I enjoyed that, and I enjoyed it for the following reasons. Um, that was the very, very definition of the sound of straws being clutched at. Like you'd actually hear them hitting the ground. Those straws were being clutched at, and they were hitting the ground as you, as you would expect. And um, there were a number of uh, fairly flowery statements that were made there. And I did like, and I have to pay tribute to this one, bringing back the spectre of uh, Tony Abbott. Former Prime Minister Tony Abbott gets a run on this one. And it's good to see the uh, Australian Labor Party uh, finding a way to bring him back in, even into this debate. Because I, I could do a few of those myself. I've still got an issue with Gough Whitlam and blue polls. So we can always go back and we can always run over that. But there are issues. There are issues that we need to. There are issues that we need to fact check because I know my friends on the other side of the chamber love an ABC fact check. Their mates at the ABC do a fact check. They do them all the time. I don't think they do them well. I'm going to do one well for you because there are a series of facts which are overlooked. And the fact of the matter here is that the Prime Minister has made the statement yesterday. He's corrected it. It happens. The truth of the matter is that this government has helped innumerate numbers of people return to Australia during what has been a very, very difficult period. And I know that the, my friends opposite do like to ebb and flow when it comes to understanding the very difficult, difficult nature of this period, this COVID-19 pandemic. This has not been a run-of-the-mill uh, plane to go and collect some people overseas. We've seen over 432,000 Australians return from overseas since the government recommended that people reconsider the need to travel abroad back in March. 432,000 people. Now, my friends across there uh, on the other side of the chamber like to make it sound like everyone's just been abandoned. Everyone's just been abandoned. The government's just dropped hands and left everyone stranded on various different hotspots. It's just not the case. Uh, the fact is the COVID-19 pandemic is still, as we speak, not over. Another fact for my friends on the other side of the chamber. And the government's continuing to support Australians overseas, while at the same time managing that delicate balancing act of protecting Australians' health and safety and the community at home. And since the 18th of September, we are talking two months ago, 43,000 Australians have been returned home. 43,000 Australians. Once again, that's a fact check, not an ABC fact check, but a real one. Over 17,000 of these passengers have been registered with DFAT, including more than 3,700 vulnerable Australians. Um, what this means in real terms is that during the pandemic, 32,000 Australian citizens and permanent residents have returned home on over 370 flights. That's 370 flights in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, that is not just sending a Cessna down to collect a couple of mates down at the RSL Bowls Club on Kangaroo Island. 76 of these flights have been direct, directly facilitated by the government, and they've gone into difficult locations such as Peru, South Africa, India and UK. And let me say that negotiating uh, the borders, negotiating the uh, experience with those different governments has been no mean feat. The government has delivered and it has done it well. Twelve commercial flights have been facilitated by the government since 23 October, returning 1,700 passengers. Now, this includes a facilitated flight uh, with Qantas from Delhi to Hobart that landed uh, just this last Sunday with around 120 passengers. Once again, at the risk of repeating it, these are facts, uh, not ABC facts, but facts. Um, uh, 39,000 Australians are currently registered with DFAT and wish to return home. Now, some may not take up the immediate option to return, while others may seek to return home 
uh, at a later date due to particular circumstances. That, that is the nature of the ebb and flow of the situation that DFAT and the government finds itself in uh, in the middle of this pandemic. The DFAT administered hardship program um, has actually distributed over $10 million to 1,900 Australians overseas, covering the cost of accommodation, subsistence, um, flights as they may be. Uh, Australians have been as well catered for as can possibly be expected during this very difficult time. Uh, it is just incorrect to try and politicise this, to try and raise the spectre of pr uh, Prime Minister's past, to do whatever other straw-clutching exercises we have seen. Um, this government has allocated $60 million to support Australians to return home. Melbourne Airport, the second largest, um, has been taking international arrivals since July. Um, and DFAT, uh, of course, uh, will not remove any Australians from its registration database without its consent. This program continues. It continues to bring Australians home, and it continues to do so in a timely and safe manner. Thank you, Mr. Um, Senator Antic. Your time has expired. Senator Gavitcher. Uh, thank you, Madam, De Acting, uh, Madam Deputy President. And I, I look forward to the time when Senator Antic's training wheels come off and he can get through five minutes without a heap of notes. But I've got to take one exception. I mean, Blue Poles, for goodness sake, it's worth $350 million. $350 million. It's got to be a good decision 40 years ago to buy that. But anyway, let's get back to the basics here. We have a Prime Minister who misled about the activities of a former Prime Minister. And obviously he did that on advice of his uh, department, which clearly was uh, errant advice. But instead of coming out looking down the camera and saying, I stuffed up, I made, a, I made an awful mistake there, I apologise for that mistake and moving on, I hear that he tables a letter in the parliament. He doesn't address the issue directly as Australians like to, like to see when you make a mistake, fess up, own up, apologise and move on. No, he tables a letter, tries to avoid the scrutiny of it. And you know, all of this angst that's on these Australians who are stranded far away in difficult circumstances could be avoided, as I said earlier in this week, if they allocated one tenth of the political will and finances that they did when they set up a regional processing facility in Nauru to take care of 657 people, they spend approaching $500 million in a year. Now, we don't expect $500 million to be dispersed around the globe to bring people home. They'd probably stay there if you did that. They'd take the million each and stay there. But the problem is there's no acceptance that human quarantine is a federal responsibility. And when the history of this pandemic is written, It'll be one of the failures of this government. They didn't set the responsibility at the appropriate place, take charge, set the standard all around the country, and as their own expert said, if necessary, set up a processing facility. They did it in uh, the irregular maritime arrivals area, stopped the boats. Here they have the availability of aircraft. They could just lease them, sell the seats in them or whatever get people to appropriate places, process them, 14 days allow them to get home. And as Senator Keneally and others have said, there are an immense number of Australians who are not going to see their family at Christmas. And I think that's the, to the Prime Minister's enduring shame. You don't promise if you can't deliver. I have no problem if he said it's too difficult to do it for Christmas, if it's, if it's logistically impossible or if he was cautious. But no, he had bravado and said, I'll have them all lamb them for Christmas. And by the way, that former Labor Prime Minister is buggering the system up, taking up extra spaces. All erroneous. And he's not going to get people home for Christmas. And if I had relatives and family uh, stranded overseas, I'd be beside myself because some of the places they're stranded in, they're not in a good space. And I have cousins in England and the United Kingdom, and some of those cousins haven't seen their grandchildren for months. Newborn grandchildren in the same country. Can you imagine what it's like for a parent to have a child or a, a son, daughter or an aged parent overseas can't get home? I met someone in the parliament very recently. Their, their wife went to visit an ill relative in, um, in the United Kingdom and now it looks like March before she'll get a flight home. Now, they're mature people and they can conquer that distance, but, but it's not good. And we have a Prime Minister who promised. And we have a Prime Minister who says things which are totally wrong. 
And then avoiding scrutiny by taping on the letter is a very, very disturbing way for a Prime Minister to act. And then if you look at what's happened with uh, the Honourable Matthias Cormann, take a plane, mate, take a plane. Just go and fly around all the places. You, you, you'll get COVID, so you better take a private plane. And it's a private job. I don't think it's a job that is obligated to Australia. I think it's his, his position. So why would he get a $4,300 an hour plane to go and get a private position. And that, that, that's got to be stood against the test of someone who's ill and wants to get home to their family for Christmas. And, and Australians looking at that, it'll be a fail, a total fail. So, you know, Prime Minister Morrison, and I don't say that he does everything badly, but he's obviously taken some really poor advice in respect to the former Prime Minister, the Labor Prime Minister. And the way he handled that, I think, is pretty low. Australians expect a higher standard. If that was Bob Hawke or someone else, they'd get up and say, look, I was stuffed up. I'm really sorry. I made a mistake and I won't do it again and off they go. But to table a letter saying, oh, you know, I might have misled the parliament, that's very low standard. Thank you, Senator Gallacher. Senator Scar. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Well, I must say I agree with uh, Senator Gallacher in relation to his observation with respect to blue polls. I think, uh, I think it was, uh, and I did get an acknowledgement from Senator Gallagher as he left. I think it was actually a great investment, and uh, um, I, uh, I think it's probably worth somewhere north of $350 million uh, the current day. Um, this issue with respect to former prime ministers and travel. Now, I think it was, and, I, and, and my wife Louise, if she's watching, would remind me. I think it was about a month ago that my wife was walking our two rescued greyhounds, Chloe and Faye, and actually walked past our former Prime Minister, uh, Kevin Rudd, uh, who uh, has a family member who lives in our suburbs, so, and had a convivial exchange with him. Um, and it's a bit of a shame, it's a bit of a shame, Madam Deputy President, that we can't bring that conviviality with respect to former Prime Ministers into this place, because I think they all should be treated. I think all former Prime Ministers should be treated with the respect that their service to our country commands. And I say that with respect to prime ministers from both sides of politics. And the fact of the matter is, the fact of the matter is that when our prime minister became aware of the fact that a statement he made in the House of Representatives in response to a personal attack against a former prime minister in Tony Abbott, let's not forget that. Let's not forget that it was in response to a personal attack against a former Prime Minister in terms of in relation to Tony Abbott. In response to that, in response to that, our Prime Minister said something which was incorrect. And then at the first opportunity, at the first opportunity, he wrote to the clerk, and this is what he said. I'm writing to inform you that in question time today I made the following statement in response to a question from the member for Corio in relation to Australians returning home from the pandemic based on information I understood to be correct at the time. Quote, I thank the member for his question and wonder why he'd want to bring personalities into this that Mr Rudd has done the same thing, given that Mr Rudd has done the same, same thing. End quote. I have subsequently been advised that Mr Rudd has not travelled internationally during the pandemic and was not one of the 95,525 individuals who had been independently granted an exemption. The letter goes on. I also apologise to Mr Rudd for the statement and am pleased to correct the record." End quote. What is not transparent about that, Madam Deputy President? What is not transparent about that? At the first opportunity, at the first opportunity our Prime Minister corrected the record corrected the record and issued an apology to former Prime Minister Rudd. I think that entirely meets the expectations of the, entire, of, of the Australian community with respect to how a Prime Minister should respond in such, a, in such an occasion. And then when that issue is raised by Senator Keneally, she reverts back, she reverts back to attacking former Prime Minister Tony Abbott. She can't resist it. Senator Keneally can't resist the personal attack. She can't resist it. She reverts back to the personal attack on former Prime Minister Tony Abbott, who is not in a position, not in a position to defend himself in this place. He's not in a position to defend himself in this place. And then Senator Keneally makes a it was it was quite a demeaning, sneering comment about the Morrison family. 
celebrating Christmas lunch on Christmas Day. Totally gratuitous, totally unnecessary, does nothing to advance public debate in this nation, absolutely nothing. And it represents all about politics, all about that type of politics which Australians are absolutely fed up with. Sure, let's talk about, let's talk about the priority of getting Australians home. Absolutely. And I've spoken to Australians trying to get home. I've spoken to their families. I've done everything in my office to facilitate that. And I actually give my congratulations. I actually give my congratulations to our staff and personnel within DFAT with respect to everything they've done in response to this one in 100 year pandemic i think they have been extraordinary in very difficult cases in very extreme circumstances let us not forget that melbourne international airport our second largest international airport in this country has been closed for months and months and months because of the debacle in victoria but you never hear that mentioned you never hear that mentioned on the other side you never hear that mentioned on the other side. You don't hear mentioned about the impact that has had in terms of logistics, in terms of bringing Australian, Australian times home. I wish all my fellow Australians well as we lead up to Christmas and hope as many Thank of them you, get Senator home Scar. as possible. Thank you, Senator Your time has expired. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. And I think um, it's a bit unfair today that we're hearing the government trying to blame the opposition to try and raise, I think, is a very valid point, which is why is it that the government went out publicly and made the offer, made the promise that they would be bringing all these Aussies home? And then to try and, you know, quite frankly, slur and put words in Senator Keneally's mouth that somehow it was her fault for raising this as a matter of importance today. I mean, come on. If we want to start to talk about the facts, Senator Keneally has been right from day one in setting the record straight. Why was it that the Prime Minister promised? promised people, promised families and gave them hope that they would have their loved ones in Australia by Christmas around the kitchen table. Because that's not going to happen to 40,000 Australians, and we know that. You know, the, the attitude from the government senators today, um, quite disappointing, in fact very dismissive and just lacking the acknowledgement that there is a problem. You know, is this the type of attitude that this government needs to set in terms of the standards that we all have to you know, accept going into Christmas and in, into the year 2021. You know, and for some facts, some fun facts, if you know, Senator Antic earlier on was talking about facts, well, the fact is that DFAT, DFAT released the details of 2,700 Aussies. Now, but you don't hear that coming across from the government side, do you? you know, and I know that DFAT staff are doing a great job and trying their best to get everyone back home, but the reality is that there are stuff-ups on the other side, and they need to acknowledge that. But you can't sort of come into this place or in the other place, Madam Deputy President, and promise that we will bring back Aussies home by Christmas. And I'll give you another fact. You know, for us to bring all the Aussies back home by Christmas, so by Friday, so they have their 14-day quarantine, we need 82 A380s. 82 A380s. Now, unfortunately, Qantas only has 12 of them, but I'm sure the Prime Minister could pick up the phone, ring up the CEO of Qantas and say, look, let's get at least 12 of those out right now. Instead of sacking 2,000 workers, we can give more than 2,000 workers, not just their jobs back, but thousands of other people. Pick up the phone to Virgin, pick up the phone to other international carriers, and I'm sure we'll get a good rate, a good discount so this is the type of attitude that we have to expect from the government. You know, it's their attitude, whether it's been with JobKeeper or JobSeeker or other government policies leading up to Christmas. And quite frankly, it stinks. All we want is this government to do the right thing by Australians, and that's what Australians expect. Um, I had a personal circumstance, a, 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 a constituent that reached out to me, um, his daughter had been stuck in Scandinavia. And he only just finally returned back in Sydney um, only a few days ago. But the point that he was raised with me was she tried 12 times, 12 times to get back to Australia. And it's cost them tens of thousands of dollars. You know, and as Senator Keneally had pointed out, you know, people are having to raid their, their savings. In fact, I think even some others have to take out money out of their super, superannuation accounts. Now, this is not the type of attitude that we would be expecting from any government. 
You know, I mean, governments are there to help their citizens abroad in times of you know, great need. This is why we all pay our taxes, to make sure that we have services, whether it's here in Australia or abroad. But yet this government just does not seem to care, just does not seem to care, and rather attack Senator Keneally and others on this side for somehow wasting the Senate's time. Again, just another very dismissive attitude. Um, with the, the one minute that I've got left, I mean, I just, I guess, from my point of view, we just have to make sure that going forward, going forward, there are, I guess, mechanisms put in place in how we go about handling uh, the pandemic. You know, um, in Victoria, and I said to Scott earlier, had mentioned about the uh, hotel quarantine situation in Victoria, in my home state, Victoria. You know, we had two passengers come off a plane in Sydney, made their way to Victoria. I mean, it sounds like Ruby Princess all over again. Yeah, yeah but they're happy to blame the states. You know, blame the states because somehow it was the states that look after the borders. <laughs> I mean, if that's the case, I mean, what's the point of federation? What's the point of us being in this place? This is the federal parliament. In the constitution, it is crystal clear that the federal government has responsibility for our borders. And those guys opposites have lost all control. Thank you, Senator Ciccone. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Keneally to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Deputy President. And I rise to take note of the response uh, to my question to Senator Birmingham. And I asked about the really sad state of the Great Barrier Reef. And a recent paper uh, published in Nature, a very reputable, in fact, the top scientific journal, that showed that because of the mass coral bleachings, uh, of which we've had three in the last five years, that half the coral cover of the reef was bleached so badly that it died. And I asked the minister, what is the government doing about the fact that half of the reef is dead? We know, the scientists tell us, dead corals don't grow back. I'm afraid I didn't get a satisfactory answer. I got the same answer I've been getting for the eight years that I've been asking about this in this chamber. We're doing a little bit, we're doing this, we're doing that, but it doesn't change the fact that half the reef is dead from lack of serious climate action. I saw the reef for the first time 30 years ago as a 12-year-old girl, and it was so powerful to see the colour and the diversity, the, the sheer wonder of the place. And that stayed with me ever since. What is so sad is that my kids won't get the chance to see the reef in that state. And in fact, none of the kids in this country might get the chance to see the reef at all at this rate, certainly not in 30 years' time, um, because of the trajectory that we're on. Um, with the weak and pathetic climate targets that this government has set. We know that climate change is the biggest threat to the reef. Yes, there are other threats as well. Yes, there's water quality concerns. Yes, there's crown of thorns. Yes, there's shipping problems. There's all sorts of issues that we need to confront, and, and all of those will improve the resilience of the reef to climate. But the biggest one is climate. The reef's own management authority clearly say that in, in your government's own documents. A report released last week by the um, International Union for the Conservation of Nature, um, who do a three-yearly uh, outlook, if you like, of the, uh, the health of World Heritage properties, of which the Great Barrier Reef is one, gave the reef the worst possible listing. It was downgraded to a critical state. Now, that is the last warning that we are going to get before the next international meeting of UNESCO, the World Heritage Committee, make a decision on the future of the reef and decide whether or not to list it on the in danger list, the World Heritage Sites in Danger. Now, the scientists would say that actually the reef belongs on that list, but the tourism industry would be decimated if the Great Barrier Reef is listed, listed as in danger. And this government needs to do all it can to avert that potential listing, but it's not. I mean, five years ago, we saw them waste hundreds of thousands of dollars on flying diplomats around to try and bribe other countries to not shame Australia with an in danger listing. It worked for them that time, but our international borders are closed, so they can't do that sort of diplomatic lobbying, can they? I don't know what lobbying that they, will, uh, they will do between now and when the uh, World Heritage Committee meets, but what they do clearly need to do, and what all of the scientists and all of the relevant bodies are telling them, is they need to act on climate. They need strong 2030 
targets. We need an actual climate plan, not just to save the reef, but to save our future economy, to provide jobs for future generations, to save agriculture, to save the Murray-Darling. It underpins everything. And yet this government just is not engaging. They are hostage to the, the dinosaur denialists on their backbench. They're hostage to the donations that they get from the fossil fuel sector. Um, they're lured by the, the promise of well-paid lobbying jobs in that same fossil fuel sector once they leave politics. And meanwhile, half the reef's dead. It's not good enough that you've got a pathetically weak, underfunded 2050 reef plan which um, doesn't plan your way out of anything and certainly doesn't uh, address the climate crisis. It's underfunded to orders of magnitude. It barely mentions climate. In fact, the first draft didn't mention it at all. And it's been routinely criticised for not being strong enough. And the fact is it's not turning around the trajectory uh, for the health of the reef. We've got this one last chance. This is one of the seven natural wonders of the world. We don't have the right to write its death warrant. And when half of it has already gone, this government must listen to the science, adopt strong 2030 emissions reductions targets, and do what's necessary to give the reef any chance of survival. Please, please listen to the scientists. The question is the motion moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? There being none, we shall move on. Senators, on the 25th of August, I informed the Senate of the death on the 16th of June of John Joseph Madigan, a senator for the state of Victoria from 2011 to 2016. In a somewhat broken year, it's been some delay until we can address this, but I'd like to welcome it. His family, who are attending in the chamber today, who are now able to attend due to lifting of travel restrictions from our home state of Victoria. I call the Leader of the Government and the Senate. Thanks, Mr President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the death of former Senator John Madigan. Leave is granted. Thank you, Mr President. I move that the Senate records its deep regret at the death on 16 June 2020 of Mr John Joseph Madigan former Senator for Victoria, and places on record its appreciation for his service to the parliament and the nation and tenders its sympathy to his family in their bereavement. Earlier this year, I, along with other senators, was shocked and saddened to learn of the passing of former Senator John Manigan. Elected as the first senator for the Democratic Labor Party in 37 years, John was a humble and down-to-earth blacksmith and boilermaker from Ballarat who fought to improve the lives of the average Australian. Born on July 21, 1966, in Melbourne, John was one of four children to John and Patricia Madigan. Growing up in the Melbourne suburbs, John's interest in the blacksmith trade started at an early age. He would reminisce around age eight or nine, during his paper round in the suburb of Caulfield, he would stop and watch Bernie Dingle, a local coach builder, wheelwright, blacksmith, and horseshoer at work. Mesmerised by what he saw, John would return to watch night after night, the flying of the sparks intriguing the young John, who, recognising that coach building, wheel writing and blacksmithing were dying trades, turned his attention to welding and boiler making instead. His fascination with the trade led him to Newport TAFE, where he undertook an apprenticeship in structural steel fabrication. From the Victorian Railways to his own Blacksmith's Forge at Hepburn Springs in the central Victorian Highlands, John spent 28 years working as a blacksmith and boilermaker. Becoming a politician was not something that was on John's list of things to do, but during his childhood, politics was never too far away. He grew up in what he called a DLP family and, as a young boy, handed out how to vote cards for the DLP. In 2006, John became a member of the DLP, and a few years later, after being persuaded by DLP old believers and his wife, Teresa, he decided to run as a Senate candidate in the 2010 federal election. It is safe to say, Mr President, that John's election in 2010 to the Senate came as a surprise to many. 
He joked that at 11 p.m. on election night, when the ABC's Anthony Green announced we appear to have a DLP senator, that many would have been searching the internet for a reference to this new and obscure group, he said. The DLP was, of course, far from being new or obscure. In July 2011, he entered this chamber as the first DLP senator since 1974. John referred to himself as the most outside of outsiders, a tradesman and a member for the DLP, an oddity and a leper. They were his words. But he was a strong supporter of the manufacturing sector, true to his values and a voice for Australian workers and farmers in his community. Throughout his time in the Senate, John remained connected to his original trade as a blacksmith and boilermaker. He would load up one of his many beloved one-tonny utes with his portable forge, and he would give blacksmithing demonstrations at primary schools across Victoria. He was perhaps one of the most practical examples of constituent and electorate engagement that any member of this place has ever given in reaching out to schools and communities. It was a lot of work, but John gained enormous satisfaction from connecting particularly with young people. Many people, he said, would laugh at this and ask, what's the point? Blacksmithing is a dead craft. To which John responded, and I quote, but that's not the point. I do it because I hope it gives young people hope. It's about showing them they can do practical stuff with their hands. It's about engaging with our next generation of community leaders. I have particularly fond memories of spending a day with John in rural Victoria around his beloved Ballarat, visiting a local school uh, and seeing a program designed to engage young people in trades and the passionate conversations had with John about those issues. Travelling on to visit Ballarat Business Gecko Systems together uh, in which uh, we talked about the engineering processes the manufacturing opportunities that a company like that was delivering in supplying equipment to mineral processing businesses and the policies necessary to support further manufacturing activity. John indeed started the Australian Manufacturing and Farming Program to help narrow the divide between politicians and working Australians. His advocacy to me and the trip that he took me on was an example of his willingness to bridge those gaps wherever he could. The aim of the program was to give politicians the opportunity to visit factories and farms and to get a better understanding of our industries and the lives who, of those who work there. He launched the program in late 2011 with former Senator Nick Xenophon and the Hon. Bob Catter MP, the three amigos, as Bob would often refer to themselves as. In 2015, during an appearance on the ABC's Q&A program, John referred in his passionate argument for Australian manufacturing to submarines as being the spaceships of the sea. This reference gave John an almost cultish following for a period of time, for those who may recall the various uh, images and indeed I think even T-shirts that were spawned from that reference. In 2015, after troubles within the DLP, John decided to start his own political party, John Madigan's Manufacturing and Farming Party. However, it would last only briefly until the 2016 election, when, after six years in this place, John would retire from politics. During his time in the Senate, John was committed to advocating for those Australians who felt their voice had been lost. Known for his determination to do the right thing, John stood for what he believed in, no matter what it cost him personally. Asked what he wanted to achieve during his time in Parliament, John said, and I quote, all I worry about at the end of the day is being true to myself, true to my family and friends and putting my head on the pillow at night and when I leave Parliament, whenever that may be, that I will walk out with my friends, my family and my faith intact. John achieved that. Faith was incredibly important to John. He was a devout Catholic whose faith inspired others to be better and to do better. It was a tragedy that at age 53, 
John was taken from us and particularly from his loved ones far too soon after a battle with cancer. He leaves his wife, Teresa, and two children, Lucy and Jack, who, along with his mother-in-law, Carmel, are here with us today to pay tribute and to celebrate John's life and achievements. We thank you for doing so. We thank you for the patience in waiting to be able to be here in this troubled year. On behalf of the Australian government and the Australian Senate, I extend to you, John's loved ones, and all those who cared for him, our sincerest condolences and our gratitude for sharing with him and with, the, with us and with the nation. Thank you. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. I rise on behalf of the opposition to express our condolences following the passing of John Joseph Madigan, former senator uh, who passed away so young at 53. And I start by conveying on behalf of the opposition and my personal condolences and sympathies to his family and friends. And I welcome them, the members of his family uh, who are here today with us. I don't think John Mad Madigan would mind me saying. Sorry, I don't think John Madigan would mind me saying he reminded us of a different time, a blacksmith by trade who represented the Democratic Labor Party in this place, a party that had risen to prominence under the garden, gardens of activists Bob Santa Maria in the in 1950s, and had lost its last Senate seat in 1974. I hadn't even arrived in Australia, Mr. President. Yet Mr. Madigan served in the Senate in the second decade of the 21st century. He did so grounded in the values that had endured from his early life and that had been borne out in his career, and from these he never wavered. His family said in a statement following his death, he was a generous and compassionate man who gave his life to the greater good and had great faith in the people of Australia. He considered his time in Parliament a privilege, and he sought always to discharge his duty to all Victorians, regardless of their political persuasion. In addition to this generosity and compassion, John Madigan showed great respect to others, respect to colleagues, even when we disagreed, and respect to this institution, something I appreciated in him greatly, even on those occasions where we were not in agreement. John Madigan did not adopt the DLP. He was born into it. He grew up in a loyally DLP family in Melbourne, and he joined a youth group run by BA Santa Maria. Prior to his entry into the parliament, Mr Madigan completed an apprenticeship in structural steel fabrication and worked as a blacksmith and boilermaker from 1983 to 2011. And as my colleague Senator Birmingham has said, this was a choice of trade which came about after being fascinated by a local blacksmith in his youth. He undertook his apprenticeship and then worked for a decade in the Victorian Railways, where he was also a proud member of the Australian Manufacturing Workers' Union, or the metal workers, as we colloquially recall it. Following this, he relocated to the town of Hepburn Springs uh, in the central Victorian Highlands, and there he set up his own business in the same trade and lived there with his wife, Teresa, and their children, Lucy and Jack, who are here with us today. It's also where he passed away. Before his election, John Madigan held senior leadership roles inside the DLP, vice president of the state branch in Victoria from 2008 to 2009, and then its president from 2009. He also became, in the same year, vice president of the federal DLP. Of course, he served one term as a senator for Victoria, being elected in 2010 commencing office in July 2011 and then being defeated at the general election in 2016. Of the re-emergence of his party in federal politics, he joked that it had been a long time between drinks. I suppose as a teetotaler himself, he had the patience to bite his time. From the outset, John Madigan sought to give voice to workers, to families, to farmers and small businesses with whom he engaged. He felt many had been alienated by decisions of successive governments in the opening up of the Australian economy to the world. In this vein, John Madigan's commitment to manufacturing was a constant theme throughout his time in the Senate, and he consistently returned to it, grounded in his own personal experience. He argued that the great economies of the world have strong manufacturing bases, and he wanted to see government do to doing more, much more, to support and invest in Australian manufacturing. 
This is a principle we in the Australian Labor Party agree with, although at times we would differ from Senator, former Senator Madigan on how this might be achieved. He advocated for the re-establishment of worker and farmer cooperatives and for strengthening regional banks and credit unions as a first step in revitalising regional Australia, accompanied by a commitment to decentralising our industries and the public sector. And one area of local manufacturing about which he was particular, particularly passionate was shipbuilding. And I recall in 2015 him asking questions of the then Deputy Leader of Government in this place, Senator Brandis, about the failure of the Abbott government to commit to the development of our local shipbuilding industry through a local build of Australia's future submarines. In asking Senator Brandis whether he would also commit to purchasing an Australian-made T-shirt he was holding in support of Australian manufacturing jobs and charities, Mr Madigan made the following, quote, following comment. Minister, Two of the things I believe in are that a country is what a country makes and that submarines are the spaceships for the ocean. Not only were submarines are spaceships for the ocean perhaps his most memorable quote in his time as a senator. The slogan first came to light in an episode of Q&A earlier in the year and even made it onto T-shirts itself. But this statement went to the heart of his philosophy. Because that a country is what a country makes was foundational to Mr Madigan's political ideology. For the record, Mr. Senator Bra former Senator Brandis replied that he would proudly advocate for Australian industry, including by wearing such a fetching gar garment, but I don't think he followed through on that commitment. Mr Madigan was also a vociferous opponent of free trade. Now, this was something on which he and I were out of step, but I am prepared to acknowledge that on this, he had views which were not completely friendless within the Australian Labor Party. But whilst I didn't agree with his views on these issues, I was respected he wanted the same outcome that I also sought, a fair and prosperous life for working Australians. His commitment to fairness went beyond the material conditions of working people and included refugees who sought asylum in this country, as well as multicultural communities who were discriminated against. So whilst he was an economic nationalist, he did not sound a jingoistic or racist bell. Despite being a member of the crossbench for whom committee positions are harder to come by, Don Madigan served on many committees, including joint, the Joint Statutory Committee on Corporations and Financial Services, and chaired the uh, perhaps very famous Senate Select Committee on Wind Turbines. His sincerity and passion for those who found his committee to be an important outlet for their grievances was not doubted. Mr Madigan finished his service as an independent senator, having fallen out with others in the DLP in 2014 and, as Senator Birmingham said, formed his own party, launching the John Madigan Manufacturing and Farming Party, in which he sought to tap into the increasing discontent amongst voters, particularly in rural and regional areas, about the mainstream parties. He sought to give greater prominence to farmers and manufacturers as the backbone of the Australian economy. And this echoed the commitments he made in his first speech when he spoke of his desire to represent Australians who felt that they had lost their voice and that no politician from either side of the fence gave a damn, to use his words, Mr President, about their future or the future of their families and communities. However, this new political venture wasn't sufficient to return him in the 2016 election, and there his journey as an elected member of the Australian Parliament ended. And I understand, after briefly joining the Country Party, he was recently welcomed back, back into the DLP, which seems fitting for, for the prominent role it played in his upbringing and his political career. John Joseph Madigan was a man of strong convictions, and this meant we didn't always agree. For on, is on issues from trade policy to marriage equality, we would find ourselves on opposite sides of the argument. But, as I acknowledged in the debate on the recognition of foreign marriages for same-sex couples bill in 2013, Mr Madigan contributed his views in a respectful way. Following his father's passing, his son Jack Madigan sent me a moving note sharing his own and his father's reflections, and I want to thank Jack. At a time of his own grieving, it was a distinctly generous act and displayed a dignity and kindness that would have made his father proud. John Joseph Madigan was a genuine man. He was a decent man and he was an authentic man. And perhaps most of all, he was true to himself, which is the aspiration all of us in this place should have. So I again, on behalf of the opposition, express my 
sympathy and condolences following his passing uh, to his family and friends. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I rise to offer the Australian Greens' condolence to John's family and, um, in particular, uh, his wife Teresa and children Lucy and Jack. And um, uh, John, I think, in this place um, created. Um, a wonderful opportunity for many of us who worked with him uh, to confront some of our, our own ideas of issues and to talk about uh, ways in which we could find common connection. Um, I was going to reference the um, um, quote in relation to submarines being the spaceships of the ocean that um, Senator Birmingham and Senator Wong have. Um, but I, uh, you know, and while that one may have made it onto T-shirts, the phrase that I often heard John say uh, in the work that I did with him was he would say that Jesus was a refugee. And over and over again in the work that we did collectively on um, finding a, a fairer and more compassionate approach to refugees in this country, um, John was steadfast in his conviction for compassion. Uh, and his faith. And, um, he would often say, um, don't forget, Sarah, Jesus was a refugee. Um, his ability to um, listen, uh, to take stock of advice and then to very calmly put his position, whether it was in support or in opposition of the person he was speaking with or negotiating with, I think um, is testament to his strength of character. And there are many, many issues that uh, John Madigan and I um, disagreed on, uh, from uh, reproductive rights uh, to marriage equality to many others. Uh, but we found a common goal when it came to uh, immigration policy and human rights. Um, we often talked about the issues of Tibet. We often talked about uh, the issues of refugees and asylum seekers and would find uh, common ground by which we could work together on. Um, both Senator Wong and Senator Birmingham have referenced his absolute commitment to the manufacturing sector and the um, passion that he had for Australia to make things again. And I think um, he was ahead of his time in many ways in relation um, to, to those issues, while harking from, uh, harking from the past actually being very clear about saying there is a massive gap here. Uh, in Australia, and we had to get on it. And I think this um, year, in particular, has proven um, we haven't. Perhaps, if we'd taken a bit more advice uh, from John, um, we would have been making a few more things here um, in the midst of uh, this COVID pandemic. Um, this chamber and this workplace forces us to be oppositional with each other. Uh, it is the battle of ideas. It is, the, um, it, it, it is where uh, we have the contest uh, of policy and where we have passion, uh, uh, passionate debates about our convictions. Um, all of my engagements with John Madigan were respectful, uh, thoughtful uh, and honest. Um, John was no pretender. He was, a re he was a real person, uh, and you, what he said is what uh, he'd do, and what you saw is what you'd get. And he was very, um, in some respects, sometimes in this crazy world of politics, that is indeed incredibly refreshing. Um, I would often find myself sitting in John's office talking about a particular motion or an amendment that was coming up and um, struck by his incredible calmness of dealing with things, particularly at a period like this, often at the end of a sitting period when the list of bills are stocking up and you know, the government's threatening gags and you know, sitting hours, and you'd walk into John's office. It was always dark. It was always a bit the, the lights were down, and it was just this instant calmness. Nothing seemed to throw him into a tiz. As, um, uh, often in this place, particularly when the pressure is on, you, we all know it can happen. Um, so sometimes it was nice just to pop into his office and to have a bit of a breather. 
Um, I always appreciated the time he gave me and many others in this place uh, to, to explain to him the position that we were coming from and uh, the reasons why we were asking for his support. Um, he was, as I said, always respectful. In fact, uh, he, was an in, in, he was nothing but a gentleman in this place, and I think um, uh, everyone would, would accept that. He didn't tolerate bad behaviour. And if he didn't think you'd behaved well, um, you know, he'd say it, and he'd say it to your face pretty bluntly. And I always appreciated that. Um, his former staff member, Chloe Preston, still speaks very fondly of uh, John. Um, we've had a number of chats about uh, the time that she worked in his office. She now works for Senator Wish Wilson. So um, I think a bit of those conversations about trade and, uh, and fair and free trade have probably um, uh, flowed through. But Chloe, I know she's not here today, um, but was incredibly saddened by uh, John's passing. And um, I just want uh, his family to know that uh, she thought that he was a wonderful boss and she learnt a lot from him. Um, so I again uh, extend uh, the condolences of, of the Greens and, and myself personally to John's family. Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Mr President. Um, I stand on behalf of the National Party to offer our condolences and sincere sympathies to Teresa, Lucy and Jack. Uh, on the passing of their much-loved husband and father, former Senator John Madigan. Very few people who pass through this place manage to do so without attracting a few enemies, but not John Madigan. It's been acknowledged here today, and you've heard from all the raft and range of uh, political ideologies, uh, that John was a very fine representative for our home state of Victoria, a hard-working, decent man who always put service above self, and if only we could all aspire to uh, live that reality in our work as senators. John won the sixth and last Victorian Senate seat at the 2010 federal election, becoming the first DLP senator to serve in more than three decades. He was among three rookie Victorian senators who took office on 1 July in 2011, former Greens uh, senator Di Natale and myself. And I also remember the evening of John's maiden speech as Sen former Senator Edwards and I warmed the crowd up in the afternoon. But John spoke about uh, wanting his work um, forging pinch bars for Munro engineering post drivers. And he spoke of Australia's anti-dumping policy and Australian jobs, the economy and rebuilding our industry. And he did that in 2011. And how realistic and pertinent uh, are those themes to us in a post-COVID-19 uh, recovery uh, era that we're entering. These are all issues of significance. Um, I recall one occasion that John rightly said in this place, the strength of our manufacturing sector is directly related to the strength of our job market. Could have been Black Jack McEwen uh, uttering those words as uh, Senator Madigan. And it's obviously a view that we in the national share. If someone has a job, they have a sense of self-worth, they can provide for their family and contribute to their broader community. Senator Madigan made a lot of sense of the time, as do most who hail, I might say, from regional Victoria. In April 2016, late in the evening during adjournment, uh, John spoke passionately about the impact that the Murray-Darling Basin Plan was having on farming communities, particularly, again, in northern, north central Victoria. He said the Murray-Darling Basin Plan was one of the largest negative impactors on our farming communities in the history of our country. And he said our basin communities in Australia were on the precipice of a national water crisis. How very true. John was a person who was prepared to back up his words with action. And in 2015, he set up John Madigan's Manufacturing and Farming Party. As someone elected to represent the party of farmers and entrepreneurs, uh, leading rural and regional manufacturing. This is a significant milestone in John's political career. And on many, many issues, and, and others have mentioned them, decentralisation uh, amongst them, um, banking issues and the like, uh, Senator Madigan and the Nationals were on the same page, particularly about sharing a passion for agriculture and manufacturing. He always spoke the, about the importance of trades and the fact that Australian manufacturing was not on its knees 
He said we need to work towards enhancing the competitive advantage of Australian industry and not allowing other countries to benefit at our expense through us supplying them with cheap energy at the expense of our manufacturers and food processors. I recall that speech because he spoke of manufacturing businesses in places like Wodonga, Wilson's Transformers and Steely for, in Sealy for instance. And he talked about the Australian Manufacturing and Farming Program industry showcase at Wodonga TAFE and of a Manufacturing Meets Parliament event. I think we also shared our important important views around regional media, the role of the ABC in regional communities, um, and we needed the ABC to not just have a regional presence but a regional voice in, in their city boardrooms. John and the Nationals were on the same page when it came to sticking up for our great, efficient, clean, green food producers, and he was one of the great advocates and champions of buying local, buying Australian and supporting local manufacturing and local producers. Um, and again, spoke very, very strongly during the debate on food labelling in March 2015. In fact, during that very debate, my Nationals colleague and Deputy Leader Senator Canavan paid tribute to John's advocacy for better food labelling to benefit Australia's farm sector. So to my class of 2000 colleague, uh, former Senator John Manigan, you made a valuable contribution to our nation. The National Party in the Senate uh, was honoured to have worked with you, and I know there are former senators from our party, O'Sullivan and uh, Wacker Williams in particular, who really enjoyed uh, going into battle with John on a variety of issues that I'm sure my colleagues will touch on. We're very proud to acknowledge an honest, hard-working blacksmith from Hepburn Springs who stood up for manufacturing, farming and family in regional Australia. Condolences to family and friends. Bale John. Senator Selger. Uh, thank you. And I, I wanted to briefly associate myself with the very fine words uh, that have been put on the record today in the chamber uh, in relation to uh, John Madigan. And I wanted to uh, offer my condolences uh, to his family, uh, particularly, of course, to Theresa, to Lucy and Jack, to Carmel uh, and to other loved ones uh, who uh, miss John Madigan. Now, we've heard a lot about uh, John Madigan being a, perhaps, uh, as Senator Wong said, uh, perhaps a man uh, who represented another time uh, in some ways, uh, and I think she meant that in a very good way uh, in terms of uh, some of those values that he represented and some of the issues that he stood up for. And I won't go over uh, those things, except to say that, of course, the DLP have been a very significant part of Australian political history, and of course, John will uh, forever have a legacy as someone who, uh, at least for a period of time, uh, resurrected uh, the DLP, as has been mentioned many, many years after uh, they would have been thought uh, to perhaps never uh, grace this place. Uh, but I wanted to, uh, apart from uh, the, you know, reflecting on. Uh, John's background as a blacksmith and boilermaker, as has been done, I, I want to really deliver a, a bit more of a personal message to uh, his family in just the time I got to know him and the character uh, that I saw. And um, John was a man who loved his family, he loved his country uh, and his community, uh, his state. He was a man of deep personal faith and personal conviction. Uh, and he was prepared to stand up uh, for those personal convictions, even uh, when they were unpopular. Uh, and he was prepared to advocate uh, for them. He was hardworking, he was authentic, honest, uh, passionate, decent. Uh, a gentleman sums him up, uh, a good man. Uh, and I think that uh, to his family, uh, those are the legacy items uh, that, of which you can be most proud. Of all of the other things that he achieved in his extensive career, both pre-politics and, and in this place, uh, it is his fundamental sense of decency uh, that you can be, I believe, most proud of. Now, Senator Wong mentioned his great respect for the institution of the Senate, and I certainly saw that, and I think that was deeply held. He and I used to um, rage together often against the Greens. Uh, and 
he, uh, he would have a lot of arguments with the Greens, although notwithstanding that Senator Hanson Young has talked about some areas where they had uh, a fair degree of agreement on. But he would rage against the Greens. But in his respect for th this place, I remember him uh, sort of in hushed tones sometimes coming and raging in particular about the Greens. And it was a couple of uh, particular senators in the Greens who he was completely shocked that they would come into this place not wearing a tie. Uh, and I, I, I point again to Senator McKim, who's backing up the case. And I remember him saying, how, how, can they, how can they come into this place and not wear a tie? And so when I would occasionally walk into this place without a tie, I was always a bit sheepish. And I would hope that John uh, was not looking unfavourably at me as he was at my Greens colleagues. Uh, but that deep respect for the institution uh, was deeply held and it was reflected uh, in everything he did. Uh, the way he treated people uh, was a reflection of who he was. And whether you were on his side in an argument or whether you were on the opposite side, uh, he always acted with great respect to you as an individual. Um, it was put in the DLP official obituary, and uh, I'll just extract a small amount because I did see uh, this, and I think it sums up uh, a lot of what John stood for. Um, it said here, and it was the DLP uh, official obituary from uh, Stephen Campbell, he said, John stood for the unborn child, for the unemployed, for the refugee. The little guy in every sense was John's major concern. Uh, can I say to the Senate, can I say to his family that that uh, will forever be his legacy? Uh, and uh, I hope uh, that in, in coming years uh, the family will be able to reflect on that enduring legacy. Uh, I thank you uh, on our nation's behalf for his service to our, to our country uh, and to this chamber, uh, and uh, may he rest in peace. Senator Betts. On the 16th of June this year, Australia lost one of its quintessential sons, a family man, a hard worker, a man of faith, a man of values, of timeless values, might I add, and a man of courage. John Joseph Madigan, a Victorian senator for too short a period, was all those things and a lot more. With former Senator Madigan, what you saw is what you got. Sincerity, believability and a desire to be a genuine servant leader within his community. No manoeuvrings or duplicitous agendas for John. He either agreed or disagreed with a general proposition at stake. Willing to talk and accommodate on the mechanics, but not on the fundamental principles. Australian democracy should celebrate the fact that we had Senator Madigan grace the Senate. The blacksmith from Hepburn Springs came to the Senate and gave voice and expression to shared Australian values. Starting as an apprentice with Victorian Railways and a proud member of his union, he learned in the University of Life, bringing an earthy and realistic understanding of social justice and the requirements and expectations of our fellow Australians from government as, and as it develops public policy. Be it championing the sanctity of human life, manufacturing sustainability in Australia and concerns about China's human rights record Senator Madigan was across the issues. His approach to his newfound and unexpected role as a senator was best summed up by himself in his first speech. He said, we are the representatives of the Australian people, not their masters, end of quote. For Senator Madigan, that statement was not just words, but was meant with deep conviction as he conducted himself accordingly. Senator Madigan was the type of senator who had the potential of giving the Labor movement a good name. I observed that Senator Madigan's seat in the Senate was one that had been previously occupied by Senator Harradine. He was, by instinct, a Labor man. Senator Madigan did tell us, I have often said that the best government for Australia is a good Labor government and the worst is a bad Labor government. As can be imagined, I agreed with him 50 per cent of the time. <laughs> I first met Senator-elect Madigan in 2010 in an office in Melbourne 
attired as I am now, with Senator Madigan in work clothes, using someone's office where the senator-elect had quoted a blacksmithing job and was discussing details, and we used the coffee facilities to have a chat. His hands were calloused, like all those who work so hard to build and keep our country going. I last spoke with him to discuss what, if any, protocols applied for his funeral, knowing his life was coming to an end. But between his departure from the Senate and from this life, I had the pleasure to catch up with him for a coffee in Ballarat a couple of times with his family and a substantial number of telephone calls, always genuine, always concerned, always offering insights and suggestions. To his widow and children, some of us know the journey you've been through, the shock diagnosis, the battle to stay with loved ones, and yet the assurance of knowing a better place awaits. Whilst the Madigan family are listening, from the splendour of the presidential gallery in this place, they know that their husband and father, who was an excellent servant of the people of Victoria, is listening from a gallery of exceptionally greater glory than in here. To Mrs Madigan, Teresa, Lucy and Jack and Carmel, thanks for lending John Joseph Madigan, your father, your husband, your son-in-law, to the service of this nation. He did himself and yourself proud in his service. May he rest in peace and my condolences to you. Senator Canavan. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr President. Uh, I too would like to, to make some brief remarks in honouring the service of Senator John Madigan and uh, pay my condolences too to his family and friends. Uh, whenever uh, John was going to, to leave us, uh, from this earth was going to be too soon, uh, especially given his contribution to many, uh, his family and friends and others, uh, but uh, his young age has meant that it's been far, far too soon uh, for us. Uh, he, he, made, he was an enormously generous and compassionate man. I only served with him for around a year in this Senate. Uh, uh, but, uh, 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 I got to know him a little, a little during a few inquiries, and I was struck with uh, how much work he did in his own community, uh, with his church, and how much his strong faith informed him to be so generous and compassionate to others, no matter what their backgrounds. He did uh, a, a stellar amount of work with young people, particularly interested in getting them interested in trades and other ventures. He, he helped overseas, I believe, uh, with charity. Uh, and his contributions to this country and to his community uh, will probably uh, remain unrecognised in, in public view uh, because they were hidden uh, from the normal political processes. It is for those people that will feel the loss of John more than anyone else, but he's also been a great loss to the political fabric of this nation. He has gone too soon in political terms as well because, in some respects, uh, the time has shifted now to suit. Uh, John's principles and values. Uh, some have remarked here that he was a reminder of, of, of a previous time or a previous generation in Australia. I actually think he perhaps was a harbinger uh, of a new, uh, a renewed uh, found emphasis on the need for this country to return to cherish its wealth producing industries of agriculture, uh, of manufacturing, of mining. Uh, and John was, a, was sometimes a lone champion. Uh, of those sectors, uh, a lone voice uh, for many uh, that did not have a speaker in this parliament. That was obviously informed by John's uh, own background uh, as someone who worked with his hands uh, and knew what it was like to feel the pride of making something of worth and value to others uh, with your own hands. And he wanted an Australia that did not forget the importance of actually making things uh, so that we can provide a service to others in our own community and to the world uh, and, of course, also be in a position where we can uh, build the products to defend ourselves and protect our independence, like the spaceships of the ocean 
uh, the submarines. Again, another example where John was well ahead of his time. We are now building uh, submarines in Adelaide, and now everyone is talking about manufacturing. Uh, everybody is talking about manufacturing. Uh, John was sometimes a lone voice on, on that particular cause a few years ago. Uh, he, John also took up unpopular causes in other areas as well. Uh, he was a champion of the unborn, uh, and I want to recognise the efforts he did in this chamber to bring forward uh, legislation to protect those rights. Uh, again, some, something that he was uh, criticised for, but in his own humble uh, and softly spoken way, he, he would proceed on uh, with his own convictions and principles on those matters. And uh, he's a great loss uh, for us in this chamber on those causes as well. I got to know John best, though, when he did chair the, uh, uh, the Senate Committee on, on, on Wind Farms and particularly their impact on local communities. Uh, John was a, an extremely grassroots politician. Uh, uh, he, 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 despite being an engineer, probably knew more about the technicalities of renewable energy than anyone else. But what most interested John was not uh, the mechanics of a wind turbine, uh, but the uh, impacts on, on human beings and their families of such industrial uh, developments. And so during this committee, we actually went and we spent a number, of a number of days going to people's own homes. I actually don't think I've been to a Senate committee where we've done the same sort of outreach. We actually went to people's homes. We went to their bedrooms with their, obviously with their permission uh, and, and saw how close they had to sleep to uh, very large, uh, noisy uh, things uh, and heard their stories firsthand around their kitchen tables about how they were kept awake at night. Uh, some, some people had sold their own homes or moved uh, just to get away. And his tireless work bringing attention to that issue uh, has left the legacy of the National Wind Farm Commissioner, uh, uh, who I think is doing a good job to represent the interests of those who are impacted by very large developments. And they, more than anyone else, deserve to have their views heard, listened to and acted upon. Now, as I said, John is uh, a great loss for us because he was a a voice for those that often don't have a speaker. He was a speaker for those who don't often have a voice. And uh, uh, it'll be up to us now, those of us that share many of his philosophy and values, to amplify his message in the years to come, uh, which have become more relevant, I think, in recent years. So despite John's passing, I hope it is of some assurance that his legacy, uh, his example, uh, uh, his, uh, uh, his pioneering efforts in these fields uh, will continue to be built upon in this place thanks to his efforts. And, uh, my great condolences go to, to all his family members uh, uh, and I share with Senator Abetz uh, the strong view that uh, Senator Madigan is looking uh, down on upon us on, on these uh, proceedings uh, and I hope we can live up to his example uh, and commitment. Thank you, Mr President. Senator Fierabanti Wells. Thank you, Mr. President. I too rise to pay my condolences on the passing of John Joseph Madigan, who sadly left us at a very young age of 53. Uh, as a female conservative politician uh, in this place um, and having an office uh, close to John, I got the opportunity to get to know him uh, quite well and speak to him on quite a number of occasions about the things that were important um, to both of us. And as I reflected on his maiden speech of the 25th of August, uh, it was uh, 2011. It was about values of family and faith, um, and others have spoken about different parts and different things that he said during his maiden speech. But the thing that I really took uh, from that speech was: um, this is a man uh, whose background was about hard work, commitment, hard work and most importantly, a commitment to his family and to his faith. And those values and beliefs uh, underpinned what John uh, did uh, in this place. Uh, we've talked about manufacturing and, of course, in his maiden speech, he did talk about Blue Scope. And as a sen senator based in the Illawarra, a Blue Scope is very important in Australia and Australian steelmaking is very important. And, of course, we had occasion to discuss those things. Um, in an article uh, in the Canberra Times uh, following his passing, um, he's referred to uh, as um, a blacksmith, teetotaler, 
Democratic Labor Party senator. He's a throwback to another generation, a time when things were done differently. It wasn't that things were done differently. It was a set of values and beliefs um, that John shared and con shared with uh, with us. But but that sense, uh, those sense of family values and beliefs that I think are still very important to the silent majority in this country and which John so ably uh, represented. He was, um, as others have said, respectful, a good listener. His quiet manner uh, demonstrated his deep understanding of how our activities here affect uh, the daily lives of Australian um, families. But what I do want to say uh, in relation to John, uh, particularly when we do talk about values and beliefs, and we have had um, conversations uh, in recent times about politicians and, and conduct, uh, John always conducted himself with the utmost respect to everybody. He was, uh, as Sarah Hanson Young has said, he was a true gentleman. And as politicians, I think it's very important that we need to live up to the values and beliefs that we tell the electorate that we hold and that we promise to represent. And there should be no difference between who we are here in Canberra and the values and beliefs that we pronounce uh, to uh, our constituents and to the people that put us here. And I know uh, that John embodied very much the sentiment that he was a politician that said what he meant and meant what he said. He was a politician who abided by the courage of his convictions. And I know that in this place uh, that is often very, very difficult. But for John, it was who he was, uh, and that's what I admired uh, most about him. Uh, often, when you do, when you are honest and forthright, and you do stand up for your uh, and have the courage of your own convictions, uh, it is and can be a very, very difficult, a difficult time, and it is a difficult place to be. But if you do um, have the strength of courage, as John did, uh, to do that, then it does make it very easy, and therefore he maintained um, the faith and trust that the electorate had placed uh, in him, and I think that that uh, is one of the things that we will very much um, remember about him. So can I say um, uh, to you in conclusion, uh, to you, uh, Teresa, to your children, Lucy and Jack, uh, to Carmel and to the rest of your family, you should be very proud of his service both here and the service uh, to his community uh, out, both before and after uh, his time in this place. He was a decent, honest man, a man of enormous uh, integrity. And um, your father may not have been uh, to Jack and Lucy. He may not have been here a long time, but the values that he espoused of family and faith are the values and beliefs that live on in the silent majority in this country. Vale John Joseph Madigan. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Mr President. I too am very proud to rise to pay tribute to the late John Madigan. John was very proud of his blacksmith heritage. As we've heard in this condolence motion, he was humble and he was a gentleman. He led the Democratic Labor Party back from the wilderness winning the sixth Senate spot at the 2010 federal election. He was the first DLP senator to be elected since the defeat of Frank Vote Mac Back McManus and Jack Little in 1974. In his first speech, John Madigan himself quoted the expression, it's been a long time between drinks. He was very proud of his part in the re-emergence of the Democratic Labor Party, though of course, as we know, he quit the party in 2014 to start his own manufacturing and farming party. John spoke of his path to this place when only 12 months prior, he was forging pinch bars for Munro Engineering's post drivers. He paid tribute to the blacksmiths, foundrymen and wheelwrights of his childhood for revealing the skills and wonders of their craft to a wide-eyed young lad. 
I actually thought of John Madigan recently when I was at Sovereign Hill in Ballarat for the launch of their master plan, not far, of course, from where John died in Hepburn Springs, uh, with the support of some $10 million from the Morrison government, a grant to Sovereign Hill. Uh, Sovereign Hill is establishing a centre for rare arts and forgotten trades, the craft centre, which will be a major piece of the first stage of its 20-year master plan. And of course, this celebrates the trades which John held so dear. John was concerned about a lot of things in his community, uh, particularly about drugs. And he said and made this very clear over and over again that it was a scourge on our society causing devastation on families and individuals and causing untold harm to our economy and our industries. John was passionate about manufacturing and farming and along with Bob Catter MP and former Senator Nick Xenophon, he formed what he described as the non-partisan Australian manufacturing and farming program. And it was actually in this context that I had some dealings with John when I was the former member for Karangamite. He was really focused on helping senators and members to gain a better appreciation for the men and women whose hard work keeps this nation running. Former Prime Minister Tony Abbott described John as a very decent man with an old-fashioned sense of courtesy and respect. He served just one six-year term in the Senate, being defeated, of course, at the 2016 general election, but he made a very big impact and he made a very significant contribution and clearly, from what we have seen in this debate today, is remembered very fondly around the corridors of this parliament. I also want to convey my sincere condolences to John's wife, Teresa, and his children, Lucy and Jack, who paid tribute to their husband and father, saying, he was a generous and compassionate man who gave his life to the greater good and had great faith in the people of Australia. John died way too young at the age of just 53. My dad died at 58, so I know for Lucy and Jack, this will leave a very big hole in your hearts and in your lives to have, lo to have lost your dad at such a young age. But all, is Australia, all of Australia has certainly lost a great gentleman in John Madigan. May he rest in peace. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you, Mr President. I would just briefly like to add my remarks uh, in this condolence motion. Uh, as we've heard this afternoon, John Madigan was a man who was decent, authentic, humble, respect respectable always a gentleman who expected the highest standard of others because he applied the highest standards in this place. He was a man who brought to this place great conviction. And while he was only here for six years, his, present has, his presence has been deeply felt. John Madigan came to this place with another important role, and that was as a staunch defender of our Australian Constitution. I met, engaged with John, in working to defeat the Labor government's proposal to recognise local, local government recognition in the Constitution. Uh, John was part of a very, very small group of senators that argued against Labor's referendum bill, that voted against Labor's referendum bill that put his name to the official no case against that referendum bill. And as some, as you, some of you might recall, the referendum was never put. The referendum had been defeated in the court of public opinion before Kevin Rudd put himself before the, election, before the people in that vote. So John Madigan has come to this place, has made a tremendous contribution that I think is recognised in the remarks of so many people from across the chamber. Uh, for my part, uh, he helped preserve the Constitution, 
kept true to the idea of the federal compact between the states in making this Commonwealth. And for that, I know many, many Australians will be very, very deeply grateful. I also just add my condolences to his family uh, on your sad loss. I ask honourable senators to join in a moment of silence to signify assent to the motion. The motion is carried, and I again acknowledge John Madigan's family who have travelled up from Ballarat um, to be here today and their patience in having this matter addressed by the Senate. I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? I'll call the clerk. If there's nothing else, the clerk. Postponement notifications have been lodged as follows. General business notice of motion number 916, standing in the name of Senator Seawitt, from 9 December to 3 February 2021. I remind senators that question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business, and I'll deal with them in the following order. Could I commence with matter 920 in the name of Senator Urquhart? Thank you, Mr. President. I ask the general business notice for motion number 920, proposing an extension of time for the Legal and Constitutional Affairs References Committee be t uh, to report be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion standing in the names of Senators Carr and Stoker. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. If the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Could we come to Senator Hanson is not here for 921. I'll come back to that. Um, Senator Roberts, no, is not here. Senator Hanson Young, 923. Is, no, sorry. Is, okay. Um, S Senator, uh, well, we, we won't be dealing with this in the most convenient order then, because we'll have to move to divisions. Can I move to Senator Thorpe, Business of the Senate, number two? I ask that the business of thank you, President. I ask that the business of the Senate notion, notice of motion number two be taken as a formal no, motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Thorpe. I move the motion. Senator Dunham. To make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. The government does not support this motion. The Minister for Home Affairs has already written to the chair of the Parliamentary Joint Standing Committee on Intelligence and, and Security. Uh, referring the legislation to the PJCIS as the appropriate committee in this instance. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Thorpe be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Stop the bells. I should say, Senators, I've now asked attendants, because we're not closing the door, to stand in the doorway upon the bells being stopped. So keep that in mind. There'll be no sneaking in late. The question is the business of the Senate motion number two be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Seawitt teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 12, noes 38. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senators, I ask you to remain in the chamber because we have imminent divisions. Could I now move to matter number 906 in the name of Senator Patrick? You can do it from there if you've got it, Senator Patrick, or you can. You seek leave to withdraw the motion? The one relating to the OPD? Uh, the attendance by Minister. Yes, all right. Senator Patrick has sought leave to withdraw the motion. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Could I move to 924, also in the name of Senator Thorpe? Uh, I ask that general business mo notice of motion number 924 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Thorpe. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. To make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. At its most recent meeting on the 27th of July this year, the Council of Attorneys General CAG discussed the progress of the Age of Criminal Responsibility Working Group to date and noted that the group identified the need for further work to occur regarding adequate processes and services for children who exhibit off offending behaviour. It would not be appropriate to release working documents, including those prepared by other jurisdictions while the process remains ongoing. Ultimately, any decision to release documents once the working group is completed will be a matter rather, for attorneys-general of all jurisdictions. The question is the motion moved by Senator Thorpe be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells, reading the bells for four minutes.
Set it at four. Stop the bells. The question is the motion moved by Senator Thorpe, number 924, be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart, tell of the ayes, Senator Smith, tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 30, noes 32. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senators, remain in the chamber. I will only be ringing the bells for one minute for the imminent divisions. Could I move to 925 in the name of Senator Billick?
Senator Billick, you can do it from there, Senator Billick. Mr. President, I ask the General Business Act notice of motion number 925 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Billick. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. To make a short Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. President. The Retirement Income Review considered the distributional impacts of the retirement income system across the population, including women. Indeed, Section 3B of the report focuses entirely on gender issues. The report covers issues of adequacy, equity, cohesion, and sustainability, and women were considered at each stage. And of course, Senator Billick would uh, be well advised to read the report. The best way to reduce gender pay gaps in retirement is by reducing them in working life. Under this government, prior to COVID-19, there were more women in work than ever before, and the gender pay gap had closed to its lowest level on record at 13.9 per cent. The question is, the motion moved by Senator Billick be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. Um, I had order Senators McKenzie and Billick. The whips are a bit distant from the clerks. They need silence in the chamber to be able to. Um, well, sorry, did I miss Senator Hume? Uh, the Senate should give me the power to have issued detention for the last day of sittings. Can I ask for some quiet in the chamber so that whips can, 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 can do their job far quickly and it will save everyone time? So the question is that notice of motion number 925 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart, tell for the ayes. Senator Smith, tell for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 31, noes 31. The matter is therefore negative. Senator Lambie, could we come to your matter, number 927, and I remind senators to remain in the chamber. Senator Lambie, I'll give you a moment to get to your seat.
Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 927 be taken as a formal motion. Any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Lambie. Thank you, Mr. President. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. The Morrison government firmly believes that tackling this devastating issue requires an ongoing focus, ensuring we remain vigilant about the welfare of our defence and veterans communities. This is why the government is committed to pass this bill before the end of the year and believes the Senate should consider this bill properly with due process. Senator Hanson. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. One Nation supports formalising the National Commissioner for Defence and Veterans Suicide Prevention Bill 2020 that provides almost exact powers as a Royal Commission. I support the appointment of Dr Bernadette Boss, CSC, as the Interim National Commissioner and note her statutory independence from government. Veteran suicide levels in a first world country like Australia is nothing short of a national disgrace and to deliberately stymie the passing of this bill is a shameful, blood-stained act of all who stand in its way. One Nation will not entertain this political stunt designed to vote down this important bill. I employ every single senator to give the National Commissioner a go for at least the next two years. question is the motion moved by Senator Lambie be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. There were, can people rely on me to count the voices? I've got the best position. There were two voices. Ring the bells for one minute. I apologise, Senator McKenzie. I misnamed you. The question is the motion moved by Senator Lambie be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart tell off the ayes, Senator Dean Smith tell off the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 29, noes 33. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senators Polly and others have number 928. Senator Polly. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 928 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Polly. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. no. The noes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes at the request of the whips. Stop the bells. The question is that motion number 928 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart tell the ayes, Senator Smith tell for the noes.
The result of the division is eyes 30, noes 31. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senators, we have a few more divisions, so please remain in the chamber. Could I come to number 930 in the name of Senator Walsh? Senator Urquhart is doing that. President, I ask that general business notice of motion number 930 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. The Morrison government is providing a record $18 billion for universities this year, rising to around $20 billion by 2024. Universities are autonomous institutions responsible for their own decisions. The department has not received any request to approve the closure of language courses. Our government proudly supports a multicultural Australia and encourages Australians to learn another language. Our job-ready graduates reforms will see students who study a language pay 42 per cent less and, together with the additional $298.5 million in the budget for more domestic university places, will mean around 30,000 more Australians will get the opportunity to go to a university next year. Senator Hanson. Seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. Labor continue to bolster China's calculated takeover of Australia's prime agricultural land, critical assets, water entitlements, as well as manipulate governments here in Australia and worldwide. Universities respond to demand. Therefore, the cuts to Asian languages are an indication of undesirable courses, not a lack of federal government funding. I note Labor's pledge of $32 million to strengthen Asian languages if it won the 2019 federal election under Bill Shorten. Labor lost that election and therefore you lost your right to govern as papsies for the communist Chinese regime. Labor should read the Australian public sentiment towards China's Order. current aggressive economic action and lack of dialogue with the Australian government. One Nation will not support Labor's motion to fund more Order. Asian languages. Order. Senator Furuki. Mr President, I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Um, universities are cutting courses and they're slashing jobs. The combined blows of COVID-19 and the funding cuts are devastating. We should be prioritizing and expanding in, um, education in languages and cultures, especially those in the Asia-Pacific, and rejecting these harsh and nonsensical cuts to language programs. In its submission to job-ready graduates, the Languages and Cultures Network of Australian Universities said successful language study involves the acquisition of both linguistic skills and cultural knowledge, and the new system poses a risk of enforcing a language-culture divide. Some of the blame of these cuts must be attributed to short-sighted university management, certainly, but we should not let the government off the hook. Humanities programs were squarely the target of the so-called job-ready graduates' measures, these cuts are a result of this government's juvenile hatred for humanities, and this country will suffer as a result. question is the motion moved by Senator Urquhart on behalf of Senator Walsh be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. The question is that motion number 930 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Urquhart tell of the ayes, Senator Smith tell of the noes.
result of the division is ayes 30, noes 30. The matter is therefore negatived. Senator Griff, could we come to your matter number 932? You can do it from there if you wish. Senator Griff. Uh, yes, look, I inform the chamber that Senators McKim, Keneally, McCarthy will also sponsor the motion, and I ask that the general business notice of motion number 932 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Griff. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. Australia has one of the most generous humanitarian programs in the world. However, Order. the continued success of this program is only made possible by maintaining orderly an orderly and fair system. Uh, the Murugappan family's claims to engage Australia's protection obligations have been comprehensively assessed on a number of occasions by Home Affairs and various merits review bodies. These decisions have been appealed through the federal court and to the High Court. At no time has any member of the family been found to be owed protection. The government will never return to the failed policies of the opposition, which compromised our humanitarian program Order. and resulted in more than 1,200 deaths at sea. Order. Order. Senator Hanson. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Since the entry of more than 50,000 illegal maritime arrivals during the chaotic years of the Rudd Gillard government, listen Order. to us. Rudd's government, 6,600 illegal economic migrants have been returned to their home countries. The individuals in question in this notice of motion have been offered the same opportunity, but instead have chosen to challenge the Australian people and our governments at a cost of roughly $10 million. The federal government have found on a number of occasions that the individuals are not refugees, and I support the Minister for Home Affairs in his efforts to have these illegal Order. maritime arrivals sent back to the safety of their Sri Lankan homeland. One Nation do not support humanitarian queue jumpers, but do support those genuine refugees who come to Australia to adopt our way of life, who work and don't try and change us as a nation. We will not support this motion. This is my Order, point. Senator, you've concluded the order. Senator McKim. Sorry, I'll withdraw that. Oh. To make a one-minute statement. <laughs> Leave is not granted. <laughs> so the question is that motion number 932 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. The question is that motion number 932 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart tell off the ayes. Senator Dean Smith tell off the noes.
decision is ayes 30, noes 30. The matter is therefore negative. I'll now come to the matters we missed earlier. And I'll come to Senator Hanson, number 921. Um, I ask that general business notice motion number 921 be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Hanson. I move that the, following, that the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act to amend the Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Act of 2006 and for related purposes. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Hanson. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read the first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. The bill for an act to amend the Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Act 2006 and for related purposes. Senator Hanson. Move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to table an, an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Hanson. I table an explanatory memorandum and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard and to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Senator Roberts, number 922. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 922 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Roberts. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Hanson Young, number 923. Mr. President, I ask that general business notice of motion number 923 relating to uh, Australian content quotas on streaming services be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Hanson Young. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. Make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. As an initial measure, the largest streaming video services will be asked to commence reporting to the Australian Communications and Media Authority on Australian content acquisition from the 2021 calendar year. The government has also released its media reform green paper for consultation. The green paper seeks, to, uh, seeks comment on a proposal to put a minimum Australian content spend requirement uh, on streaming video on-demand services. The question is the motion moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Patrick, number 929. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I ask that general business notice of motion number 929 be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Patrick. Um, uh, I move that the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act to amend the Customs Act 1901 and for related purposes. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Patrick. I present the bill and move that this bill be, may proceed without formalities and be now read a a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. The bill for an act to amend the Customs Act 1901 and for related purposes. Senator Patrick. I move that the bill now be read a second time and, and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. It's leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator Patrick. I table an explanatory memorandum. I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in the Hansard and to continue my remarks. It's leave granted. Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Patrick. That concludes the discovery of formal business, but I think the Leader of the Government has a matter. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir, Mr President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the consideration of legislation. It's leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. I move the motion as circulated and I move that the question be put. The question is that the question be put. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The question now is that the motion as moved by Senator Birmingham be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. That concludes the discovery of formal business. All yours, thank you.
I'll just give senators a moment to leave the chamber before we move to the matter of urgency. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 23 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the letter from Senator Waters proposing a matter of urgency was chosen. It is shown at item 12 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. I call Senator Steelejohn. Thank you, Acting Chair. Uh, war is never the answer. Um, Let me... uh, Senator Steelejohn, you do need to move the motion oh. as well. I apologise. I, uh, I move that the following is a matter of public urgency. Thank uh, you, Senator Stewart. And John. that uh, the matter of public urgency being, uh, do I need to read the? Yes, that. that uh, Senator Stewart, John, you don't need to read it all out. I don't need to read it. You just need to move it. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, okay. So, as I was saying, uh, war is never the answer. Uh, given the multitudes of conflicts in which we have engaged as a nation, uh, those that have been lost, those that have been marked uh, by their involvement in conflict, uh, the communities that have been destroyed uh, by pointless acts of violence, uh, it would be uh, understandable for many in our community to believe that the simple statement that war is not the answer that it is never the answer uh, would be a reasonably uncontroversial thing to say. But in this place, in this place, it is still a statement that is considered radical. Even in the aftermath of the illegal invasion of Iraq and the terribly misguided humanitarian intervention into Afghanistan, uh, conflicts into which Australia entered itself at the behest of the United States and which collectively constituted uh, wars uh, that took up most of the first 20 years of this new century, even after the lies of the Bush administration, the complicity of the Howard government, even after the terrible crimes uh, that are now uh, on the record as having been committed in Afghanistan by our special forces, the statement uh, that war must never be the answer is still one to which the major parties refute. And I'm sure in the course of this debate uh, there will be many spurious propositions uh, made by those representing the major parties. During the course of this debate, which I have brought on in this place, uh, directly as a result of the refusal of the major parties yesterday to take the simple common decency step of acknowledging the victims of Australian war crimes in Afghanistan and committing ourselves, having apologised for a compensation scheme. In the aftermath of that disgraceful decision today, uh, it is obviously so needed for this place to fully understand how we came to be here today and what needs to be done to ensure that these crimes are never committed again and to ensure that we never again deploy our forces overseas into a conflict zone. We ask people to put their lives on the line while nobody in this parliament is willing to take political responsibility for that decision. Not one MP is willing to create a process in which we vote to make that happen. First of all, it is so important, as I said, to understand how we came to be here today at this moment when uh, these horrific war crimes have been revealed to our community. Uh, it began 
uh, in my opinion, uh, with the illegal invasions of Iraq and the misguided invasion of Afghanistan, two conflicts which we entered into at the behest of the United States on a false premise, on an illegal premise, on a lie of WMDs, and in the case of, the Afghan in the case of Afghanistan, following along behind the Americans once again into a war of regime change. Once there, there was no clear strategic direction established, and yet administration after administration, Labour and Liberal, approved the continuation of our presence in this country, in that country. Administration after administration ignored the warnings from many returning veterans that the length of deployment that what was being asked of serving personnel was too much, and that the job they had been given to do was not something that they were trained to do nor capable of doing. And yet, government, Labour and Liberal alike were happy to sign up once again and again and again to maintain our presence there, to keep the Americans happy. And that is why, as we talk about uh, the war crimes that have been committed uh, in Afghanistan, we must talk first of political accountability. We must hold the Howard administration, the Rudd administration, the Gillard administration, the Turnbull administration and the Abbott administration responsible for continuing this deployment, this engagement, long after it was clear that there was no strategic objective, that there no, was no victory that was possible and that our presence in Afghanistan was doing great harm to the people of Afghanistan and to those being asked to serve in that conflict. We must, from this moment, take it upon ourselves to answer the community's call to take the responsibility of the declaring war and entering into armed conflict into the hands of the parliament. It is clear that the executive cannot be trusted to make these decisions because they have so often led our armed forces into harm's way for no good reason. This process would enable, as I have outlined to the Senate in the bill that I have introduced, enable a process in which the Governor-General and the Prime Minister would make a case to the Parliament as to the, as to the legality, the duration and the number of personnel needed as part of a debate as to whether we should deploy into territory overseas and would require the Defence Minister to come before the Parliament every two months and update the Parliament as to the nature of the deployment. It would facilitate the community's ability to examine the case for conflict, for war, should there ever be one, and ensure that we are never again lied to never again lied to in relation to the reasons why we are entering into a conflict zone. Secondly, it is vital to understand that when we talk of these crimes that have been committed, that the chain of command must be held to account. The contention within the Brereton report that there exists a magical line above which no one in the armed forces chain of command knew about what was happening on the ground in Afghanistan is nonsense. It is offensive. It is absolutely untenable. Officers knew. The chain of command knew, and for the ADF's chain of command to come before the Australian public and contend that there existed a magical line above which nobody knew what was going on is ridiculous, above which the disciplinary measures will be determined between Chief of Army and Chief of the Defence Force 
is absolutely unacceptable. We cannot have a situation in which ops personnel on the ground are held to a different standard than those up the chain. And while we are on the subject of the unacceptable, it is absolutely not okay that those such as David McBride, who attempted again and again to flag his concerns through the proper channels only to be rebuked, is now facing 50 years of imprisonment at the hands of this government for attempting to tell the public that which we now know to be true. There must be accountability for the chain of command, and the implementation of the reforms suggested for the ADF must be overseen by those without a conflict of interest. And let me say it very clearly. General Campbell and General Burr have a real conflict of interest. They served in senior command positions during our time in Afghanistan. They are both former members of the SAS. The public, we owe it to the public and to the victims to ensure that these recommendations, this cultural brokenness that has been created within our special air services is dealt with by those without an interest in the matter. And that cannot be said of Generals Burr and Campbell, and that is why I repeat here tonight that for the good of this investigation, for the maintenance of public faith, they must resign. And if they do not resign, the Prime Minister must sack them. And lastly, in this debate, I want to bring it back to the reality that 39 families have lost loved ones, that there are 39 families in Afghanistan right now that have lost loved ones to these crimes that two other families that we know of now have members that are irreparably maimed by these crimes. No one, not the Prime Minister, not the Chief of the ADF, questions the content of the Brereton report as to the crimes uncovered. And so it should be possible for this place to join with the spirit of humility and of genuine sorrow and of a desire to make good for wrong done that exists in this community of ours, for this parliament to say sorry, to say sorry to those that have been lost to these crimes and to make that apology material by offering compensation to the families. Let us look clearly in the eye of what has happened here. Let us seize this opportunity to reckon with the reality that war is hell. And when we enter into it without a clear reason for it, when we enable it to become distanced from political scrutiny, when we enable culture to develop among those who we ask to fight that dehumanises, then these crimes, these actions are inevitable. And let us pledge here to take those steps necessary to ensure that these things never happen again, that there is accountability of the chain of command, that there is justice for the families, and that we here in this place take the steps to secure peace, peace for our community here in Australia, for our region, and for every human being on this blue planet. I thank the Chamber for its time. Thank you, Senator Steeljohn. Senator Betts. We look out the front doors of Parliament House 
you cannot help but see the vision of the avenue and then ultimately the Australian War Memorial. And it is the men and women that have served this nation willing to give their lives that in fact allow us to celebrate and enjoy the democracy we have in Australia today. So those of us that participate in this debate need to acknowledge up front the service of the men and women who have been willing to lay down their lives for us so that we can enjoy the freedoms that we have today. That surely, Madam Acting Deputy President, has to be the starting point in any debate, any concern in relation to our defence forces. Men and women of previous generations have protected us from invasion by dictatorships. They continue to do so. They continue to protect us. And when we have engaged in theatres of war around the world, it has been to protect not only us but also our friends and fellow human beings from the ugly hand of dictatorship. And so we have stood by friends in the support of freedom. Now, into that history in recent times has been brought this credible information that certain untoward activities may have occurred. Yet the mover of the motion continually asserted, falsely might I add, that crimes had been committed. That remains to be determined. If you want to rely on this report, you have to do so with integrity. You cannot pick and choose and say, on the one hand, all the generals up the chain of command have to take responsibility, and therefore I reject that part of the report. But the honourable senator in moving the motion has also rejected that part of the report, which says that it is credible information, but nothing has been proven. And one of the great civilising features of our society is that we actually believe in the rule of law, that we actually believe in the presumption of innocence, that we do rely on proof, that we do require evidence before we are willing to condemn people. And can I remind the honourable senator that because we are a civilised society, we do not believe in the lynch mob. We do not believe in the feral activities of people saying, I don't like this person and let's start condemning the person. Because we know how that ends up. Australia has just recently gone through a very shameful chapter in relation to Cardinal George Pell, oh. where the High Court of Australia, 7-0, came to the conclusion that an innocent man may well have been convicted. 7-0, the High Court. Yet hundreds of thousands of people uh, around this— Order, Senator Abet. Senator Steele-John. Uh, nowhere in this motion is there a mention of Cardinal George Pell, and I would ask you to bring Senator Abetz to order on the issue of relevance. I am listening to Senator Abetz's contribution very carefully, Senator Steele-John, and um, I will draw his attention to the content of the motion. Thank you, Senator Abetz. I would have thought even the honourable senator would have understood the consequences of a lynch mob seeking to condemn a person without going through the proper judicial system of order, proving Senator things. Senator Abetz. And Senator Wish Wilson. Point of order, Acting Deputy President. Um, Senator Steeljom is not honourable because he hasn't been a minister. So I think Senator Abetz should just refer to him as Senator Steeljom. Uh, <laughs> I, I will um, take some of the interjections around the chamber. I, I thought that we were um, in the manner of referring to ourselves as honourable if we so wished. I will ask Senator Abetz to continue with his contribution. Thank you. Here we are, Madam Acting Deputy President, being told by the Australian Greens that this is an urgent matter. 
of matters of great urgency, of great principle, and yet we have the laughter and the stupidity of those sort of points of order indicating that the Australian Greens do not take this matter as seriously as they have asserted to do by moving a matter of urgency. But I go back to the point, Madam Acting Deputy President, that one of the great civilising features of our society is that we don't believe in the lynch mob, that we do believe in the rule of law, that we do believe that a person should only be convicted on the basis of evidence and not on the basis of mere assertions. And let's be very clear. The report on which—I'll delete the word honourable—the senator and I must say I feel more comfortable in just referring to him as a senator, says that there is credible information. As a result of credible information, you then go through the process of investigating to ascertain whether or not the credible information can be proven. And the report itself says that many of those things that they have found have not been put on a standard of proof, not even on the basis of the balance of probabilities, let alone beyond reasonable doubt. All they're asserting is that there is credible information. And so um, let's also be clear in this motion. We are being told that the military chain of command needs to be brought to account for their role. Well, what's the fi uh, what did the uh, inquiry find? And I quote: no, "Found no evidence that there was knowledge of or reckless indifference to the commission of war crimes on the part of commanders at troop, platoon, squadron, company, or task group headquarters level, let alone at higher levels such as commander, joint task force C, uh, CJTF 633, Joint Operations Command." or Australian Defence Headquarters, nor is the inquiry of the view that there was a failure at any of those levels to take reasonable and practical steps that would have prevented or detected the commission of war crimes. But yet here we have the Australian Greens, despite this finding, coming in demanding the resignation of certain people higher up in the Defence Forces. On what basis? on the basis of they know better than the inquiry, they know better than everybody else. According to the Australian Greens, these men should be required to resign from their positions. Why? Because the Greens say so, not because of an inquiry finding anything. In fact, the inquiry found the exact opposite of that which the senator is referring and asserting to us and the nation Order, that these matters— Order, Senator Abetz. Senator uh, Stilljohn. Be as I am always to be verbaled by Senator Abetz, I made it clear in my contribution that I call for their resignation on the basis of real or perceived conflict of interest. I am unhappy about being verbaled like this by um, the senator. Senator Stilljohn, if you want to— if, that's a debating point, Senator Stilljohn. Um, yep, you can do. You can seek to correct the point at the end of the debate if you wish to. But otherwise, I will ask Senator Betts to continue with his contribution. Thank you. Thank you, Madam You always know that you're making a solid contribution when the Greens raise frivolous points of order. This is now the third one. We'll see if they get another one in within the 10 minutes. But, uh, Madam Deputy President, we were told that crimes had been committed. We were told that the Gillard government is responsible as well. And of course, I am well reminded of the fact that the only reason we had the Gillard government was because the Australian Greens signed up with them. So if the Gillard government is responsible, let's deal with Senator Bob Brown accordingly as well, and let's see them scuttle away like cockroaches when you turn the light on. They will not want to be considered. And here order, we go, Senator spurious Abetz. point of order, order number four. Senator Abetz, Senator Wish Wilson. Not, not spurious at all, Acting Deputy President. I'd ask Senator, with, Senator to withdraw that. Uh, 
that imputation. That was used by the Nazis repeatedly as propaganda. As propaganda, the use of cockroaches and shining of lights has been used by the Nazis. And the same totalitarian regimes that you referred to in your speech, Senator Abetz, and you know that, and you should withdraw that imputation. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Betts, if you could clarify your comments, that would be appreciated and uh, continue. Uh, I'm terribly sorry, Madam Deputy President, but there is no need to clarify a well-known expression about cockroaches scuttling away when you turn the lights on. It is a common term of phrase uh, within the Australian parlance, and uh, I, I have never known it to have been associated as Senator Wish Wilson, in his frivolous point of order, seeks to assert. But let, let's be very clear. Did they deny in that point of order that the only reason the Gillard government was able to be in existence was because of Senator Bob Brown and the Australian Greens joining them to allow them to then commit those crimes of which Senator Steele John regaled the Senate? Because if we go right up the chain of command and demand that all the parliamentarians responsible be held responsible, it would mean that Senator Bob Brown would be responsible as well and would need to be dealt with. And of course, that is where, when you take the Greens' logic to its proper extent, you find that their arguments fall apart. They are internally inconsistent. All that said, what the government has sought to do and done ve do very responsibly is to ensure that these credible, uh, this credible information is dealt with in a proper manner through the rule of law, through the proper system, that it be investigated, ascertained, and then we can determine whether or not men and women ought to be charged and, if so, with what charge and the consequences that flow. This is not for this chamber to determine. We have the rule of law in this country for a very good reason. We do seek to ensure that it's not parliamentarians that determine who gets charged or who gets convicted. That is for a separate arm of our government, for the judicial system to determine. And what I simply say to Senator Steele, John, and others in this place is be very, very careful what you wish for, because one day, as you seek to use the parliament to condemn people, others in this parliament may then use it as well. A dangerous precedent which should be rejected. Thank you, Senator Abetz. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. The release of the report by the Inspector General of the Australian Defence Force, Major General Burriton, into allegations of war crimes committed by Australian Special Forces in Afghanistan is a difficult moment for the nation. <coughs> Findings in the report that credible information exists in relation to some members of Australia's Special Forces having engaged in unlawful killings and cruel treatment while deployed in Afghanistan are appalling. This report states that credible evidence exists that members of our most elite armed forces behaved unlawfully, unconscionably and committed war crimes as defined by the Australian criminal justice system. These allegations in respect of a few do not detract from the sacrifice of the many who have served our country, and in particular the thousands of current and former soldiers who served in Afghanistan. Major General Brereton has demonstrated the utmost integrity in handling this difficult task, and we thank him for his work. We also acknowledge the courageous leadership within the Australian Defence Force in ordering this investigation and now committing to the next steps. The report is distressing for many who have shown extraordinary bravery in speaking up about what they saw and knew was inappropriate conduct. Giving voice to their concerns would not have been easy. The report highlights that the protective culture insulating Special Forces soldiers was a key factor in creating an environment that allowed unlawful behaviour. The report also demonstrates that we should have faith in the Australian justice system. Where allegations of bad conduct are made, they are properly investigated and the findings acted upon. The confronting honesty of the report highlights that Australia is a country that respects the Geneva Conventions, human rights and the rule of law, and that no one is exempt from those laws. 
We support the establishment of the Office of the Special Investigator to oversee the investigations following this report. It is now appropriate that it is allowed to do its work free of any pre prejudice or political interference. Yesterday, the Senate agreed to a significant motion, moved together by the Leader of the Government in the Senate, the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate and the Minister for Defence, recognising the allegations of grave misconduct by some members of the Australian Special Forces community. The Senate, through this motion, also expressed its deep sympathy to the people of Afghanistan and the Government of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan for the alleged misconduct and command failures identified by the inquiry, and noted the Chief of the Defence Force, on behalf of the Australian Defence Force, has also sincerely and unreservedly apologised to the people of Afghanistan for any wrongdoing by the Australian soldiers. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Kitching. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, what I would like to do today with this opportunity to speak is to ask some questions. I want to precede that by saying that I don't know a lot about this topic, but I feel very strongly that we need to know more about it in this chamber and in parliament in itself. This, in some ways, refers to the trial, and Senator Kitching, Senator Betts has, have discussed that. I won't comment because I don't know the facts, and there is a trial underway. What I want to turn to, though, and ask questions about is the source of the conflict, the root cause, because I think many people in this chamber will share these questions with me. What is the so source of the conflicts, the regional conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan? And more particularly, what is the source of our entry into those conflicts? Participants. And I can vividly remember Mr Alexander Downer re retiring from Parliament and saying on his ABC interview that one of the things he remembered, they were talking about various stories, and one of the things he said he remembered was that the Prime Minister at the time, John Howard, came back from America where we had the, uh, the Twin Towers, the 9-11 catastrophe. And he walked into the cabinet, I believe, and just said, we're off to Iraq. And that floored me. We're committing all these troops, changing their lives, changing the lives of people in other countries, with no, no debate. Just a, we're off to Iraq. No executive council meeting, no cabinet meeting, no parliamentary scrutiny or review. And I don't think that the parliament should have the power to declare war or to decide whether or not our troops are engaged overseas, but it needs to have some review. Governments need to be able to act quickly, but we must have some review regularly. So, as I understand it, and I may be wrong on this, but that we never declared war in Afghanistan. And Afghanistan at its core is a civil war. It's a tribal nation. It's had conflict for hundreds of years. People have tried to take it over. The Americans have been in Afghanistan, the, Af the Russians have been in Afghanistan, people with far superior weapons, but no one has conquered Afghanistan, and it remains an unresolved conflict that is just sucking up lives. And remember that Australians weren't dealing with soldiers over there, they were dealing with terrorists, sometimes little boys and girls dressed up, wrapped in a bomb. People infiltrating our own armed forces, trainees that we were training from Afghanistan, infiltrating the, uh, the, the Chinese forces and shooting Australians and Americans in their training camps. This is not a conventional war. And we put young people from Australia in harm's way. Some died. And some have a far worse fate. They are suffering with the, the acts that they committed under extreme stress. And they will live with that. And it shall be our duty, no matter what the findings of this trial, to help them to live with that. But I come back to the people who took us into Afghanistan, the head of this country. We were told we were going into Iraq because of weapons of mass destruction. There were none. And the people of the greatest democracy in terms of size, the most powerful nation on earth, the United States, were told the same lie and the Defence Secretary and the President and various Cabinet Ministers admitted later that there were no weapons of mass destruction, no evidence of such. And we admitted that here, our heads of state. 
Who will hold these people accountable? Who will hold the, the agencies accountable for briefing them? Because the ultimate responsibility for soldiers' actions are the values of the country and the leaders of the country, because the leaders are trustees for the values. But there is hope, because for the first time in many, many presidencies in the United States, we have a president in Donald Trump who has not started a war. My understanding is he is the first in many, many presidential terms. It's now the lefties, the Obamas, the Bidens, who want to drop bombs on behalf of globalists. It is now Trump who's withdrawing troops and has since, since he first got into the presidency. And the Trump is the first president to start a war and to engage in peacemaking efforts with South Korea. So I highlight the responsibility of the senior levels of our government and of our parliament and our joint, re joint responsibilities to fulfil them. Thank you. Senator Van. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, another day, another motion of urgency from the Greens where they have failed to look at the government's response to an issue before attacking it. Yesterday, the Greens moved a motion wanting the opportunity to increase the number of motions they can bring forward to this chamber. When they constantly use MPUs and MPIs to attack the government on issues where they clearly haven't looked at the facts, it is hard for this chamber to even consider uh, giving them— S Senator, uh, Senator Stilljohn, point of order. Thank you, Deputy Chair. Point of order on relevance. Given the content of the motion, uh, Senator Van's contribution is not relevant. Uh, Senator Stilljohn, I believe that Senator Van has still just started his speech, so um, Senator Van. Thank you kindly. Uh, so it's hard for this chamber to even consider giving them more opportunities. This chamber has serious business to consider. We currently have more than 20 bills on the notice paper. The Greens are just here trying to interrupt, disrupt and frustrate the work which we do in this place. Yet again, the Greens have moved this motion of urgency, which is a clear Dorothy Dixit for us, because once again you've provided me with, they have provided me with a great opportunity to highlight the actions of the Morris government is taking. The actions that we're taking on this matter are methodical, clear, calm and appropriate. There is no doubt, Ms Acting Deputy President, the findings within the Brereton report were sad, distressing, concerning and require thorough action to be taken. The Morrison government, along with the Australian Defence Force, is taking action to meet not only our domestic and international obligations, but also our moral obligation to ensure that this does not happen again. The findings of the Brereton report are amongst the most serious issue that any Prime Minister, Minister for Defence or any Chief of Defence Force has ever had to deal with in the history of our nation. Though the members of the crossbench who have decided to come in here and use this report for political point scoring need to realise that there is no quick fix for this. There are no easy answers. There is no one simple thing that will deal with the reasons behind these multiple allegations of war crimes. In contrast to the tokenism from those in the Greens, this government, along with the Chief of Defence Force, is getting on with the job. So let's talk about some of the facts about what this government is doing. On the 19th of November this year, CDF released a public version of the Afghanistan inquiry report delivered to him by the Inspector General of the ADF. The Chief of the Defence Force said the ADF is rightly held to account for allegations of great, grave misconduct by some members of the Australian Special Forces during operations in Afghanistan. The CDF, on behalf of the ADF, has sincerely and unreservedly apologised to the people of, of Afghanistan for any wrongdoing. Furthermore, he conveyed this message to his Afghan counterpart, General Zia. The CDF, in leading Defence's response to the inquiry report, e sorry, is leading the Defence's response to the inquiry report by developing an implementation plan. This implementation plan will undertake actioning of the Inspector General's recommendations 
<coughs> and any other <coughs> matters arising from the report. Once developed, this implementation plan will be provided to the government for consideration and response, as it should. To ensure the implementation plan is appropriate, our government has established the Afghanistan Inquiry Implementation Oversight Panel. This panel will comprise of three eminent, experienced and suitably qualified Australians and will provide oversight of Defence's response. This panel will be independent of Defence and will report back directly and regularly to the Minister for Defence. This response will ensure that the response from Defence is thoughtful, measured and appropriate. Mr Acting Deputy President, there is no denying that allegations contained in the inquiry report are deeply disturbing. They must be addressed and individually investigated. But they need to be addressed with a deep respect for justice and the rule of law. Fundamental to that is the presumption of innocence, the central tenet of our criminal legal system. Senator Waters coming in here calling on the government to bring individuals to justice is flying in the face of that tenet. We have to respect the rule of law. We have to protect the presumption of innocence. Throughout the report, the recommendation states that there is realistic prospect of a criminal investigation obtaining sufficient evidence to charge. And that's the whole point. We need to make sure that there is a criminal investigation that obtains that sufficient evidence before charges can be laid. We can't act as judge and jury in this place. And this is why the Morrison Liberal government is also establishing the office of the special investigator within the Home Affairs portfolio. The office will address the potential criminal matters identified in the inquiry report. In particular, this new office will investigate allegations, gather evidence and, where appropriate, refer briefs to the Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecutions for their consideration. This is a considered, thorough and mature approach to dealing with these grave allegations. Any administ administrative, disciplinary, judicial or other proceedings arising as a result of the inquiry will be conducted according to the well-established processes of Australia's legal system. Processes which ensure individuals' rights to due process and a fair hearing. Accountability will be the cornerstone of Defence's response to the inquiry. Mr Acting Deputy President, the government of the day also has a duty of care to members of our Defence Force, something the Greens uh, seemingly pay scant regard Senator, to. Senator uh, Stilgeon. Uh, Acting Deputy Chair, I draw your attention to the State of the Chamber. Quorum required. Quorum required.
quorum has been achieved. Senator Van. Greens. Well, again, Mr Acting Deputy President, we see the Greens playing games in this place. We see them playing petty little child's games, and they're just making a mockery of this place, of the serious business that needs to do there. But back to my speech. We're committed to we, the Morrison Liberal government is committed to ensuring that current and former serving ADF members are not impacted by the Afghanistan inquiry, them along with their families. They all have access to the right support at the right time. We're also focused on supporting those who are vulnerable or at risk. The Australian Defence Force is the finest military in the world. The inquiry report should not cast a shadow over the vast majority of our Defence Force members who served in Afghanistan with distinction. This year, we've seen the best of our Defence Force right here at home. Through operations such as bushfire assists and their support to states and territories during the COVID pandemic, every day this year we've seen images of our Defence Force personnel helping everyday Australians through what has been the hardest year that I can certainly remember. While depressing, unedifying and completely regrettable, the allegations outlined in the Brereton report do not reflect the service of our Defence Force service men and women. Mr Acting Deputy President, it is clear that there is no quick fix. There are no easy answers. And it is incredibly disappointing, Mr Acting Deputy President, that Senator Waters and her Greens colleagues at that end of the chamber just want to play games, score political points with this very important matter and waste the time of the Senate. Thank you. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak to this matter of urgency. What happened in Afghanistan was the murder and torture of innocent people, even children, it happened. which left families torn apart and communities in ruin. These heinous war crimes committed by Australia are another shameful chapter in our history. We demand justice for the victims. And this government should be ashamed standing there and shouting back at us and saying that these crimes didn't happen. The perpetrators of these crimes and their superiors must be held to account and must face the full force of the law. Justice must be served here. All in investigations must be independent and the findings have to be made public. And there must be fair compensation and reparations for the families and to the communities targeted by these disgusting crimes. The government must apologise to those families. Australian soldiers must be brought home. In stories like that of Afghanistan, in stories like that of Australian soldiers drinking beer out of a dead Taliban fighter's prosthetic leg, we see the culture that allowed this brutality to go on. We shouldn't just oppose war crimes, though. We should reject the militarism and the nationalism that encourages them. World over, we see the horrifying human cost when unfettered militarism and nationalism fuels and permits state violence. In Palestine, the occupying forces have committed untold human rights abuses with impunity and the support of those who deny the Palestinian people self-determination and the right of return. In Kashmir, the military continues to enforce a cruel lockdown, denies Kashmiris access to internet and other essentials, and is responsible for arbitrary detentions. In Xinjiang, a vast military apparatus sustains the oppression and cultural genocide of Uyghurs, separating families, detaining hundreds of thousands, and subjecting many to cruelties like forced sterilization. Just as all violence and war must be condemned and avoided, the politicians who take us to wars must be condemned and held to account. The post 9-11 wars on terror have raged for 20 years now. These wars have killed half a million civilians in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Pakistan. 
Women have been the often unseen victims of this war, their rights violated while they face gender-based violence. Afghans have been forced to flee their own country. They are now one of the largest refugee populations in the world. We must admit that deploying armed forces, guns, bombs, in the name of quashing terrorism will not protect anyone. It has the exact opposite effect. We must stop warmongering and blindly following the US. Where war is concerned, history has sadly repeated itself time and again. The incessant self-interested attempts of the West to control and extinguish complex Middle Eastern conflicts must end. And we must not forget the root cause of these conflicts stems from similar Western interventions in the first place. We need to clearly imagine what we want for the world. That means changing the conversation from going to war to bringing peace and justice. If that is what we aim for, then our success will rest on reparations for past injustices, fair economic, environmental and social development, and respect for human rights, not on military capabilities. I do want to acknowledge the courage of whistleblowers like David McBride and journalists here and in Afghanistan who put their necks and indeed their lives on the line to get the truth out in the open. They must be protected. Australians have been shocked by the inhumanity of the heinous war crimes exposed by the Brereton Report. Now is the time to bring people together to send a strong message to our government. War criminals must be charged. Soldiers must be brought home. Reparations must be given. War is never the answer. Be here. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Prima facie, what we heard from the Burton Report clearly signalled war crimes, criminality and gross human rights violations. Prima facie. It is true that there's been no prosecutions. We don't know what charges will be laid when that will happen, but prima facie what we've heard uh, is very concerning and has deeply shocked the Australian people. Um, I did say in here the other day at question time, and I, and I meant it, um, I don't think uh, any cohort of Australians probably would have been more shocked than many serving members of the ADF and, and the veterans community. Um, I spoke, spoke to my own father, who's a Vietnam vet, about this, and uh, I think we need to be uh, very clear here that when we're speaking uh, about our defence services, we need to be open and honest about this situation, because it, if we don't clear it up, then, of course, by logic, everyone's going to be tarred with this brush in the defence forces. If we brush it under the carpet and pretend it's going to go away and look over there, it's never going to go away, and that taint is always going to remain. The best thing to do is to be open and transparent and deal with this expediently and independently. And this is the point that I would like to raise about whistleblowers. We only got the Burton report released because of a whistleblower, David McBride, uh, an ex-army major who worked with special forces. He had significant concerns about the conduct of the war. He's been very public about that, uh, including uh, senior officers and, and other non-commissioned officers acting with impunity. He raised his concerns internally for two years and they weren't dealt with. He went to the Australian Federal Police. It wasn't dealt with. And out of desperation, he went to the media. He's a whistleblower. Now, we know the ABC officers were raided. Uh, by the Australian Federal Police upon publication of information that was passed on by McBride. Uh, thankfully, the government's decided, the Attorney General has decided not to prosecute the media in this instance or the publishers. However, this government in this Senate last week refused to rule out the prosecution of a veteran who's had two tours of Afghanistan, who has blown the whistle and delivered us a report on. Prima facie, Australian war crimes in Afghanistan. Whether we like it or not, whether it troubles us and keeps us awake at night, a whistleblower has delivered this. So why is that court case going ahead? Why is David McBride facing 50 years in jail? Now, 
Let me tell you this. The Burton report said not only should whistleblowers be protected to encourage an ex expeditious uh, process around getting to the bottom of this, but they should be applauded and promoted. That's come directly from the Burton report. So why is the person that disclosed this and got this into the public realm facing jail? And I have to put that question, Acting Deputy President, because it seems to be part of a political strategy by this government to go after whistleblowers who embarrass them. It's not just David McBride. It's also Bernard Caleri, the lawyer for Witness K and Witness K, who also exposed uh, criminality by our intelligence agencies and our government in relation to one of our neighbours, a lot poorer country than us, Timor-Leste. And the complicity, the silence of this government on the extradition of a Walkley Award-winning journalist, Julian Assange, to the country whose war crimes he exposed. We think about McBride and the Afghan report and how that shocked the Australian people. Well, WikiLeaks exposed identical war crimes, or worse, by our allied forces in Afghanistan and Iraq. And there was no doubting what he exposed. It was 100 per cent factual. And it was published all around the world by key media outlets. Yet this Australian publisher, this whistleblower, and Chelsea Manning in the US, in jail behind bars, is facing 175 years uh, in a process that's never been seen before, where a foreign citizen is being extradited to the US on espionage charges. This is also something that we need to deal with when we think about Afghanistan. Free Julian Assange and bring him back to Australia. The question is that the motion put by Senator Steeljohn be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the eyes have it. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. I'm here. Sorry. No, you're going to be.
stop the bells. So the question is that the motion put by Senator Stilljohn be agreed to. Those of that opinion move to the right of the chair, those against move to the left of the chair, and I appoint Senator Seawitt as teller for the eyes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the nose. Yeah, I'll be The result of the division is nine ayes and 38 noes, which means the motion has been negated. Thank you. No documents were tabled today, so we shall proceed to committee reports. I seek an indication from the government whip. Yes, uh, Senator McGrath. Uh, pursuant to order and at the request of the chairs of the respective committees, I present two reports of legislation committees as listed at item 14 on today's order of business in respect of the 2020-21 budget estimates together with the Hansard record of proceedings and documents presented to the committees. On behalf of the Chair of the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Legislation Committee, Senator Abetz, I present additional information received by the committee on its inquiry into Australia's Foreign Relations, State and Territory Arrangements, Arrangements Bill 2020 and a related bill. On behalf of the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties, I present the 192nd report of the committee. On behalf of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Works, I present the committee's sixth report of 2020. On behalf of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, I present two reports as listed at item 14 of today's order of business. And on, on behalf of, of Senator O'Sullivan and on behalf of the Joint Committee of Public Accounts and Audit, I present two reports as listed at item 14 of today's order of business, as well as four executive minutes relating to reports numbers 452, 475 and 481, 
and, and I move that the Senate take note of the reports. Uh, Senator Rice. So acting Deputy President, I um, wish to take note of the Joint Committee of Public Accounts and Audit report, and particularly their um, report on the sports rorts scandal. Um, and basically, this report of the Joint Public Accounts and Audit Committee further underlines the work that we have been doing in the Senate um, as part in, the, in the Select Committee on the sports rorts scandal. So we're pleased to see that the, the Joint Committee. Public Accounts and Audit Committee has agreed with the findings of the Select Committee and has raised the same issues with us and essentially going to the heart of the fact that the minister who signed off on deciding where money was going to be spent on these sports grants, questioning whether that she had the legal authority to be the decision maker. And really, their report raises the same issues that we've seen raised through the Select Committee interim report, the same issues of accountability, the same issues of the scandal of these grants being used, being directed for political purposes, basically to, for the government to try and win elections. And in particular, it raises the issue of the hundreds of emails, the dozens of spreadsheets and the re absolute unwillingness of this government to be accountable and the fact that they have withheld documents and they've preferred, refused to provide key information. And it really highlights the fact that the cre critical question that this report now um, supports what we have found out in the select committee, it, which the Liberal Party have failed to answer, is that what we want to know is we want more information needs to be on the table for the Senate. In particular, we want Sen Senator McKenzie, former Minister, Minister McKenzie, to come out of witness protection and told us what went on. In particular, we think that Senator McKenzie actually should fess up and say it just wasn't all her idea, because it's very clear from the evidence that's been that we have considered in our committee and that the, the joint committee um, whose report we are talking about today is the role of the Prime Minister in this. It is there. And we've had the Prime Minister refusing to answer questions about the role he's played and the role that his officers played in these sports rorts. We know that spreadsheets were attached to at least one letter from Senator McKenzie to the Prime Minister. We know that his minister was holding up decisions on which, which grants were going to be approved because he hadn't seen lists or approved them, and we know that his office actually made changes to the grants ab ab allocations. So we actually think it's simply unfair that Senator McKenzie has been made to wear the political pain for this program when it's very clear that the Prime Minister was up to his neck in it and that his office was he and his office were profoundly involved in the rort. So, look, it would be so good, and particularly we've now got two reports that we have considered that make it very clear that Senator McKenzie should appear before the Senate and our Senate committee and give a clear answer about what the Prime Minister knew. I mean, keeping her in witness protection for so long is simply unfair to her and to the Australian people. And this matters because it goes to the heart of our democracy. It goes to the heart of the people of Australia being able to trust the processes that are put in place um, that are going to be fair, they're going to be accountable and they're going to be transparent. Clearly, determining which clubs got grants under this program was not transparent. It was not fair. And so we have got a whole cohort of clubs that should have got grants, that scored incredibly highly on Sports Australia's um, assessment, that missed out. And we know that the fact that they missed out means an awful lot to them. We know that they, having put in hours and hours, hundreds of hours of work for really worthy programs that scored really highly, that 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 funding would have made a huge difference to them and their communities. So we want the Prime Minister to apologise. He should come clean and enable Senator McKenzie to come out of witness protection. And above all, as this report that we're considering today, as our sports rorts interim report says, that we need transparency, we need accountability and we need a decision for the Prime Minister and this government to fund the sporting clubs that missed out. 
Senator Waters. Thanks very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. And I too rise to speak on this report, the uh, Joint Committee on Public Accounts and Audit Report into the Administration of Government Grants. Now, the report recommends sweeping changes to the administration of taxpayer grant schemes, and that includes things like making sure there are clear guidelines for allocating public money. The novel suggestion of keeping, keeping clear records of how decisions are made and the excellent suggestion of actually implementing compliance mechanisms to ensure that guidelines are in fact followed. Now, the fact that a committee dominated by government members concludes that there's something rotten in the way that government grants are being administered and that it falls well short of community expectations is very telling. And the fact that the committee remains unconvinced that the minister even had the authority to issue the grants, which were at the heart of sports rorts, is particularly concerning. So many community organisations, small businesses and individuals pour hours of their time into applying for grants. They expect their applications will be assessed objectively and against the published criteria. And they expect public money to be used wisely. But this government just doesn't even bother to pretend anymore. Various grants, particularly the community development grants, which government officials conceded in estimates are used as a slush fund for election promises, are blatant pork barrelling. Millions of dollars of public money continues to be used to feather their own nests and secure another term in power. Well, it's for this reason that earlier this year we Greens moved to propose a select committee inquiry into the allocation of government grants, because we know it's not just sports rorts, we know it's not just the community development grants, we know it's not just um, a handful of other ones. We know that this is a systemic problem. So we moved that there be a committee that actually looks at the administration of all government grant programs during and after election campaigns, and we wanted it to look at things like eligibility criteria, management and assessment processes, uh, the use of closed grants programs, which are not open to public in, in, uh, applications but just require the minister to nominate the recipient. We wanted it to look at adherence to the published assessment processes and program criteria. We wanted it to look at the relationship between election commitments and grant allocations. We wanted to look at the need to demonstrate value for money. We wanted to look at the efforts to influence votes through grant allocations, the role of ministers in determining the award of grants, and measures to manage the risk of politicisation of funding, income, uh, funding outcomes and announcements, all things which we know uh, desperately need to be examined because, frankly, what we know already about the grants programs is that they are rorted to high heaven. And we wanted to get to the bottom of how that could be fixed to try to attempt to restore some confidence um, in the public about the administration of their money. It was all going very well, um, Acting Deputy President. We thought we were going to have support to establish that excellent inquiry. We'd had a chat with all of the various people whose votes uh, we needed to get the inquiry up. And what do you know? Pauline Hanson's One Nation Party, who had told us they would support this inquiry, um, at the last minute changed their mind. And I think it was two days later that a photograph of Senator Hanson holding a novelty check, opening a sports stadium in Rockhampton ran in the papers. Uh, Senator Skirr, point of order. For, uh, Acting Deputy President, that's a clear reflection on Senator Hanson from our home state of Queensland. I'd, I'd ask the, uh, that you consider requesting the senator to withdraw. Uh, Senator Skirr, I don't see that as uh, being a poor reflection um, in the way it was actually presented. Senator uh, Waters. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President, for your ruling. I was simply stating some facts. It's very interesting that the Liberals are jumping to the defence of One Nation, uh, in particular when we're talking about the granting uh, of uh, public monies uh, in an election context. So uh, thank you for your ruling. So that inquiry, which would have examined the rot at the heart of this system and this government, um, was stymied, didn't get up. So I'm very grateful to the Joint Committee on Public Accounts and Audit Reports uh, that they have had a look at just this sports rorts issue. As I said, we actually wanted a far broader range of issues to be looked at, but we were overruled by the vested interests in this place. Um, I also want to take this opportunity on the eve of Anti-Corruption Day, which is tomorrow, and you'll hear a bit more from me about that tomorrow, um, to just note um, uh, with uh, incredible uh, 
uh, I don't know, joy, pleasure, happiness, contentment, uh, the role that the ANAO has played in uncovering the misuse of public funds, in uncovering the rorting, the pork barrelling um, and the general poor practices around the allocation of government grants. Um, the same committee that published the report that we are speaking to right now had also previously published a report that supported the ANAO and, interestingly, supported their call for a funding increase. And it was that committee that identified that without additional funds, the ANAO's capacity to undertake audits would reduce by 20 per cent. Now, of course, the budget uh, did not see an increase in the ANAO's uh, budget allocation, and so naturally, uh, this government has ensured that the ANAO's output will decrease by 20 per cent. And one wonders at the coincidence there, uh, given the explosive revelations that the ANAO helped to bring to light in this sports rorts scandal. So let's hope that this uh, present committee report uh, isn't ignored like that one was, um, but it is long past time that Australians could have confidence in the administration of their money in an election contest where uh, seats of government are at stake. It's about time um, snouts came out of the trough and we started acting in the public interest. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy. Senator Waters, do you wish to uh, continue your remarks? Yes, thank you. I, I thought I was going to get in trouble then. I, uh, I, I'd like to continue my remarks. Perhaps thank some you. other time, Senator. Yes, I'm sure. <laughs> Senator Scar. I'm sure there'll be another opportunity, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I present the uh, report of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on the Australian Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity on the integrity of Australia's border arrangements, together with the Hansard record of proceedings and documents presented to the committee and I move that the Senate take note of the report. And I will like to make a few remarks in relation to the report. The Joint Committee on the Australian Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity has today tabled the report from our long-standing inquiry into the integrity of Australia's border arrangements. This inquiry investigated how well government agencies which work to secure our border are able to protect themselves from infiltration and corruption by transnational serious and organised crime elements who seek to subvert Australia's borders. The committee has found that overall our law enforcement agencies are clear-eyed about the risk environment and have adopted appropriately robust mechanisms to seek out infiltration and corruption when it happens. The committee also found that the Australian Commission for Law Enforcement and Integrity ACLE, has performed its functions well in investigating potential breaches of border agencies' integrity. Importantly, ACLE has improved its processes to upskill law enforcement agencies in both corruption detection and prevention strategies to stop corruption and infiltration before either has a chance to take effect. However, a key challenge remains to ensure that law enforcement agencies work together in a more coordinated fashion to tackle integrity risk factors. Every chain is only as strong as the weakest link. The committee found that improvements could be made in developing an overarching strategy to target the types of serious crime and corruption experienced in the unique environment of Australia's border agencies. The committee noted that successive Australian governments have taken significant action to improve border-related functions to ensure those processes maintain their integrity and continue to protect Australians. These changes have included strengthening the approvals regime for maritime and airport security cards. But there is more to do. The committee has recommended the Australian government consider further streamlining the number of identity card approving authorities and creating a central register. The committee's key recommendation is that Australian government law enforcement agencies develop, in consultation with ACLE, a coordinated serious crime and corruption strategy with a particular focus on corruption at Australia's borders. A further recommendation is that Home Affairs and the Department of Water and the Environment develop better consistency across their integrity and anti-corruption frameworks, including developing site-specific approaches. As part of this inquiry, a delegation of the committee travelled to New Zealand and Vanuatu to understand the integrity frameworks of those near neighbour countries and how individual initiatives or aspects 
of those frameworks might be relevant for Australia. Now, I didn't have the benefit of going on that visit, but I've seen the photos, and uh, I was quite envious of those uh, committee members who had the opportunity for that experience. The committee would like to again extend the thanks of the committee to the governments of New Zealand and Vanuatu for their openness to our discussions and for the strength of our ongoing partnerships to tackle transnational serious and organised crime in the Pacific region. I would like, on behalf of the committee, to thank Secretariat staff who were involved in producing this report. Mr Sean Turner, the former secretary of the committee, Ms Kate Gautier, principal research officer, Ms Alice Clapham, administrative officer, and Ms Stephanie Gill, administrative officer. And I would like to conclude by thanking all the committee members involved in the production of this report, including our deputy, deputy chair, Senator Billick. Um, who's provided wonderful support to me on, uh, on the committee in my capacity as chair. I know Senator Billick gets embarrassed when I, uh, I thank her in this place for that, uh, for that assistance. But uh, I do like, uh, I, I, I do enjoy working with Senator Billick, and I do note Senator Billick does have some additional comments, but uh, certainly does agree, as I understand, with the recommendations of the committee. Senator Billick. Deputy President, I rise to speak on the Joint Committee of the Australian Commission Law Enforcement Integrity's report for our inquiry into the integrity of Australia's borders arrangements. And as Deputy Chair of this committee, I've had the opportunity to work closely on this inquiry over the last three parliaments. Firstly, I would like to express my particular thanks to all the committee secretarial staff, as Senator Scar just has, who do an enormous amount of work in order to make inquiries happen and reports written. I would also like to particularly thank Sean Turner, um, Petita Uhorn, Kate Gautier, uh, Alice Clapham and Stephanie Gill as well. And also I would like to thank the various members and senators who have participated on this committee over the um, many years that the inquiry has been going, and of course, particular thanks to the current chair, Senator Scar, for his um, his ability to have a rational and frank discussion. So this inquiry investigated the integrity functions of those government agencies which work to secure our borders, including from criminal terrorists and biosecurity threats. And Australia's border management agencies oversees the movement of millions of people and millions of tonnes of freight and cargo via sea and airports and international mail delivery facilities each year. Overall, the committee found that the integrity functions of Australia border agencies and the relevant oversight agencies are generally responsive to the ever-changing risk environment in which they work. However, in addition to issues relating to the jurisdiction of ACLI, which I will come to in a moment, the committee did find that improvements could be made, including by developing an overarching strategy to target the types of serious crime and corruption experienced in the unique environment of Australia's border agencies. Greater coordination of efforts across agencies, including intelligence sharing and the development of site-specific in integrity plans, would serve to make their work stronger and more effective. The committee also reviewed the operation of the aviation and marine um, maritime security card system. One way to strengthen the way these cards operate would be by creating a central register of card holders. As mentioned, as part of this inquiry, a delegation of the committee travelled to New Zealand and Vanuatu to understand the integrity frameworks of our partners in addressing the ever-important issues of transnational crime and corruption. And as the delegation chair, I also would once again like to extend my thanks to uh, the governments of Vanuatu and New Zealand for their openness um, in our discussions and for our ongoing partnerships um, to tackle these very serious issues. Uh, specifically in the Pacific region. Overall, Labor senators and members of the committee support the recommendations of the inquiry. However, there are a number of matters that we would like to put on the record which warrant particular emphasis. Most significantly, this inquiry has further highlighted the urgent need for a broad-based, independent and powerful National Integrity Commission to tackle corruption. At present, the jurisdiction of ACLI is too narrow to have any chance of investigating and rooting out corruption at Australia's borders. ACLI provided this committee with a number of extraordinary examples of jurisdictional issues, preventing it from conducting investigations into extremely serious allegations of corruption. 
For example, an allegation that an agricultural officer was facilitating drug importations and terrorism financing was deemed not to be within its jurisdiction, as was an allegation of the acceptance of bribes to clear consignments by an agriculture officer. The patchy nature of Ackley's jurisdiction is having far-reaching implications for Australia's border arrangements. Corruption at Australia's borders is a national security risk. The Prime Minister and the Attorney-General's announcement that the government would expand Ackley's jurisdiction to include the entirety of the Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment was made some two years ago. Since then, the government has shown no urgency to follow through on its commitment. The government continues to allow an intolerable risk to Australia's border security and therefore to Australia's biosecurity and national security to remain unchecked. Last month, the government finally released an exposure draft of a bill to establish a Commonwealth Integrity Commission. And the proposed model includes two divisions. One of those divisions, the Public Sector Division, would be responsible for investigating politicians and most Commonwealth public servants. The power of the Public Sector Division would be significantly significantly weaker than those of Ackley and it would operate entirely in secret. It would not be able to self-initiate investigations into possible corruption and, unlike Ackley, it would not even be able to make findings of corruption. The other division would be Ackley, which would continue to operate as it currently operates but with the entirety of um, the, the department uh, door. This model has been widely criticised by legal and anti-corruption experts. Since uh, several senior legal Figures have even suggested that because the public sector division could not hold public hearings and will be subject to numerous other legislative constraints, the government's model is designed to cover up corruption, not expose it. Corruption erodes public trust in governments and institutions, costs the taxpayer money and can threaten the health, safety and security of all Australians. The proposed Commonwealth Integrity Commission appears to fall well short of what is needed. Labor members would also like to record our concern about the conduct and quality of Ackley's investigation into allegations of corruption involving the Department of Home Affairs and Crown Casino, known as Operation Ango. And I'm very disappointed that the government members would not support these concerns with Operation Ango in the substantial committee report, and I'll tell you why. Over the course of this inquiry, Labor members of the committee asked detailed questions about Operation Ango. Those questions were prompted in large part by the poor quality of the Integrity Commissioner's Public Investigation Report 08 2020. The allegations invested by Operation Angove were incredibly serious. They related to possible corruption by Home Affairs staff in relation to the provision of Australian visas for Crown VIPs, possible corruption by Australian Border Force staff in relation to the clearing of those VIPs at the Australia border, and possible possible corruption by an individual ABF staff member who was employed by a VIP junket operator. Those matters were referred to the former Integrity Commissioner, Mr Michael Griffin AM, by the Attorney-General following an explosive report by the 60 Minutes program and a series of articles in the Sydney Morning Herald. That report was based in part on comments made by a former Crown employer turned whistleblower. After a 12-month investigation by Ackley, the current Integrity Commissioner concluded that there was no evidence of corrupt conduct by Home Affairs or the ABF. However, over the course of this inquiry, it became clear that Ackley's investigation of those three corruption issues was deficient in numerous respects. For example, Ackley did not interview a single employee or former employee of Crown. Ackley conducted only one formal interview over the course of Operation Angove. Ackley did not even attempt to contact the former Crown employee who spoke to 60 Minutes in relation to the provision of Australian visas for Crown VIPs, and Ackley did not even attempt to contact any of the officials who were directly responsible for processing visa applications for Crown VIPs. Ackley did not even follow up when ABF officers ignored requests for information, and the Integrity Commissioner's report does not even refer to the fact that the Crown junket operator who employed the serving ABF officer as an extraordinarily well-paid personal assistant was suspected of committing a range of serious criminal offences. The Integrity Commission Commissioner's conclusion that there was no corrupt conduct by Home Affairs or ABF staff appears to have been based principally on a desktop review of visa processing notes and other documentation or records which, according to the Commissioner's own report, were seriously deficient in a number of respects. Accordingly, Labor members are not satisfied that the Operation Angove, Angove investi investigation was sufficiently robust. Be assured we do not make these comments lightly. Investigations by Ackley or by any investi 
legislative body necessarily require individuals to make difficult judgments on the basis of a complicated array of laws, facts and circumstances. However, following a careful review of Investigation Report 08 2020 and the Commissioner's detailed responses to our questions, we believe that our concerns are warranted. The, this committee has a duty to monitor and review the Integrity Commissioner's performance and raise concerns when, in our view, the Commissioner's performance has fallen short. So it's important to acknowledge, though, that the current Commissioner assumed the role partway through the Operation Angove investigation. It is not necessary for us to apportion responsibility for the deficiencies in API's investigation between the current and the former Commissioner, and nor are we in a position to do so. And our comments should in no way be interpreted as a criticism of individual investigators. Nor are Labor members concerned about the performance of ACLI more generally, which has done and continues to do very important work to a commendably high standard. Our comments are confined to one particular investigation and report. Finally, noting that the committee is not authorised to reconsider the Integrity Commissioner's decisions or recommendations, we would also like to make it clear that we are in no way suggesting that the Integrity Commissioner's conclusion that there was no corrupt conduct was wrong. What we are suggesting is that the process that led the Commissioner to reach that conclusion was deficient. Corruption is a serious issue, and notwithstanding the general findings of this report, Labor members believe that the government can and must do more to stamp out corruption. You seek leave to uh, continue your remarks? Uh, no. That's all right. Okay, so I'll put the question. The question is that motions to take note be agreed to. If those that have been say aye. If those against, no. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Uh, I present two reports of the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade, as listed at item 14 of today's order of business, and I move that the Senate take note of the reports. Uh, I first wish to make some comments on the inquiry into the implications of the COVID-19 pandemic for Australia's foreign affairs, defence and trade policies. Uh, it's my duty as the chair of the Joint Committee uh, on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade to present the committee's report. Uh, COVID-19, as everyone knows, has been one of the most significant uh, threats to global human health since the pandemic of 1918. In addition to the number of cases and deaths directly attributable to the environment, the pandemic will have a wide range of implications for global health and health systems. But the committee inquiry concluded that the strategic lessons from COVID-19 are not predominantly about health. One of the key findings of the committee was that the behaviour of nation states in response to COVID-19 has called into question some assumptions about the extent of adherence to the global rules-based order by nations when they are facing a crisis or they're under stress. These assumptions uh, have underpinned many aspects of Australia's foreign affairs, defence and trade policy in recent decades. Australia also uh, has found that COVID-19 has exposed structural vulnerabilities in some of our critical national systems. Those are the systems that enable us to function as a secure, prosperous, first world nation. Many of these vulnerabilities are caused by supply chains that rely on just-in-time supply from the global market. And in some cases, this is exacerbated by supply coming in part or in whole uh, from companies that are subject to extrajudicial or coercive direction from some foreign governments. Any decrease in the support for the norms of the rules-based order negatively affects the collaboration and conflict resolution between nation states, as well as the efficacy of commercial relationships between companies throughout the supply chains. So a key lesson from COVID-19, given the behaviour of nation states, given the importance of supply chains, is that returning to business as usual is not an option if Australia is to be resilient, remaining secure and prosperous in the face of future crises. And the strategic update of 2020 makes it clear that another zoonotic pandemic like COVID-19 is only one of the potential crises facing Australia and our region that would disrupt business as usual. 
unexpected or sustained disruption due to grey zone, coercive or military actions are likely to substantially degrade, if not disable, one or more of Australia's critical national systems. The critical national systems are things like our health system, our transport system, our defence system, communications, finance, all the things that help us operate as a first world nation. So Australia must identify the supply chains that underpin these critical national systems and work with industry to reduce, if not eliminate, the vulnerabilities in those supply chains so that we increase the resilience. Now this will require changes to the Commonwealth procurement rules to specifically recognise the value for money that is inherent by partnering with industry, those industries that create or expand sovereign capabilities to provide the, the priority enablers for those critical national systems. It will also require more whole of government strategic assessments, investments and diplomatic efforts to increase our resilience through trusted and transparent partnerships with like-minded nations. Australia, like much of the Indo-Pacific region, has benefited from the global rules-based order, which has underpinned the increase in security and prosperity in recent decades. Poor outcomes, though, from some of the key multilateral institutions has caused the decrease in engagement by some nations and there is evidence of some authoritarian nation states seeking to influence the global rules and standards away from the transparent, plural and democratic values that have informed global norms in recent decades. It's therefore clearly in Australia's interest to work with like-minded nations to ensure that reforms to key multilateral institutions are effective but also consistent with the democratic values and the rule of law. COVID-19 has seen Australia respond effectively, including with novel approaches to governance, things such as the National Cabinet and partnerships with industry that have placed strategic and timely outcomes over rigid adherence to established process. Responding to the lessons of COVID-19 that have been identified in this report, therefore, will require a similar commitment to whole of government, outcomes focused leadership and timely funded implementation of novel solutions which will challenge the status quo. Before concluding my remarks, I would just like to note that there are some human rights implications that I believe Senator Sheldon will be speaking to uh, that affected our um, mariners who are part of our transport system, whether they be um, on foreign ships. Uh, and some security implications in terms of uh, the small number of Australian flagships. But I'll leave Senator Sheldon to talk through some of those implications. Finally, I'd like to thank uh, people who submitted to the committee, and I'd like to thank the committee secretariat for their work uh, throughout a year that has been disrupted by the pandemic in making sure that the inquiry could still continue, that evidence could be gained, uh, and particularly uh, to Stephen Sherlock for his work in drafting uh, the report and working with me uh, and the committee on the recommendations. So Mr Acting or Madam Acting Deputy President, I commend this report to the Senate and I seek leave, given the time remaining, uh, to table uh, a statement on the other report from the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade uh, conducted by the Human Rights Subcommittee on Criminality, Corruption and Impunity should Australia join the Magnitsky movement. Senator Fawcett, did you want to table that or incorporate, incorporate it? I want to incorporate okay. those remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Is leave granted? Leave's granted. Senator Sheldon? Thank you. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to take uh, note of the inquiry into the implications of the COVID-19 pandemic for Australia's foreign affairs, defence and trade. As a member of this committee, I was pleased to see the broader strategic implications of COVID for our defence, security, trade and diplomacy was taken up by this inquiry. I want to draw to the Senator's attention to one key aspect of the report. I speak to the humanitarian and economic crisis in our shipping industry, brought on by the failure of the federal and state and some state governments to coordinate 
ship crews changes in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Many in this chamber will be aware of the plight of over 400,000 seafarers around the world who, due to the border and quarantine restrictions, have been trapped aboard their ships. Many of these crews have been at sea for over a year. Some by this Christmas will not have been able to travel home to their families in 18 or 20 months. The physical and mental health strain for these seafarers is immense. There have been suicides and serious mental health episodes. These ships have been described by the Human Rights Watch and other human rights organisations as floating prisons. Now, let's bear in mind that Australia, like many countries, is signatory to an international labour organisation convention that limits time on board without leave to a maximum of 11 months, and that most crews would ideally be get leave after nine months. These are human beings who are bearing the brunt of the pandemic so that vital goods can continue to be traded around the world. The Australian Maritime Safety Authority is required to act on behalf of seafarers when their time aboard breaches the 11-month limit. They recently raised this limit to 14 months so that ships can be accepted at Australian ports. In the words of Cal Show, who was the Singapore-based CEO of Wilhelmsen Ship Management, Australia has taken the most stringent stance on crews overdue for change, and this is setting a good international example. But this alone does not solve the underlying problem. The shipping and ports industry have joined with unions like the International Transport Federation to alert government, including our own, to the humanitarian and economic consequences of not making arrangements between countries and states to facilitate crew changes. The CEO of Ports Australia, the Hon. Mike Gallagher, warned the Joint Standing Committee in July that not enough was being done to address the inevitable flow-on effects from this crisis. He said, if you have a vessel pull alongside and the crew walk off that vessel, then it's going to be very difficult to move that vessel away from the wharf, which therefore causes difficulties with regard to the export or import supply chain. It wouldn't take very long if we had a number of these vessels falling into this situation, whereby ports could simply come to a grinding halt. Now, this industry must deal with a different quarantine and crew change arrangements for every country. For crews travelling in Australian waters, the challenges of quarantine and border restrictions have been compounded by state and territory border closures, uh, border closures and each state having its own additional set of rules. So while there is an effort by the Australian federal and state governments to coordinate an interstate trucking throughout this year, our federal government has not been so effective along with the states in having a national strategy to coordinate to get shipping crews safely across borders so they can be relieved. Relief crews have often been forced to quarantine twice, adding additional weeks to their already long service times, and seafarers have waited weeks and months to be repatriated to their home countries. Meanwhile, the shipping of key commodities to our export markets have been put, been put at risk significantly delayed and, in some cases, halted altogether. It is with growing alarm that I report that current trade disputes with China have escalated to the extent that these crew changes crisis is at a new level. The International Transport Federation reports that there are now between 50 and 80 ships with Australian coal on board that are now languishing at anchorage off Chinese ports. Some of these ships have been on anchor over five months after loading in Australia. Many have seafarers on board for up to 15 months already. One ship is the Jagannand, an Indian flag ship carrying coal from Australia to Xintang in northern China. This ship arrived on the 13th of June this year and still has not been unloaded its cargo. That is five months waiting and there is no indication when the ship will be allowed to berth. China is also enforcing a law that non-Chinese nationals may disembark onto Chinese soil, may not disembark onto Chinese soil. 
meaning that if the ship can berth, the seafarers will remain trapped aboard. Of the 23 seafarers aboard the Shangnan, there is 15 who have been already been on board for at least 16 months. Three of these are about to hit 20 months of service on board, trapped upon the ship. This pandemic has made all much more aware of all of us more aware of the sacrifices that essential workers are making every day. Essential workers have kept our supermarket shelves supplied and stocked. They've ensured care and hygiene in our hospitals and our aged care homes. They've kept our public transport, logistics and food delivery networks running. Our seafarers should not be the forgotten essential workers and essential service workers across the world. They've kept trade in goods and bulk commodities flowing throughout the pandemic. Australia is one of the countries most dependent on shipping. Over 95 per cent of our export trade is maritime trade. Our mining, farm and other exports live and die by this trade. It is time for Australia to heed the calls for the, of the International Transport Federation and many others to show national leadership. And importantly, this report is a bipartisan report. And to the credit of the chair and the deputy chair for this report being delivered in the fashion it has. The report recommends that the Prime Minister lead deliberations by the national cabinet process to produce a national framework that will ensure COVID-19 related measures imposed by states and territories do not prevent the timely changeover of international maritime crews. Further, the report also recommends that the national cabinet design that framework so that states and territories remain compliant with national obligations in the event of future crisis that require responses falling under the authority of sub-national uh, states. Further, that the report also recommends that the National Cabinet design the framework so that states and territories remain compliant and national obligations in the, in the event of future crisis require responses falling under the authority of sub-national governments, crises like the one unfolding at ports across the eastern coast of China. Acting Deputy President, I commend this report to the Senate. I am grateful for the members of the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade for the recognition of the crew change crisis and for their work over the past months to identify, explore the impacts of COVID-19 on our security, defence, industry, diplomacy and vital trade and supply lines. I seek leave to continue my remarks. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. I um, wish to take note of the report of the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade. Criminality, corruption and impunity should Australia join the global Magnitsky movement. The Greens welcome this report and really welcome the multi-partisan um, support that the report has and are very pleased to, to in the report having been presented to know that it has got the support right across the parliament. Um, we believe that universal human rights are fundamental and must be respected and protected in all countries and for all people. And so that means we want to see greater international respect and protection of human rights. And as well as governments, we want to see non-government en entities, including individuals and corporations, um, respecting human rights and being accountable for human rights violations. Because people who are responsible for human rights crimes need to face the consequences of their actions. The Magnitsky legislation, as is discussed in this report, would enable us to bar human rights abusers from visiting Australia or from having financial interests in Australia, including, for example, safe haven bank accounts, which they can keep their wealth in, wealth that has often been gained by corrupt means. So look, in talking to this report tonight, what I want to also note is that we are hopeful that the government will act urgently to provide exposure draft to develop and then provide exposure draft legislation that can implement the key recommendations from this report. The Greens, I'm a member of the committee now. I haven't been during the process of this report being development, but I have been engaged and been following it through its development. From here, we will be working to make sure that 
any legislation, any Magnitsky legislation, ensure that it's robust, robustly drafted and has got real teeth. I mean, we need to get the detail right so that it can't be misused, and in particular so that there is independence and objectivity in determining who is caught up under this legislation. But we need to act urgently, and that we need to act urgently for two reasons. The first, of course, is the sooner the better in implementing and hopefully discouraging some of the more absolutely egregious attacks on human rights that are occurring globally, including extrajudicial killings, torture, arrests, disappearances of people um, who are expressing dissent to authoritarian governments. And you know, Tragically, we know that these types of attacks are occurring across the globe far too often and extensively in multiple regimes across the world. And just in the last couple of weeks, I have spoken here in this place about human rights violations in West Papua, in India, in China, Hong Kong, Cambodia, the Philippines, Bangladesh, Palestine, Colombia and Ethiopia, and expressed concerns about due process in Samoa and Sri Lanka. But the second reason why we need to act urgently is that with other jurisdictions having enacted, enacted Magnitsky legislation, including the US, Canada and the UK, there is a significant significant concern that unless Australia acts that we will then become the safe haven for human rights abusers because other countries have restricted access for these people to their shores. In conclusion, we believe, the Greens believe that the Magnitsky Act would provide a really powerful tool to address human rights abuses and that we should be urgently working to be putting such legislation in place here in Australia. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I wish to associate myself with the remarks of Senator Fawcett and Senator Rice uh, on the Magnitsky report from the Joint Standing Committee of Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade. Um, a few years ago, I saw Bill Browder, the employer of Sergei Magnitsky, uh, in being interviewed on Australian television. In that interview, he outlined what had happened to Sergei Magnitsky, which was effectively that he was employed by Bill Browder in Moscow and uncovered hundreds of millions of dollars of embezzlement by the police force there. And um, in a, I won't go through the complicated financial settings of that company, but uh, essentially Sergei Magnitsky was detained by the police, the same people who had done the embezzling, and had then uh, was essentially tortured to death in jail. Uh, he was never charged. And I mean, obviously, this is a terrible and egregious um, violation of anyone's rights. What then happened was that Bill Browder would not rest until Magnitsky legislation uh, has been uh, enacted around the globe. So he went firstly to the United States and former senator and presidential candidate John McCain was very instrumental in helping to pass the first lot of Magnitsky legislation and then the Global Magnitsky Act was then passed. The UK has it, as Senator Rice has said, Canada has it. The European Parliament just the other night also uh, is having Magnitsky legislation uh, and other jurisdictions in Europe have Magnitsky legislation. This will stop. I think it's very important for Australia to have that. Australians, I think, don't want to, have to give succour or to give any sense of security to people who have engaged in gross human rights violations or in uh, corruption. We don't want those people to be able to use our rule of law and our system to invest safely the ill-gotten gains that they have made. So uh, I again thank you to Senator Rice and to Senator Fawcett and thank you Senator, Acting Senator Deputy. Senator Kitching, you'll be in continuation if you wish to continue. And be, be, pursuant to the order earlier today, we are now um, moving to government business. But Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I seek the leave of the Senate to table a dossier on the Adani Group's environmental and social record prepared by Adani Watch under the auspices of the Bob Brown Foundation. And I believe is this has granted? been checked off by the is WIPS leave process. Granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Patrick. Yes, uh, I, I seek leave to, to go back to talk to uh, report number. Senator Patrick, we've passed 7.20, so you're, that, that report is actually on the— um, I understand I'm seeking so you'll leave. Able, yeah, you'll be able to speak to that in, in the future time. Yes, I'm seeking, so leave. seeking leave. Is leave granted? No, leave's not granted. Thank you. So the clerk. 
Government Business Order of the Day, Aged Care Legislation Amendment Improved Home Care Payment Administration No. 1 Bill 2020, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Kitching. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Um, and um, while it's Senator Keneally on the list, I, I'll be um, speaking. Labor will be supporting this bill. The purpose of the bill is to change the payment of home care subsidy to approved providers from being paid in advance to being paid in arrears. The Shadow Minister first spoke on this legislation in the other place back in March this year. Although Labor supports this bill, we do have concerns we wish to put on the record. To see any impact to service providers will be unacceptable. To see any impact to the services older Australians receive will be unacceptable. To see any upward impact on home care fees and charges to older Australians will be unacceptable. The change from advance to arrears payments was due to commence from June 2020. There is an increase in financial risk for some smaller service providers who don't have adequate cash flow to deal with the changes. Those home care providers currently losing money will face significant difficulties changing payment arrangements. Some service providers said as a result of cash flow pressures arising from changes, they may be reluctant to take on new consumers during the transition phase. Service providers are concerned if the payment arrangements increase administrative costs, then costs would be passed on too. The, Liberals, um, the Liberal government is renowned for piecemeal reform. It's almost four years since the government introduced its increasing choice in home care reforms. Almost four years on, and the question is what has been achieved for Australians choosing to receive aged care services in their home. These reforms have done nothing to address growing waiting lists. There are still more than 100,000 older Australians waiting for their approved home care package. Over the past two years, there have consistently been more than 100,000 older Australians waiting for the care they so desperately need. This is a national shame. Sadly, more than 30,000 older Australians died over three years waiting for their approved home care package. Over 32,000 Australians entered residential aged care prematurely over the past two years because they could not access approved home care packages. Wait times have blown out, but older Australians waiting for their high-level package are waiting almost three years to get the care that they, have, that they have been approved for. The median waiting time for older Australians going into residential aged care has grown under the Liberals and Nationals from just over a month to a five-month wait. The Productivity Commission's report on government services released this year revealed older Australians waiting for high-level home care packages are waiting almost three years for approved care. The report revealed that older Australians are waiting longer to enter residential aged care. The government has made improvements to the transparency of home care fees. However, home care recipients are still raising concerns about the rising cost of administrative and daily care. Then there is the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety's interim report handed down over a year ago. The report, titled Neglect, put forward a recommendation that required urgent action to address home care. The government's response was woefully inadequate. More than 100,000 older Australians waiting for their home care package, and the Morrison government's response was 10,000 home care packages. In the budget, the government announced 23,000 home care packages but only 2,000 are level four, the highest level of care. The actual number waiting for their approved level four package is 15,873. This is not acceptable. How can any Australian trust the Morrison government when it comes to aged care? The aged care system under the, this government is broken. We know that the Prime Minister, when he was Treasurer, cut $1.7 billion from the aged care budget. This has had an impact across residential aged care. These cuts have had a significant impact. Funding has only been announced when there have been under political pressure. The question is, why didn't the Morrison government put funding into the aged care system before COVID-19? The interesting thing is that the amount of funding the Prime Minister cut from the aged care budget almost matches the funding that he has had to put back in because of the deadly COVID-19 outbreaks. Let's have a look at how a lack of funding has impacted on older Australians, their family, and their families and carers. Well, we already know about the $1.7 billion cut from the aged care budget. I've already mentioned the 100,000 older Australians waiting in the never-ending queue for a package. In action on hundreds of recommendations from more than a dozen reviews, reports and inquiries, complaints about aged care doubled to almost 8,000 in just one year. The Morrison government has failed to fully implement even one aged care recommendation from a landmark report to stop elder abuse released in 2017. 
The Morrison government just, delivered just 38 emergency food packages to older Australians isolating because of COVID-19. On top of all of this, there is a failed Minister for Aged Care. He has lost the confidence of the Australian people in the parliament. We know the Morrison government did not have a plan for COVID-19, and this has been stated in the Royal Commission's special report into COVID-19. We know the Morrison government was not prepared for COVID-19 in aged care. Tragically, almost 700 older Australians died in residential aged care across Australia. Despite the early warnings, it didn't do enough. There was difficulty for aged care workers to access PPE, inadequate infection control training, no surge workforce strategy, no idea of how many aged care workers are working across multiple sites, reports not made public quickly enough. The Labor Party has an eight-step plan. It's clear, though, that the Morrison government has no plan for aged care. The leader of the Australian Labor Party outlined eight steps the Morrison government could take now to address the issues in aged care. And these include, one, minimum staffing levels in residential aged care, two, reduce the home care package waiting list so more people can stay in their homes for longer, ensure transparency and accountability of funding to support high quality care, that was number three, number four, independent measurement and public reporting as recommended by the Royal Commission this week. Five, ensure every residential aged care facility has adequate personal protective equipment. Six, better training for staff, including on infection control. Seven, a better surge workforce strategy. Eight, provide additional resources so the Aged Care Royal Commission can inquire specifically into COVID-19 across the sector while not impacting or delaying the handing down of the final report. We know that Australians are angry about this, Madam Acting Deputy President. They are upset. We know they don't trust the Morrison government or the current Minister for Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. They don't trust the Morrison government to act on the Royal Commission's final report. Labor will continue to hold the Morrison government to account, not only here in the parliament, but also publicly. Older Australians, their families and their carers deserve better. Thank you. Minister. Oh, sorry, Senator Seawitt, sorry. Rand didn't have um, me on it. I was left off. But I'm going to go and talk about aged care now because why would I miss such an opportunity? Um, I rise tonight to also contribute to the debate on the aged care legislation amendment, improved home care payment administration bill number one, um, bill uh, number one, bill 2020, um, which introduces a f the first phase of changes to the way home care subsidies are paid um, to, or payments are made to home care providers. This bill changes the payments of home care subsidies from being made to providers in advance to being made in arrears. It makes, and it's part of a, of a package of approach here. It, it makes a first step in addressing issues around the $750 million in unspent funds currently being held by home care providers. Unspent funds are problematic because they are used by providers as part of their working capital to generate in interest or have the funds held in trust by a third party. This phase of changes is set to commence from February 2021. Our understanding is that the majority of providers won't need to make changes to their payment systems to accommodate these changes. The government has stated that home care packages uh, providers I beg your pardon, who have concerns about the impact of these changes on their financial viability will be eligible for transition support funding and business advisory supports. The Australian Greens will be following this very closely to ensure providers who are financially vulnerable and operate in thin markets um, get the support they need to adjust to these changes. We are particularly concerned, obviously, um, for those providers that are providing, as I said, in um, in uh, thin markets. Obviously, that uh, is rural, regional, and remote uh, providers. So we're particularly concerned to make sure that um, they uh, aren't significantly impacted by these changes. We do support this approach. I've got to say. Um, because, as, as I said earlier, we, there are concerns about the large amount of money that is being held uh, in advance payments for providers, uh, by providers. We don't want to see providers failing because of poor transition uh, processes. Those that uh, uh, have poor processes 
un, un, may be affected by this. Um, they need to improve their processes, but it's the fact that we don't want to see providers unduly affected by these moves, despite the fact that we do support the basic idea of moving to a, a different form of payment. We will also be watching closely to ensure that changes from both phases, phase one and the next phase, do not adversely impact on the outcomes for older people and their families. And of course, that's absolutely critical. By changing the way that providers receive home care subsidies, this bill will introduce additional accountability and transparency to home care funding, something that's desperately needed. Exactly the same way we need that transparency and accountability uh, improved for residential. Um, care as well. This is critical in ensuring our aged care system better services and supports the needs of older Australians and that Australians know how the money that we're investing in home care, residential care and residential care, how they're being spent to support older Australians. It would be remiss of me um, not to point out the fact that we still need additional home care packages. There is absolutely no doubt that the waiting list is still far too long, and people have to wait far too long to get the right level of care that they need. Today I am calling on the government to act immediately to address this issue in home care. As, recommi as recommended by Council assisting the Royal Commission, we need to clear the home care package waiting list by December next year. Older Australians who need support at home should have universal access based on need, not based on capped places or funding. It is critical that we address these issues to ensure that older Australians can access the care they need when they need it and where they need it or where they want it. If they want to stay at home um, and uh, be it, it, receive care at home, they need to be able to access that at the level of that they need that care, not go on to a lower package and wait there until they can access a higher level of care. Having said that, the Greens do support this bill. We will, as I articulated, be watching it very carefully to ensure that uh, those providers that are uh, vulnerable, financially vulnerable, particularly in areas of thin markets, are uh, not adversely affected by these changes, but most particularly older Australians need to be getting a better deal out of this process and, it, and cannot be uh, worse off. We expect to see them in a uh, much better position. We will be supporting this bill but watching the transition process very carefully. Minister. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. And can I thank uh, colleagues for their contributions to the bill before the the Senate. The Aged Care Legislation Amendment Improved Home Care Payment Administration No. 1 Bill 2020 amends the way that, the home, care, that home care providers are paid government subsidy to address stakeholder concerns regarding unspent funds and to align home care arrangements with other government programs, such as the National Disability Insurance Scheme. This bill will amend the legislation such that an approved provider of home care will not receive a payment in advance but will be paid the monthly subsidy for a home care recipient on uh, lodgement of a claim with Services Australia after the end of each month. The government has introduced a second bill that will amend the legislation such that home care providers will only be paid, the, be, be paid subsidy for services rendered to a care recipient during a month with Services Australia retaining the unspent subsidy for which a care recipient is eligible each, in each month. This unspent subsidy will be available for a provider to draw down on behalf of a care recipient as services are provided in future. Uh, again, I thank uh, members for their contribution to the bill and commend the bill to the Senate. So the question is that the bills be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law in relation to home care payments and for related purposes. No amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I shall call the minister to move the third reading. Minister. I move that the bill be read a third time. The question is that the bills be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. 
Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law in relation to home care payments and for related purposes. Government business order of the day relating to the defence legislation amendment, enhancement of defence force response to emergencies bill 2020, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Ciccone. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I'd like to draw to your attention the state of the chamber. Quorum required. Uh, ring the bells. Thank you, Deputy, Acting Deputy President. I table a replacement explanatory memorandum relating to the Defence Legislation Amendment enhancing def of Defence Force response to Emergencies Bill 2020. Senator Wong. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to speak on the Defence Legislation Amendment Enhancement of Defence Force Response Bill to Emergencies. It's a bill which arises out of the call out of the 3,000 Australian Defence Force personnel during uh, the last summer's Black, uh, black Summer bushfires. Um, the ADF reviewed the event post uh, this call out, sought what lessons there were to be learnt, and worked out where things could have been done better. And the result is this legislation. So it is to the credit of defence that it has reviewed the contribution to the 1920 bushfire effort in this way, and have proposed these measures as a result. The bill represents a modest set of changes that improve the process of calling out uh, the ADF res uh, reserves, which a Labor will support. Uh, and I want to add my voice to thanking uh, those ADF personnel who were engaged in the bushfires, certainly both in my visits to the Adelaide Hills, uh, in the Cudley Creek fire and to Kangaroo Island, people were most appreciative of their presence. But let's be clear, Mr Morrison cannot blame the absence of this legislation for his catastrophic failure of leadership during the 1920 Black Summer bushfires, because that summer wasn't without warning. Scientists have been telling us for years that climate change increases the frequency and severity of extreme weather events and natural disasters, and unfortunately their predictions are true. When I was Minister for Climate Change, I told this place on the 26th of November 2009, and I quote, we are likely to see an increase in very extreme fire weather days. That is one of the effects of climate change that was documented again by the Bushfire CRC, the Bureau of Meteorology and the CSIRO in 2007, when they said that very extreme fire weather days now occur on average once every two to 11 years at most sites. By 2020, they may occur twice as often, and by 2050, they may occur four to five times as often. And this is science that is two years old. That's what I said in 2009. 
In government, we funded the Climate Change Adaptation Program, a $126 million program at that point, which was designed to help Australians better understand and manage the risks as a consequence of climate change, including extreme weather events and bushfires. But the Morrison government didn't want to understand because then it would have had to have acted. In 2019, the Bushfire and Natural Hazard Cooperative Research Centre published a severe bushfire outlook for last summer, and that was ignored by the Morrison government too. Immediately after the federal election last year, in May 2019, retired fire chiefs around Australia warned that this 1920 summer would be particularly dangerous, and they sought to meet with the Morrison government, and the government refused. On the 22nd of November, 2019, the Leader of the Opposition wrote to the PM and asked him to convene the Council of Australian Governments in order to discuss the impending bushfire season and the severity that was being presented, and the, government, the Morrison government did not listen to that request either, nor did it act upon it. You see, warnings could have been listened to. Action could have been taken. Action could have been taken by the government in the lead-up to the 1920 bushfire season. It had promised an emergency relief fund, $200 million every year, which was ready to provide funding that could have been used to reduce risk, but not a cent was delivered. The National Aerial Firefighting, Firefighter Centre was asking for more funding back in September 2019, but nothing was delivered. With this bill, the Morrison government wants people to believe that the main problem with last summer's bushfires was, was that defence reservists couldn't be called out fast enough. But you know the much bigger problem is the refusal of Mr Morrison to listen and his refusal to act despite warning after warning after warning. His derelict response then was, I don't hold a hose, mate. He cannot now point to this bill and say, because I didn't have this last summer, I wasn't able to act. Mr Morrison's failure to take responsibility, his failure to lead, had nothing to do with the absence of this legislation at that time. The fact is that when Australia most needed national leadership, Mr Morrison was absent. And even today, entering another summer bushfire season, Mr Morrison still hasn't delivered a cent from this $4 billion disaster recovery and resilience fund and still has not acquired a national aerial firefighting fleet. Last week, as bushfires burned, he was holed up in the lodge with his official photographer doing daggy dad quarantine photo ops and posing in board shorts and spinning on his new exercise bike. Well, Mr Morrison spins while Australia burns. For decades, the ADF has supported Australians in their time of greatest need and has done so magnificently. When states and territories have asked for assistance, the Australian Defence Force has been there, providing confidence and relief. In the case of the summer bushfires, this assistance was being provided before January 2020. The 4th of January 2020, when the formal call out occurred. Now, instead of summoning the courage to stare down the climate change denialists in his own party to end the climate wars, to act on the climate change that Australians can see, feel, and smell, Mr. Morrison is trying to hide behind the courage of the ADF. You see, as valiant as they are, our Defence Forces cannot solve this problem alone. Adapting to a changing climate, and avoiding the worst of climate change, averting the worst of climate change, is not the Defence Force's job. It's the leader of the country's job. It's the Prime Minister's job. What Australia needs from Mr Morrison is a recognition that our climate, change risk is change, our climate is changing and bushfire risk is increasing. Australians need him to deliver on bushfire preparedness. They need him to deliver on resources like aerial bombers to fight fires. And, they need Australia, and Australians need Mr Morrison to take action to avoid the worst impacts of unchecked climate change. A key measure in this bill is to align the immunities that are held by the ADF with the immunities held by civil emergency response agencies in moments of crises. When it was first introduced, concerns were raised about these provisions. Following inquiry by the Senate Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Legislation Committee and a request by our Shadow Defence Minister, amendments have been made to the explanatory memorandum. As a consequence, there is now a firm statement that all references in the bill's provisions to assistance in relation to a natural disaster or other emergency relate only to defence, assistance to the civil community, and thus, as a consequence, do not authorise the use of force or other coercive powers. There is also confirmation that proposed immunity provisions apply only to individual defence members and not to the Commonwealth. So there is still an avenue for remedy should a member of the public suffer loss or damage as a result of the assistance rendered by defence. 
It is also explicit that immunity is not automatic for both defence for both foreign and domestic forces. So, given that, we do recognise the government's efforts to address the concerns raised during the course of the examination of this bill by the Parliament. However, no legislation will make up for the lack of leadership from a Prime Minister who is interested only in announcements and photo ops, rather than the leadership needed to deliver on bushfire preparedness for Australians. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Steele, John. Thank you, Acting Deputy Chair. Um, as I uh, commence my contribution to this discussion, I want to just briefly uh, uh, shout out and, and pay tribute to my uh, fabulous and diligent uh, policy adviser, Andrea Pizzi, for whom I owe a great deal of debt for a lot of uh, the research work that went into the Greens' position on this. I shall now endeavour uh, not to mangle the notes that she has given me in the contribution to this bill's discussion. The Defence Legislation Amendment Enhancement of Defence Force Response uh, to Emergencies Bill of 2020, uh, very much contrary to its name, does nothing uh, to enhance defence's capacity to respond to natural disasters and other emergencies. Beyond the provisions around superannuation, the bill serves to reduce uh, oversight of call-out processes and grant the ADF personnel and indeed foreign defence forces personnel and foreign police criminal and civil uh, liability immunities. It is important that the ADF have the ability to provide assistance to, the civil, uh, uh, to civil emergency response capabilities in large-scale uh, natural disaster responses. Um, these, are, these circumstances have uh, and will continue to occur, notwithstanding uh, the passage of this legislation. The Defence Assistance to the Civil Community uh, DAC, will continue to stipulate the role of the ADF when providing assistance in domestic natural disasters. Uh, we note evidence given by the Royal Commission into natural, natural disaster arrangements uh, by officials of the ADF, which state that the DAC arrangements were sufficiently flexible and effective during bushfire, uh, Operation Bushfire Assist, and therefore question elements of this bill, uh, which state otherwise. We express uh, here in the Green significant concern about the provisions of the bill which relate to immunities, uh, the constitutional sources of power, and the processes around uh, calling out reserve members, and indeed for overall human rights implications. We do not accept the characterisation made in the course of the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Committee inquiry into this legislation that the concerns raised by constitutional, legal and policy experts uh, are ephemeral uh, to the substance of this legislation. As demonstrated by the expert evidence given to the committee, uh, these issues are in fact central to this legislation. The Greens do not support the passage of this bill. We do not believe that the bill is sufficiently justified. The constitutional and civil liberty stakeholders, uh, which uh, uh, risks uh, and the risks to ADF members articulated by experts and stakeholders during the course of the inquiry into this legislation, are significant and unmitigated uh, by the evidence given to the committee during the course of the inquiry. I note that the Minister has circulated a replacement explanatory memorandum which attempts to address some of the issues uh, brought up during the inquiry. However, I note, as did many others during the hearing and in, during the hearing and in their submissions, uh, that ultimately the changes that need to be made uh, should be made in the form of amending the legislation itself because ultimately decisions, legal decisions made in relation to key aspects of this bill will come down to the letter of the law. We do, however, uh, note the superannuation-related benefits outlined in Schedule 3 and agree that it is necessary and important to change uh, these sections to ensure that reservists are appropriately compensated uh, for their service. Now, let me go uh, to the substantive uh, issues that we have with the bill. 
And now this bill went, underwent a very quick inquiry process through the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Committee, with an extraordinarily small window of opportunity to explore the deeply complex issues that exist in this space. I would like to commend the many community members, submitters and those who gave evidence to the inquiry uh, for their contributions to this conversation. I would also like to put on the record that this inquiry process left more unanswered questions in relation to the issues brought up. Uh, particularly, <coughs> let us first go uh, to uh, the issue of immunities offered by the bill. Now, contrary to the evidence given by departmental officials during the hearing, uh, we do not agree that the granting of both criminal and civil immunities to, the AD to ADF uh, personnel, foreign defence personnel and foreign police contained within this bill appropriately balances the rights of civilians to legal remedy uh, for neglect and damaging behaviour. It is our position that the Defense, Department of Defence was not able to sufficiently address the concerns of the considerable number of submitters who contested the provision of broad immunities. We do not uh, support the extension of any immunities to foreign forces and police. We note the main committee report outlines the number, a number of submissions which recommend against including this provision, and we agree with their view. Uh, further, there is a significant lack of clarity uh, contained within this bill in relation to what legal remedies are available to civilians in circumstances where ADF and foreign personnel have acted inconsistently with their obligations to provide assistance. This matter of requires further consideration and clarification to ensure that the right to access the justice system is well understood and reflected in the legislation. Uh, we must also look at the constitutionality uh, of, the um, of the immunity provisions contained in this legislation. Um, we are very concerned uh, that the issues brought up in evidence to the committee by constitutional law expert Professor Anne Toomey uh, linked her substantial concerns uh, with the constitutionality of this legislation to the immunity provisions themselves. In her submission, she stated that, and I quote, this constitutional anomaly uh, will be aggravated by the proposed section 1233AA uh, of the Defence Act. It will provide uh, immunity to all members of the Defence Force, both regular and reserves, when acting in the performance of their duties, if the duties are in respect of the provisions of assistance to prepare and uh, or for or respond to natural disasters or other emergencies. But this raises the question of when such matters are within a member's duty, which goes back to the question of whether there is constitutional power to deal with such matters. Uh, in her evidence to the committee, Professor Toomey elaborates on this point, stating that the problem here is that the immunity is tied to the word duties in the legislation, and that these duties do not formally exist if they are not supported adequately by the constitutional powers. So I think that in respect to the immunity, it is actually the, uh, probably in many cases uh, just not effective. And now, the evidence given that the constitutional ambiguities that surround DAC and the source of power that defence relies on uh, to determine the duties of the ADF personnel uh, are not settled uh, constitutional matters and uh, directly interact with the proposed provisions within this bill. We are concerned about the significant implications uh, that this com complicated legal matter would have for civilians, ADF, who may find themselves uh, not pr uh, protected uh, and subject of legal matters and actions, and more broadly, we are concerned that these complications, this complicates an already messy area of the law. It makes the problem worse. We must now turn to proportionality in the issues of good faith. Uh, we are concerned here in the Greens that the granting of immunity for criminal liability. Um, unacceptably provides protections for ADF uh, personnel and foreign personnel beyond those granted to all states and territory uh, emergency responders. We are of the view that the ADF personnel would be undertaking uh, fun uh, fundamentally civilian tasks uh, in the circumstances 
uh, that this bill uh, concerns itself with, and we do not think that it is necessary or appropriate to, wa to uh, water down uh, the rule of law. Uh, further, we note uh, uh, that immunity provisions granted to state and territory emergency responders do not uh, include immunity from civil and criminal liability in the majority of cases. Whilst we agree that the ADF personnel should be appropriately protected in order to carry out their duties, we do not see that these uh, should be over and above those granted to first responders and state-based emergency personnel. And this was also put to us in the clearest of terms during the course of the inquiry. Now, in relation to the scope of natural disaster and other emergency offered in the bill, I would like to take the opportunity to point out that the proposed subsection 123AA subsection 2 provides that the minister may, in writing, uh, direct the ADF to provide assistance in relation to natural disasters or other, uh, another emergency. In our view, the term other emergency is deliberately undefined and left uh, to be un left to unacceptably broad interpretation. We note that the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Main Committee report alludes to concerns made by a number of submissions, and we agree that there needs to be a greater definition and explanation of what circumstances other emergencies could be understood as. Uh, now, in relation to the issue of the non-use of force, uh, we are deeply concerned that the bill does not prescribe the, the non-use of force in the legislation. Despite evidence from defence during the inquiry that indicates that this bill does not permit the use of force by defence personnel when assisting in natural disasters and other emergencies, there are significant and justifiable concerns from other submitters to the inquiry and in the community more broadly that remain unanswered and should this legislation uh, remain unanswered should this legislation not explicitly rule out the use of uh, rule out the use uh, of force. As, per, as submitted by uh, Professor Toomey once again, if you wish to confine the legislation in a way that makes it clear that the type of actions and duties relating to civil aid to the community are not to involve coercive action, which indeed is clear in DAC then you could well say so in the legislation if you so chose. And we will be giving the Senate the opportunity to so choose uh, via one of our amendments later in the debate. Uh, further, we are concerned by the position that defence has taken when questioned on whether they will or will not prescribe the use of non-force. In an answer given uh, particularly in relation to an answer given on notice, which I do not believe I probably have enough time to go into in detail. Um, Professor Toomey and other submitters uh, made it very clear, and I think this needs to be treated with the utmost seriousness, and I would have expected it to be uh, by those so-called conservatives in this place, whose political tradition uh, once harked back to a deep reverence for the maintenance and clarity of constitutional issues, uh, that the head of power under which DAC activities are, uh, are uh, managed by the executive is not a settled issue in any uh, form or sense of it. Uh, neither, by the way, uh, is uh, it a settled issue of what is exactly meant by good faith. Uh, which is a broader uh, conundrum facing at this legislature, which we seem unable to confront. The Commonwealth has no settled definition uh, of what is meant by uh, good faith and actions taken therein. Um, I think I will end uh, by, by doing two things. Firstly, I will foreshadow uh, that we will move a number of amendments during the committee stage of this legislation that will deal with the various human rights uh, definitional uh, and other issues outlined in the bill, as well as giving the Senate the opportunity to split this legislation uh, so that we may well consider the superannuation element separately uh, to the uh, other questions contained within this legislation. But I will end with the uh, ever caustic and incredibly intellectually uh, compelling words 
uh, Professor Anne Toomey uh, in relation to uh, the central contention of this bill, which is that it is needed, uh, that it is needed uh, to enable the fast call-out of uh, reserve uh, defence force personnel uh, because of the unwieldiness of the Federal Executive Council. Uh, and I quote, if the Commonwealth Government has not yet worked out the means by which uh, of instantly contacting all members of the Council to inquire of their immediate availability for meeting, then it is an indictment on its management. Getting a person to sit down and ring each of them in turn is frankly absurd. It is hardly an excuse for cha changing legislation. Rather, it should be a reason for changing the communication methods. In, offer, in any case, uh, to state the obvious, if the situation is so urgent that there is no time to go through the system to organise a meeting of the Federal Ele Executive Council, the minister could be legitimately Thank satisfied you, Stewart, uh, John, that there are other expired. Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I'm just going to make a short contribution on this bill because I know we have a lot of legislation to get through tonight. Uh, and I indicated at the outset that Labor does support this legislation. We recognise that it will improve processes uh, that the government needs to undertake in order to call out reserves uh, to assist in a natural disaster situation. Uh, and I also want to begin by thanking the ADF personnel who assisted so greatly in the Black Summer bushfires last year and who have done so in previous natural disasters as well. I had the great privilege uh, last year during the fires of visiting the Richmond Air Base uh, to the west of Sydney to thank Air Force personnel uh, for the efforts that they had been putting in. I was joined on that occasion by the Deputy Labor Leader and Shadow Defence Minister Richard Miles and also the local Federal MP Susan Templeman, the member for Macquarie. Uh, and in the same day, we also visited some of the Army Reserves who were clearing trees uh, that had fallen down across roadways through the Blue Mountains so that life could, in some way, try to get back to normal for people who had been affected by the bushfires. Uh, we thanked the Air Force and Army personnel for their efforts. Some of those people, uh, it was their job uh, to do what they were doing there. Uh, but for many others, especially the reserves, of course, they had given up other jobs in order to come and help their fellow Australians. So all of our nation owes all of our ADF personnel a debt of gratitude for the work that they undertook as part of fighting the Black Summer bushfires. Um, as I say, Labor does support this legislation, but we shouldn't kid ourselves that this is going to avoid future bushfires or the future the failures. Uh, similar to what we saw from this Prime Minister and this government in last year's bushfires. It is well recognised right around the country and indeed around the world that this Prime Minister and this government comprehensively failed to prepare for last year's bushfires. They failed with the response and they have, over the course of this year, continued to fail with the recovery from these bushfires as well. Uh, so, as much as the government might like to say, um, that improving the processes by which the reserves can be called out will make all the difference. I have no doubt that it will assist in terms of fighting future bushfires, but we shouldn't pretend that that is the only thing that is needed to keep Australians safe from the sort of disasters that we saw last year. We know very well that the Prime Minister failed to prepare. He failed to even have meetings with people who just wanted to warn him about what was coming and what should be done to avoid it. And he failed to take the various steps that were needed to make sure that Australians were kept safe. And as a result, we saw the consequences of those failures. And tragically, we're actually seeing it from this government again. You really would think that after what they went through last year and what all Australians went through last year with those bushfires, that the government would have learned a lesson and would be taking every step possible to make sure that we avoid similar disasters and avoid the kind of loss of life, loss of property, loss of fauna, loss of species that we saw from last year's bushfires. We know very well from advice that has been given to this government by the Bureau of Meteorology repeatedly, repeatedly this year that we face this year another terrible disaster situation, probably not so much in the form of bushfires, although there are serious bushfire risks in some parts of the country. But we know that due to La Nina weather conditions, the north of our country, particularly North Queensland, faces more cyclones and more intense cyclones than what they normally do. 
Now, cyclones are to some extent a way of life in summers in northern Australia, whether it be North Queensland, the Northern Territory or Western Australia. But when you've got advice consistently coming from the Bureau of Meteorology, along with other scientific and weather experts, that this year is going to be worse, you really would think that you would do everything possible to keep Australians safe and minimise the damage that is coming that way, our way. But that is not what this government is doing. Just like last year, they are ignoring the warnings and they are failing to take the steps that are needed to keep Australians safe. I'll just give a couple of examples. The, probably the best example is this government's failure to spend a single cent from the $4 billion emergency response fund that it announced in last year's budget, 18 months ago. It set aside $4 billion for a disaster response and recovery fund that could be used to repair damage, to pay grants to people who had suffered loss, but importantly also be used uh, to spend on projects, on all sorts of prevention measures that would limit the damage from future disasters. And even though this government has had those funds available now uh, for nearing a year, they have not spent a cent. Think of the number of cyclone shelters that could have been spent over the last 12 months. Think of the number of evacuation centres from bushfire regions that could have been spent. Think of the improvements to communications technology that could have been uh, achieved if the government had just been prepared to spend anything from this fund that the, that the opposition voted with the government uh, to, to create. But instead, uh, whether it's due to penny-pinching, penny negligence, uh, a lack of care, this government has not spent anything of that fund and consequently we don't have the preventative measures in place that could have been delivered. And if we do see those cyclones hit this year, if we do see bushfires hit in places like southwest and western Australia or western New South Wales, as is forecast, we will have to ask what could have been avoided if the government had just used those funds that were available. It's not as if the government needs to go and find new money. This money is in the budget. It was announced. It was provided for. But yet again, the Prime Minister doesn't actually care once the announcement is made. He's got his headlines, he's got his photos with army reserves, he's got his photos with fire, uh, fire chiefs uh, and fire volunteers, doesn't care about the delivery, and as a result, Australians are yet again being put at risk by this Prime Minister. The other example I'll give is this government's failure to implement the, re the recommendation of its own Bushfires Royal Commission to create a national aerial firefighting fleet. Again, last year we saw what happened when the government didn't take steps to make sure that we had the water bombing aircraft that we needed to put out fires and prevent new fires starting. We saw what happened when the government had to scramble around and try and bring in planes uh, from overseas to try to put out fires and found that those planes were unavailable because they were still needed in other countries. And now we have a recommendation from the government's own Bushfires Royal Commission saying that it should create our own national sovereign aerial firefighting fleet. What does this government do? Noted. Noted. And leaves it for the states, even though the Royal Commission has said that that is not an adequate measure uh, to make sure that we are well prepared for firefighting. And of course, the elephant in the room, this government continues to do nothing about climate change. Now, whatever anyone thinks about climate change, it is coming. You've got every possible scientific expert, including the Bureau of Meteorology. Well, with respect, Senator Hanson, if I'm going to listen to anyone about climate change, I think I'll listen to the Bureau of Meteorology rather than you. Stick to what you know, rather than, and, and we should all not ignore the advice of the Bureau of Meteorology the CSIRO, who actually know a few things about this. And what they tell us consistently is that climate change is real, it is happening, and it is going to lead to more natural disasters into the future. Now, Senator Hanson, if you're really a senator for Queensland, you should actually care about that. You should care about people in our state who are going to be facing more cyclones in the future, more floods in the future, more bushfires in the future, senator, and we should all take steps to, to, to fix that. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. So, in summary, what we need from the government is more than just announcements. We need more than a headline about the creation of a new uh, emergency response fund. We need more than a photo op 
about aerial firefighting. We need more than false claims that this government is taking action on climate change. We actually need real action on all of these things to make sure that Australians are kept safe. We commend the government on bringing this legislation forward. We will vote for it. We have secured amendments from the government, particularly to the explanatory memorandum, to, to address a number of the issues that the Greens have raised and that other civil society groups have raised to make sure that these powers can't be abused into the future. But we cannot kid ourselves into thinking that this is all that needs to be done. There are practical steps that this government could be taking right now, using funds that it has actually made available for this express purpose to keep Australians safe. And I can tell you, if we see these cyclones hit, if we see more bushfires hit, we're going to be reeling out every single time that we've warned the government that they could have done something about this. They've really got to get moving. We're running out of time. We're already seeing bushfires around the country, and cyclones are only weeks away. Time is running out. It's time to do more than the announcements. It's time to actually deliver. Thank you, Senator Watt. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. Well, I can't let that go unannounced of what um, Senator Watt just had to say and actually blame the government for the bushfires that have actually happened in this country, which have been happening for centuries. And the whole fact is, if you've really had a good look at it, because state governments and councils have not allowed for clearing or lo looking after the fuel that's lying on the floor, because you couldn't do anything about it. Sorry, because Senator you Hanson. Clear it. Resume your seat for one moment. Senator Steele, John. On a uh, point of order on relevance, Chair, this is not relevant to the contents of the legislation we're discussing at all. Mr. Still, John, that's not a point of order. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. I think it's very much a point of order because we're talking about defence personnel coming from other countries to help us fight our bushfires in this country, and that's what it's all about, about the, the problems that we have in Australia. And the fact is that Senator Watt stands up and he makes accusations about this, blaming the government. It is not the government's fault. If you have arsonists out there, you've got people setting the bushfires. If you have local government and state governments not clearing the fuel from the floor, of course we're going to have bushfires. We always have. It's not about just climate change, and we know that for a fact. Now, what I'd like to say here is what's important to the bill is about those firefighters and those people that help us. Australia is a land of extremes. It seems we are never far from a natural emergency, whether it is a bushfire, whether it's bushfires like we experienced late last year and into the Senator early Hansen, this year. Can you just resume your seat for one moment, please? Senator Steele John. Thank you, Chair. It's a deep concern that I draw your attention to the state of the chamber. Quorum required. Bring the bills. Senator Roberts, you can't leave once you're in.
quorums present. Stop the bells. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. For all the people here that have come in, thank you very much, because the Greens intend to call this constantly all the time to shut down time. So I suggest, instead of sitting in your chambers, I suggest that you sit here because they intend to do this constantly all the time, shut down time in this parliament so that they can't so you cannot deal with the legislation that is here before this parliament. So this, Senator how, this is how bloody pathetic they are. Senator Hanson, would you like to resume your speech? I will, gladly. What we have here is the bushfires on Fraser Island's latest such emergency that has hit this nation. It shows how quickly an emergency can escalate. It has now destroyed approximately 82,500 hectares of the national park. About half the island has been burned. This whole legislation, um, I, had a, I had a speech here, and I'm not going to because I deliver this. I think it's important to the Australian people to know what this legislation is doing. They're concerned about the um, foreign police or foreign military and everyone coming out to the country and they won't and uh, that they won't be held accountable. That is not. The bill introduced some streamlining to enable the the faster activation of our army reservists in times of emergency, including civil emergencies, as well as for disaster preparedness, recovery and response. For our ADF reservists, it provides clarity in regard to their call-out responsibilities and remuneration. It also ensures immunity from civil and criminal liability for ADF personnel reservists, authorised Commonwealth employees and for those military personnel and police from other nations while they participate in dealing with our emergency or the recovery. While there has been some concern raised that visiting forces should not receive immunity from both civil and criminal liability, the Centre for Military and Security Law has assured these provisions are in line with those of various state and territory jurisdictions. The Law Council of Australia also noted the safeguards that the immunity only covered acts done in good faith in accordance with the specific written direction from the Minister for Defence. The Security Committee for Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade legislation recently expressed the view that foreign defence service personnel assisting during natural disasters should not have less protection than members of the ADF if they are called upon to respond in the same way, and this seems fair enough. As everyone knows, I am a patriotic Australian and I am a very strong opponent of any measures that places Australia's sovereignty and safety at risk. Our sovereignty must not be compromised. The immunity provided in this bill is clear in that it applies only to those who, in good faith performance of their duties, provide assistance before, during and after an emergency, and only if that assistance is directed by the minister or his or her delegated authority. The bill provides no immunity for any deliberate crime or misconduct, as has been a concern of some Australians. It provides protection only for incidents that occur while performing actual tasks in good faith linked to the disaster response and emergency support initiatives. The immunities being granted to defence personnel include that they may damage private property in order to preserve life. For example, I understand that they may commandeer a truck or backburn on land in order to protect the greater good. And in such situations, accidents happen. The immunities will give our ADF personnel and visiting forces the peace of mind to carry out the work needed to address the emergency. The ADF also noted the example where the personnel's tasks might lawfully include transporting evacuees from a bushfire zone. The bill would operate to protect individual ADF members, not the Commonwealth, from civil liability if the, in the event an evacuee is injured while being transported. What is also clear is that if defence personnel or foreign forces acted in bad faith in any way, then they would lose their immunity immediately and would be subject to prosecution under Australian law. The value of the work done by Australian defence personnel in these emergency situations can be can't be underestimated, along with the input of the foreign forces. In the fires last year and early this year, 3,094 homes were destroyed. More than 1,000 other infrastructures were, and 24 million hectares of bushland were destroyed across New South Wales, Victoria, Queensland, the ACT, Western Australia and South Australia. 
which shows just how important it is to have humans ready for action when and where they are needed. About 6,500 full-time and more than 2,500 part-time ADF personnel were involved in the bushfire efforts, along with 450 personnel from overseas. In Queensland, we may well be calling on the help of such personnel sooner rather than later. And not only that, the other disasters, and I understand the time frame, so I've made my point quite clear because people have been concerned and ringing my office concerned about this legislation. And I made it quite clear there that um, immunity only goes so far and they will not be covered in everything. So it's, it's while well in the line of duty of actually helping Australia through these emergencies, which I think is very important that we do protect them in certain cases. But I've, I must say that. Um, you know, going back to Senator Watt's comments here in the chamber and regards to lack of action from the, from the Prime Minister, I think um, in reflection of what happened last Christmas and those homes and the people that lost their properties, it was so distressful to them. We've seen it across many states. But the whole fact is that we have to accept that a lot of, and I stated this before, a lot of councils and states have not allowed for backburning to happen. They've closed up national parks. They haven't allowed for the, the, the proper um, maintenance on these properties. They've even stopped people from actually cutting down bushland and trees close to their homes to protect their own home sites. This has been pure negligence from our councils and these people that are in there and saying you shouldn't be touching bush, you shouldn't protect your own homes. This is very important to um, understand this and it's no good laying blame just on one person who was the Prime Minister at the time. This has gone on for, for a long time. And um, I just feel that, you know, under this legislation, um, it's, it is important that we do protect because we rely on other people from coming from other countries to help us in times of disaster. That's what being friends and neighbours in this global world that we have, as we actually help other countries through their disasters as well. And to blame it on climate change is a load of BS. You know, climate change has been happening for millions of years. The fact is because we are actually now um, recording temperature changes, and they say on record, and that's what you hear in this chamber all the time because it's on record. The record is only the last 100 years, and they change that to suit their own agenda. The fact is climate has been changing due to natural causes, not because of human emissions, and that has not been proven. So when you talk about disasters in the nation, they will go on for centuries to come. And if you think that, and you listen to scientists, you know, the earth is warming, glaciers are still growing, they're not, you're not going any um, less. And I think that people really understand, must understand that we've got to stop using all this as a political football and speak the truth because it, it is concerning people, and I hear it all the time from the Greens with no evidence. They won't debate Malcolm Roberts. They won't you know, put the science, the true science up. It's all right to scaremonger. That happens all the time. Well, this is the House of Review on legislation. This is where the truth must be exposed. It's not about scaremongering that goes on in this country. It's about telling the truth. And if you can't debate and you don't know what the hell you're talking about, then don't scaremonger in this country any longer and put fear into people. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. I'd like to put forward a simple proposition to Australians when they think about uh, our armed forces. Um, we call them defence forces, uh, and the word defence comes to mind. Would you prefer to have your uh, serving personnel in your armed forces? Uh, geared to going on foreign adventures and fighting foreign wars, uh, as we have done essentially for the last 15 or 20 years, uh, very closely uh, joined at the hip to the United States, our allies in the ANZUS Treaty, uh, including the, the longest running conflict in our nation's history in, Af in Afghanistan. And we've obviously seen some of the complications that have arisen from that in recent times? Or would you prefer to have your personnel geared up to help fight the biggest threat to our national security? The biggest threat to our national security. Senator Molan. And I would say I would, oh, I'm happy to take that interjection of Senator Molan. Um, 
Absolutely, uh, it's not a case. It's not a case of either or. It's a case of where you prioritise the role, the future role for the ADF. Now, Senator Molan is a climate denier. Uh, he comes in here. He did, uh, like Pauline, Senator Pauline Hanson and Senator Malcolm Roberts. He's of the same ilk. He's a climate denier, yet he's in government, which of course makes him a lot more dangerous. Now, I think he would dispute Senator that Senator Wish Wilson, resume your seat. Senator Molan. Uh, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Uh, uh, of course, uh, as uh, the Senator said, I would deny that. I do deny it. I do not deny Are climate change. Are you taking change. a point of order, Senator Molan? That Senator Roberts. Point of order, Madam Deputy What's Chairman? your point of order, Senator that, uh, Roberts? I am not, I'm being falsely labelled a climate denier. I do not deny climate. Uh, that is not a point of order, Senator Roberts. Senator Roberts. Me, Madam Acting Deputy Chairman. still not a point of order, Senator Roberts. Thank you. Senator Wish Wilson. Very spurious points of orders, I may uh, add, Acting Deputy President. It's a like worth a try. Clearly touched a raw nerve with these these senators in here tonight, which is always, a, always a, an interesting, uh, interesting proposition. Um, but obviously what, what concerns Senator Molan, to you, to you, Chair, is that climate change is the biggest threat to our national security. If you think about threats to livelihoods, threats to property, threats to our economy, threats to our communities, what bigger threat is there than our changing climate, our warming planet, the extreme weather events, be they the horrendous bushfires we've seen that are driven by this climate emergency, be they floods, torrential floods, be they cyclones, be they the loss of our critical habitat, like on the Great Barrier Reef or the giant kelp forests that uh, the commercial fishing industry and our communities rely on in my home state of Tasmania. That's the biggest threat to our national security. Now, don't just take my word for it. There's plenty of people and experts out there saying the same thing. I know you won't take my word for it, Senator Mullen. I, 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 I understand that. Um, I don't think you take uh, any scientist's word on climate change uh, at its face value either, because you are a climate denier, Senator Mullen, regardless of what you, of what you say. Um, or a climate sceptic, perhaps, might be a, a more politically correct term to you, to you, uh, de to you acting deputy president. Uh, climate sceptic, climate, climate denier, denier of science. Uh, actually, it was uh, previous Liberal Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull that I thought delivered a fantastic uh, rebuttal to uh, The Australian uh, on Q&A a few weeks ago, where he said, if you deny climate, it's like denying physics. I mean, did you fly here in an aeroplane? You understand physics. I mean, we're talking about the same fundamental concepts, and yet these people have turned climate into a matter of identity, as Mr. Turnbull uh, so rightly pointed out. They've turned it into a matter of ideology and identity, but actually, it's about physics. It's about science, and it really is appalling that in this day and age we're actually having these political debates when the community uh, and the rest of the world is moving on and actually recognising the fact that our planet is warming and that is uh, having an impact on us and it's putting us at risk. And so we get back to the debate and climate change, global warming is the biggest threat to our national security. And I personally believe that the Defence Forces have a huge role to play in this country and in our region, whether it's providing aid uh, or assistance or expertise on so many different levels. So, going back three or four years, Acting Deputy President, I initiated a Senate inquiry. Um, the Greens didn't chair that, but we, we sat in on that through Defence, Foreign Affairs and Trade. And we actually looked at this. We looked at the preparedness of the Australian Defence Force to, on climate change and on a climate emergency. We took evidence from experts uh, all around the country who talked about the threat climate change poses. At a minimum, you got out of these people, and some of, the, some of these people uh, Senator Molan would know very well, they all recognise climate change is a threat multiplier. That is, it is a threat multiplier. Some went a lot further than that and were prepared to say it actually is 
the biggest threat to our national security. So I support a more active use of the Defence Forces. And I've got to say, like a lot of Australians, I felt very proud uh, seeing our Navy evacuating Australians off beaches in January this year. Uh, while I was down the coast at Bichino, we had ash falling on our heads as we were walking along the beach uh, on New Year's Day. We were also worried about fires on the east coast of Tasmania. And we had a look. Everybody was glued to what was going on just here on the south coast of New South Wales and all up and down the coast in the months preceding. The fact that we had to use our armed forces to evacuate Australian civilians off beaches quite extraordinary. And, and I recognise the role the armed forces have played uh, over this climate emergency we've seen this summer. And it will only get worse, Acting Deputy President. Uh, it is not going to get better. If the Bureau of Meteorology is telling us that, under current business-as-usual scenarios, we're on a three to four degree warming uh, trajectory by the end of this century, we're in really serious strife. And uh, sadly, Senator Molan, you and I probably won't be around when the worst effects of this are being felt by our children and grandchildren. But we're going to leave them that legacy. So the Greens support a much more active role for the Australian Defence Forces in terms of uh, realigning their training, their capabilities, their procurement around a whole range of different things, from uh, potentially looking at remote area firefighting, like we see with the New Zealand Defence Forces. We want to see the Australian government, as we debated in here last week, buy our own water bomber fleet. Uh, I did dare suggest that perhaps the Air Force might consider, seeing as we've got very good pilots, consider flying those aircraft as well if we were going to buy them. But it could just as easily be given to state emergency services. But either way, uh, I think this is a discussion we should be having at a national level. We call our defence forces defence forces for a reason, but it seems that they are offence forces. They spend all their time, all the procurements based around fighting in foreign theatres of war, uh, endless wars, uh, for what strategic political objective, I don't know, when we clearly have a clear and present danger here in Australia and in our region and a need to employ our service personnel to protect Australians and to protect our region. Now, saying that, we've got to be extremely careful that we get the balance right in how we legislate that and what kind of powers we give the government to call out uh, our defence forces. And as uh, has been outlined here by my colleague tonight, uh, Senator Stiljohn, who's participated in this inquiry, he's raised a, a number of significant issues that the Greens want to see amended. And if we don't get that balance right, then we risk unintended consequences in the future. And we certainly risk uh, undermining public confidence in the rollout of our defence forces in the future. So um, I wanted to put that on the table. I think this is a really important discussion. I commend the government for uh, their increased uh, rollout of the defence forces over summer. I was very proud of what they achieved, uh, Senator Reynolds. Um, however, uh, we don't believe you've got the balance right here. But this is a conversation we need to continue to have, and uh, we're we're very. Are we going to committee stage? We are. Indeed. Well, we're going to committee stage, so we'll talk more in detail on our amendments. Then, thank you. Uh, Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I'd like to very sincerely thank all senators who have contributed to the debate on this important bill, uh, both here in the chamber this evening and also during the committee phase. And I commend uh, this bill to the chamber and I seek leave to have my comments uh, noted in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. Those of the opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Cl Clark. The bill for an act to amend the law relating to the Australian Defence Force and for related purposes.
Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Senator Still John. Thank you, Chair. I've got a number. Of, I just want to seek the guidance of the Chair for a moment. Um, I've got a number of amendments which I'm looking to, to uh, move and uh, to bring to a vote. Um, would that be the appropriate place to do so here? just want to make sure I don't miss my opportunity. It's appropriate to commence with your amendments at this point. Cheat. Uh, 1137 uh, to begin with, if that's okay. Um, and I'll uh, speak to it now. Um, so, uh, sorry, I seek leave uh, to uh, speak to the amendment. No, you don't need leave. You can speak to the amendment now that you've moved it. I thank you. Um, I, no, that's all right, Pete. Um, so, uh, the aim of this amendment, uh, let me just state it uh, clearly. Uh, we agree uh, with concerns raised by the Standing Committee on the Scrutiny of Bills uh, that the submission uh, uh, and the submission made by uh, Mr Andrew Ray and Ms Char uh, Charlotte uh, Malkozowski uh, that the deployment of armed forces should be a matter of last resort and that the uh, decisions uh, to call them out should be subject to stringent a parliamentary oversight, not a radical contention, you would have thought. Um, this amendment seeks to ensure a layer of parliamentary scrutiny uh, by making call-out orders subject to disallowance. While we understand that there are concerns around the timeliness and complexity uh, of the call-out process, we do not accept that efficiency concerns uh, can be addressed in other ways. Uh, we, uh, we believe that efficiency concerns can be addressed in other ways. Uh, and it is not a reason to uh, move past uh, legitimate scrutiny by elected representatives. Throughout the inquiry, it was made clear that the uh, desire to streamline the call-out process uh, removes important processes of scrutiny uh, that are not only unjustified but also unnecessary. It is our view that a decision to call out reservists is a significant decision. Uh, and it should be one which is deliberated uh, and able to be decided on by the Parliament via a disallowance instrument. Indeed, uh, this view and position was put to the committee uh, by a number of experts, and we entirely agree. Therefore, I commend it to the Chamber. Minister. I'll give oh, the call sorry, to the minister. You, but were you talking on this amendment? Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, the government will be opposing this amendment. Uh, the bill as introduced would amend section 28 of the Defence Act to make a reserve call out a notifiable instrument. This is substantially the same effect as the existing provision, which re requires reserve call out to be published in the Gazette. This requires publication of the instrument on the Federal Register, and that is publicly available. Uh, we do not believe in any way that it is appropriate for reserve call outs to be disallowable noting the significant level of disruption that would cause for the ADF's operation, its planning and ADF members who had indeed been called out. There are numerous other mechanisms by which any decision of the government to call out uh, the reserves can be scrutinised by the parliament, and scrutiny of the instrument itself is not necessary, noting that the instrument itself does not determine the law. So, For these reasons, the government will be opposing this amendment. Does any other senator wish to make a contribution? I put the question. Those are, uh, put the question in relation to the amendment. Those of uh, that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Aye. Division required. Uh, ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question before the chamber is that amendment on sheet 1137 be agreed to. Those for the question pass to the right of the chair. Those for the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint as teller for the ayes, uh, Senator Seward. I appoint as teller for the noes, Senator McCarthy. Senators, there being nine ayes and 53 noes, it's resolved in the negative. Uh, Senator Steele, John, did you seek the call? Call, cool, thank you. Uh, on sheet, I assume you're going to move uh, the amendments on sheet 1122. I was now going to move no? to amendment on sheet uh, 1141. If that's 41. Okay. Uh, I understand that if you wish to move all the amendments on the page in the one one motion, you seek leave. So you Sorry. seek leave to move them together. To move them together. Uh, uh, I, it's my preference, and it was my prior understanding that we'd move them individually. Is you can. That's your choice. Oh yeah. So individually. Uh, so amendment on sheet uh, one one four, if that's okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, uh, in uh, relation one, to one, this four, amendment, one. this deals with um, one of the most serious aspects of uh, of the bill. Um, it is. Uh, our view, and indeed that of many submitters, that a lack of a definition on what could constitute an other emergency uh, leaves the door wide open uh, for the scope of circumstances of using the powers in this bill uh, to, to basically being uh, whatever uh, the minister would like to define. Uh, now, it is our intention to quarantine the provisions uh, of this bill to the stated purpose of the defence aid to the civil community uh, by outlining what, a what an emergency and what emergencies cannot be. Indeed, to make explicit uh, what does not constitute an emergency a situation for the purposes of this bill. Uh, throughout the course of the inquiry, it was made very clear uh, that the lack of definition of other emergency was grossly insufficient and left uh, the door far too open uh, in terms of interpretation. Um, this amendment uh, should, I, I uh, quite honestly believe, uh, be a rather uncontroversial proposition 
uh, for the Senate to consider. Um, anybody that takes a cursory glance at this legislation uh, would be worried by the vagaries contained within the relevant section. Uh, this uh, amendment tidies that up rather neatly uh, and I think uh, would make great improvement to the legislation. I therefore commend it to the Senate. Uh, Senator Stilljohn, uh, are you referring to when you say amendment numbers one to four? Is that correct? Uh, sorry, no. I'm I'm referring to uh, amendment on sheet one one four one. Yes, but you're referring to all four amendments on that page, aren't you? Uh, yes, I am. So could I ask you to move, seek leave, to move them all together, one, two, three, and four? I, I seek to move one, two, three, and four uh, together. Leave, leave is being requested. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister. Much, Mr. Acting uh, Deputy President, uh, the government does not support this amendment. Section 123AA provides immunity from civil and criminal liabilities for protected persons who are providing relevant assistance in natural disasters and other emergencies, where they are acting in good faith and in performance of their duties. This amendment would replace the broad term "other emergency" with "other prescribed emergency." This would require regulations to be made in order to rely on the immunity provision in relation to any emergency that was not a natural disaster. The term other emergency used in the bill as introduced takes its ordinary meaning. It is deliberately a broad term. It enables agility to respond to unexpected events. Requiring other emergencies to be prescribed in regulations would require them to have, identified, to be, have been identified ahead of time, clearly impracticable. This would prevent ADF members from receiving appropriate legal protections when they are providing assistance in an emergency. Again, uh, very undesirable and not necessary. There are other safeguards already in section 123AA. Regardless of the nature of any emergency, the immunity would only ever apply in a situation where ADF members and other personnel were acting in good faith in performance of their duties, and they must be, be lawful duties. This would not include using force or coercive powers. This provision does not uh, authorise or permit ADF members to use force or coercive powers to quell or dispel protest, dissent, assembly or industrial action. And it's for those reasons the government does not support this amendment. Are there any other honourable senators that wish to make a contribution? Then I'll put the question. Put the question that amendments Number numbered one to four on sheet one one four one be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. Against no. I think the noes have it. A division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The, the question before the Senate is that amendments 1 to 4 on sheet 1141 be agreed to. Those for the question pass to the right of the chair. Those uh, against to the left of the chair. I appoint as teller for the ayes, uh, Senator Seward. I, I appoint teller for the noes, Senator McCarthy. McCarthy. <coughs> Honourable Senators, there being nine ayes and 29 noes, it's resolved in the negative. Senator Stilljohn. Uh, um so I'll now seek uh, to have uh, amendment on sheet 1143, 1144 and 1148 taken together. Uh, do you seek leave? Uh, yes, I do indeed. Thank leave you. granted. Leave is granted. Thanks very much. Uh, these uh, three amendments seek to do uh, three crucial things. Uh, one, to ensure that uh, there is appropriate consultation with the states and territories in relation to the call out of reserve forces. Uh, secondly, to remove uh, the uh, immunities granted to uh, foreign defence forces and uh, foreign police forces in relation to civil and criminal uh, liability. Uh, and finally, uh, to prescribe in the legislation. Uh, that uh, force and coercive power may not be used against civilians in the context of this legislation. Uh, we heard from defence that the government and the ADF uh, uh,
personnel will not be permitted to use force under the arrangements that this legislation refers to. However, we were told time and time again uh, that if this uh, is really the case, then the legislation uh, needs to explicitly say so. Uh, we do not think that it is sufficient to merely have this in the explanatory uh, memorandum, and we support the view of the submitters who stated that if it is uh, the government's intention to ensure uh, that use of force is not uh, permitted, then they should say so in the legislation. Not again, once again, not a particularly radical contention uh, that if the government intends uh, force not to be used, then there should be no harm in saying so in the legislation. Uh, just finally, let me just uh, circle back to a comment upon uh, the granting of, of civil and criminal uh, liability protection to uh, foreign uh, defence forces and foreign police. Now, there have, been, there have been contributions made to the discussion of this legislation which uh, falsely uh, lead those watching along at home uh, to believe that the extension of uh, civil and criminal liabilities uh, to emergency personnel uh, is the majority position in the states and territories. Now, as we heard in the inquiry, this is not the case. The extension of criminal and civil liabilities uh, is not the norm among the uh, majority of uh, state emergency services personnel in this country, and so it is uh, erroneous uh, to suggest that one of the things this legislation seeks to do is to offer the same protections that uh, state emergency services personnel receive. This, in fact, grants uh, uh, protections well in excess of those granted to state emergency uh, services personnel. But let us leave that to a side for a moment and stare blankly uh, and clearly into the face of the reality that this legislation seeks to extend those civil and criminal liabilities to foreign police forces. Foreign police forces and to foreign uh, defence force personnel. Now that is a departure in extreme uh, from any previous norm, and it must be said will not be reciprocated, nor is it required to be reciprocated, by any foreign actor that we engage with in relation to our forces or our police forces uh, in their jurisdiction. It exists uh, as a totally a new aberration upon the legislative field and is unacceptable in the extreme. It is one of the sources uh, for which we have received uh, one of the most stringent streams of concern. Uh, and that is why the Greens have put this amendment uh, and its two partners to the chamber this evening. Senator, Senator Wong. Thank you, um, Acting Deputy, well, Acting Chair. Uh, I thought it would be useful. I know that um, the senator has moved a, a number of amendments together. Uh, I, I would like to make some brief comments on the opposition's position in relation to the amendment on sheet double one double four, which I think was, I think, from what I can discern, was the subject of the contribution that the senator just made. Um, Labor opposes the amendment. Um, we acknowledge the presence of foreign forces on Australian soil is quite rightly a matter which draws significant public interest and scrutiny, which was in part why Labor asked that this bill be referred to a legislative inquiry to ensure there were no unintended consequences as a result of the bill's provisions. Uh, it's important to note that what is proposed in the bill is neither the automatic grant of immunity to foreign forces nor an automatic approval for their presence on Australian soil. I note that the amended EM explanatory memorandum states any participation by foreign military or police forces in any domestic civil emergency would remain contingent upon the receipt and acceptance of an appropriate offer by the Commonwealth as is normal practice. 
As such, the bill in no way provides for the automatic participation of foreign forces in domestic civil emergencies. Extension of the proposed immunities to foreign forces would likewise not be automatic and be contingent upon the issuing of a direction by the minister. There are important limitations with respect to the proposed immunity, including that it would only apply in relation to a protected person's actions or omissions that are done in good faith in the performance or purported performance in their duties. I also note that during the 1920 bushfire season, Australia received assistance from defence forces of New Zealand, of Singapore, Japan, Papua New Guinea, Fiji, Indonesia, Canada and the United States. So whilst international assistance should not be a substitute for appropriate domestic capabilities, and I note I referred to this in the second reading speech, the generous offers of assistance by other countries during those bushfires were most welcome. Where Australia has accepted an offer of foreign forces to assist Australian communities in their time of need, it seems appropriate that a mechanism is available to potentially provide immunity in certain circumstances, noting again that the granting of such immunity, immunity would not be automatic, that it would be the subject of an issuing of a direction by the minister and that there are important limitations with respect to the scope of the immunity. Minister. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Deputy Chair, uh, the government will not be supporting all three of these amendments. And can I turn first of all to Amendment 1143? Uh, in relation to Section 123AA, it already provides immunity from civil and criminal liability for protected persons who are providing relevant assistance in natural disasters and other emergencies where they are acting in good faith and in performance of their duties. The provision is not the source of authority for using the ADF to provide assistance, which remains the executive power of the Commonwealth. It operates only to trigger the immunity. The effect of this particular amendment would be to insert an additional requirement to consult with states and territories before triggering the immunity provision, which is not necessary nor appropriate. This provision, and in particular the language for triggering the immunity through the minister's direction, has been very, very carefully drafted to ensure that it is within the constitutional authority of the parliament. Uh, in relation to amendment uh, 1144, uh, first of all, I'd say I thank the opposition very much for their support for this, and I also acknowledge the opposition's uh, thanks and acknowledgement of the foreign forces who came to assist us in the bushfire uh, earlier this year. Uh, in relation to this, the immunity provision in section 123AA, as introduced, can be extended to members of foreign military and police forces who are providing the relevant assistance on behalf of the ADF or on behalf of defence. This, there is, contrary to what we've heard in this chamber, there is long-standing practice of nations for providing assistance to each other in times of emergencies and disasters. Uh, during the 2019-2020 bushfire disaster, eight nations provided military assistance through the ADF including New Zealand, Papua New Guinea, Fiji, Indonesia, the United States, Singapore, Japan and Canada. And as Senator Wong has said, we are deeply grateful for that assistance. Similarly, the ADF has also provided significant disaster relief and humanitarian assistance to many other nations. The effect of this amendment would be to remove the ability to extend immunities to foreign forces who are providing assistance to our nation. The extension of immunities to foreign military and police forces is appropriate and it is justified, given long-standing practices of nations providing this sort of assistance to one another. It recognises that our important relationships and also it provides appropriate protection in situations where they are offering assistance and putting themselves in harm's way for Australians and for people in our own open communities. The immunity, however, does not apply automatically. It requires a decision by defence. The provision does not authorise foreign military or police forces to enter Australia or to use force or coercive powers while providing assistance. And so it's for those reasons, uh, Mr Acting Deputy Chair, that the government will not be supporting these three amendments. I tend to put the question. I put the que Senator Steele, John. Can I just make a quick contribution? You're able to make a contribution, response? yes. Thank you. Just very briefly. Um, putting aside the, the usual kind of theatrics that surround the, uh, the uh, contention that there's been any opposition or scrutiny uh, to this legislation, it was really disappointing to see so much fuss and fluff made about the uh, creation of an inquiry into this legislation, only to see 
most of the recommendations made by the experts that gave their time to it uh, thoroughly ignored by the opposition and the government. Uh, but let me just pick up this critical point uh, that has been made in the contribution by the minister and by uh, the opposition around uh, good faith and the fact that that offers us a uh, protection in relation to the issues raised in, in this particular amendment. I draw your attention to the uh, evidence given by Mr. Uh, Andrew Ray and Ms. Charlotte uh, Michalowski, um, who explored the issue of good faith further in their evidence to the committee, uh, suggesting that perhaps a higher standard uh, such as proportionality may be more appropriate. Uh, they outlined in their submission the lack of clarity around what good faith uh, can be interpreted as, stating uh, there are significant concerns regarding the use of the limitation of good faith contained in the, contained in the immunity provision. Uh, good faith has been widely used in, immu uh, in immunity provisions. However, academic commentators have highlighted that the exact scope of the term is unclear, with few cases having applied the test in relation to immunities. At its widest, the immunity may protect anyone who subjectively believes they are acting in good faith. Alternatively, in some cases, courts have considered uh, competing policy considerations to weigh up whether an action should fall within a good faith exception. It is unclear which standard will be applied uh, were the application of immunity contained in section 123AA challenged. This leads to the situation where it is unclear when an individual could rely on the immunity, a position that is an, uh, at odds with the stated object, uh, uh, justification uh, of the amendment. Uh, so here we have it very clearly from two people that know what they're talking about and have no political vested interest in uh, getting this bill sorted out and done. Uh, I think it's worth noting that this is a vagary which uh, is causing the Commonwealth broadly uh, many problems, as some of your own members uh, acknowledge there is a need to define clearly uh, what we mean when we say good faith. And uh, just like the questions around the constitutional head of power that supports many of the activities described in this bill, uh, it would be much better to clarify this issue before leaning on a conception of good faith which is not settled and may prove to be unstable when relied upon. I intend to put the question. I put the question that amendments on sheet 1143, 1144 and 1148 be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. Those against say no. I think the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question before the chamber is that amendments on sheet 1143, 1144 and 1148 be agreed to. Those for the question will pass to the right of the chair. Those for the noes to the left. I appoint as teller for the aye, Senator Seawood. I appoint as teller for the noes, Senator Urquhart. Honourable Senators, there being nine ayes and 31 noes, it's resolved in the negative. <laughs> Senator Stilljohn. Thank you, Chair. I now might move to my final amendment, um, amendment on sheet uh, one, one, uh, one, one, double two. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, uh, there, we are, there are two amendments. Do you seek leave to move them to together? To move them together, yes. Sorry. Thank leave you. has been requested. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, so, with the uh, conclusion of this committee stage, we have now offered the Senate the opportunity uh, to uh, make clear that such call-out orders uh, will be subject uh, to the scrutiny of the Parliament, which was uh, denied. Uh, we have given the uh, I voted down, I should say. Um, we have given the Senate the opportunity to prescribe exactly what is meant uh, by emergency, uh, something which the major parties in this place have also uh, voted against in the course of this committee stage. We have given the major parties the opportunity uh, to ensure that actions are taken in consultation with the state and territories, and they have voted against that. We have given them the opportunity to remove the provision of immunity uh, to foreign uh, defence forces and to foreign police, uh, something which they have just voted against, along with a clarification of the uh, use of force which has just been voted against. Every opportunity to improve this bill has been foregone by the major parties in this place. Every concern raised at the committee level has been ignored. And so finally, uh, we give the opportunity for these uh, highly inappropriate sections of the legislation uh, to be uh, separated from the one piece of this bill which does have merit, that is, uh, the sections in relation uh, to uh, superannuation. There is uh, indeed a need to address uh, the, the discrepancies 
identified by the legislation as something that we support. Um, we now seek to separate the bill uh, to enable uh, those two uh, pieces to be considered uh, se uh, to be uh, considered independently of each other. Uh, so I uh, commend that position to the Senate. Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy Chair. Uh, the government will not be supporting uh, either of these amendments uh, because the measures in this bill will enhance the ability uh, to provide defence assistance to the civil community by doing two things. First of all, streamlining the process for calling out members of the ADF reserves under section 28 and 29 of the Defence Act. And secondly, by providing ADF members, other defence personnel and members of foreign forces with similar immunities to state and territory emergency services personnel in certain cases, while they are performing duties in good faith uh, to support civil emergency and disaster preparedness, recovery and response. And these amendments would take away the, both of these schedules in the bill. Uh, so these have been designed to enhance Defence's ability to provide assistance in relation to natural disasters and other emergencies. It would also remove the opportunity to legislate some of the key lessons learned from the 2020-21 bushfires, which would be a significant missed opportunity ahead of the upcoming high-risk weather season. And it's for these reasons, amongst many others uh, that we've discussed here tonight, that the government will not be supporting these two amendments. And can I just say, in closing, uh, to, the, to the opposition, uh, Senator Wong, can I thank you and also Richard Miles and his office for their very constructive in way of which we've engaged uh, with this to get to this very important legislation. I intend to put the question. I'm putting the question in the positive that schedules one and two stand as printed. Those the question say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Division is re division is required. Ring the bells.
Dr. Dawes, the question before the Senate is that the schedules one and two stand as printed. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McGrath as teller for the ayes and Senator Seawood for teller for the noes. Honourable Senators, there being 32 ayes and nine noes, it's resolved in the affirmative. Honourable Senators, the time allotted for debate has expired, so I will now report progress. The question is that the remaining stages of the bill be agreed to and the bill be passed. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Honourable Senators, the time allotted for debate on the Excise Levies Legislation Amendment Sheep and Lamb Bill uh, 2020 and the Customs Charges and Levies Legislation Amendment Sheep and Lamb Bill 2020 has expired. In accordance with the resolution agreed to earlier today, I will now put the questions on the remaining stages of the bills and then put the questions on the remaining stages of other bills listed in that resolution. The President, Senator Waters. Yes, my apologies. Um, could you just record the Australian Greens' opposition to the previous bill? Thank you. I agree to record uh, your, your objections to that bill. Minister. Uh, thank yeah. you. Uh, I move that these bills be now read a first time. The question is that the bills be now read a first time. Those for the question say aye. Against, no, the ayes have it. Clark. Excise levies amendment, sheep and lamb bill 2020. Excise, uh, I don't have the other bill, I'm afraid. <laughs> Customs charges and levies legislation amendment, sheep and lamb bill 2020. The question. It now is that the remaining stages of these bills be agreed to and these bills be now passed. Those for questions say aye. aye. Against, no, the ayes have it. Clark. Thank you. Excise levies legislation amendment sheep and land bill 2020. Customs charges levies legislation amendment sheep and land bill 2020. I will now deal with the Foreign Investment Reform Protecting Australia's National Security Bill 2020 and Foreign Acquisitions and Takeover Fees Imposition Amendment Bill 
2020. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence. Foreign Investment Reform Protecting Australia's National Security Bill and Foreign Acquisitions and Takeovers Fees Imposition Amendment Bill. Minister. I move that these bills be now read a first time. Uh, if I put the question that motion be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Clark. Foreign Investment Reform Protecting Australia's National Security Bill 2020, Foreign Acquisitions and Takeovers Fees Imposition Amendment Bill 2020. Minister. I will now deal with the second reading and other remaining stages of the bills. The first question is that the second reading amendment on sheet 1163 circulated by the opposition be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. All those against say no. no. I think the noes have it. The noes have it. The question now is that the second reading amendment on sheet 1157 circulated by the Australian Greens be agreed to. I will now deal with the committee stage amendments circulated on the bills. Oh, I've got to put the question. Um, <laughs> all those in favour say aye. aye. All those against say no. no. I think the noes have it. The noes have it. The noes have it. I will now deal with the committee stage amendments circulated on the bills, starting with the amendments circulated by the opposition. The question is that the amendments on sheet 1132 circulated by the opposition be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. All those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. I will now deal with the amendments circulated by the Australian Greens. The question is that the amendments on sheets 1138 and 1139 circulated by the Australian Greens be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. All those against say no. no. I think the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Stop the bells. The question is that the amendments on sheets 1138 and 1139 circulated by the Australian Greens be agreed to. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Seward as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. There being nine ayes and 40 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I will now deal with the amendments circulated by Pauline Hanson's One Nation. The question is that the amendments on sheets 1131, 1165 and 1174 circulated by Pauline Hanson's One Nation be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. All those against say no. I think the noes have it. Division required? Ring the bells for one minute. I did hear a second voice. Stop the bells. The question is that the amendments on sheets 1131, 1165 and 1174 circulated by Pauline Hanson's One Nation be agreed to. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Roberts, teller for the ayes, and Senator Urquhart, teller for the noes.
There being two ayes and 47 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. The question now is that the remaining stages of these bills be agreed to and these bills be now passed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Foreign Investment Reform Protecting Australia's National Security Bill 2020, Foreign Acquisitions and Takeovers Fees Imposition Amendment Bill 2020. I will now deal with the Radio Communications Legislation Amendment, Reform and Modernisation Bill 2020 and two related bills. I understand that the minister has an EM to table. Minister. Uh, thank you. I table an addendum to the explanatory memorandum relating to the Radio Communications Legislation Amendment, Reform and Modernisation Bill 2020. The question is that the bills now be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clark. Radio Communications Legislation Amendment Reform and Modernisation Bill 2020, Radio Communications Receiver Licence Tax Amendment Bill 2020, Radio Communications Transmitter Licence Tax Amendment Bill 2020. I will now deal with the amendments to the bill circulated by the opposition. As these amendments were circulated after 7.30 pm this evening, leave will be required for them to be moved. Is leave moved? Is leave granted? Leave is granted. The question is that the amendments on sheets 1153 and 1154 circulated by the opposition be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the noes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells. One minute. One minute or four? Okay, four minutes.
stop the bells. The question is that the amendments on sheets 1153 and 1154 circulated by the opposition be agreed to. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Urquhart, teller for the ayes, and Senator McGrath, teller for the noes. There being 31 ayes and 32 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. The question is that the remaining stages of these bills be agreed to and these bills now be passed. All those of that opinion say aye. All those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clark. Radio Communications Legislation Amendment Reform and Modernisation Bill 2020. Radio Communications Receiver Licence Tax Amendment Bill 2020. Radio Communications Transmitter Licence Tax Amendment Bill 2020. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the bills for concurrence. Minister. I move that these bills be now read a first time. The question is that the bills now be read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clark. Civil Aviation Unmanned Aircraft Levy Bill 2020, Civil Aviation Amendment Unmanned Aircraft Levy Collection and Payment Bill 2020. The question now is that the remaining stages of these bills be agreed to and these bills now be passed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clark. Civil Aviation Unmanned Aircraft Levy Bill 2020, Civil Aviation Amendment Unmanned Aircraft Levy Collection and Payment Bill 2020. Pursuant to order, the Senate now stands adjourned. <laughs>